The scene is set on a snowy night at a secluded cabin. Inside we see that a glass of wine has been spilled onto the floor. It is revealed that the wine was poisoned and it has been consumed by our protagonist in this story. A blonde man with long hair named Ian. In front of him stands a regal man, who says that because Ian is so strong he mixed in a stronger dose, and he should be dead in minutes. Ian looks up, wanting to know why this guy has betrayed him like this. He says that it is because our protagonist is too strong. He has a power that no one else in the entire empire can compare to and it has spread anxiety to the citizens. Ian understands, countless people have lost their livelihoods due to the misuse of magic. The man states that even he himself is so incredibly scared of our protagonist to the point where it has driven him mad. He apologizes to Ian, even referring to him as an old friend and saying that he will never forgive himself for this. He then turns around and exits the cabin, entering the night and leaving our protagonist behind. Ian remains on his knees, slowly dying from poison as the cabin begins to ignite on fire. It is revealed that he has a trick up his sleeve. He slowly removes a dagger from his shirt. While regretting everything he did in his past life he researched a lot and came across a dagger with time magic embedded into it. If he stabs himself with the dagger before the poison reaches his heart he will be able to have a second chance at life. He does just that, plunging it into his chest, driven by rage from the betrayal he has just suffered. The floor around him glows blue in the shape of a circle and a triangle and weird voices chant out in an unknown language. This is it, his chance to go back to how things were before. His life and all his mistakes flash before his eyes. His mother's death, him meeting the emperor, and finally a flock of crows on the battlefield, picking at the bodies that litter the floor beneath his feet. The next thing he knows he is in his childhood body, and there doesn't seem to be any wounds or injuries on his body. A woman calls out his name and he turns around to see his mother. She has long blonde hair and is wearing a corset. Ian is in shock. His mother who had passed away is alive again and it seems like he has succeeded at traveling back in time. He turns around to look at the scene around him. There is a white tent with a white flag. Outside of the tent are a bunch of children lined up to be assessed on their skills. The people doing these assessments are the spiritual knights who decide if they pass or not. It has worked. Ian is no longer a dying man living his last moments in regret, but a child again ready to do things different this time. Magicians are the foundation of this nation's empire, and in order to be trained all children have to take the mana reaction assessment when they turn 12. The first part is the mana brain which is responsible for the manifestation of magic, and the second part is the mana heart that controls and generates magic. Those who have both of these talents are admitted into the Magic Academy and upon graduation they are treated like nobles. Ian has gone back 30 years which is further than he expected. He spent so much time researching the dagger he used and was lucky he had it on him at the time of his death. The reason he was so interested in turning back time was because he wanted to clean his hands from the blood they were stained with. He killed numerous people in his old life. He was loyal to the emperor who was his closest friend, named Ragnar, but it turns out the emperor was just using him and discarded him like trash in the end. Ian isn't going to let his life end so meaninglessly like that again. He tells himself that this time things are going to be different. He leaves his mother and begins to walk over to the spiritual knights. He approaches one of the guards and introduces himself as Ian Page from Mogrian Village. The guard smiles and recognizes our protagonist as the son of Venessa. He allows him to enter the tent but tells him not to ask too much questions to the magician inside. In the tent we see the magician. He has long black hair and a ponytail. He tells Ian to lower his head a little as he is going to use mana to stimulate his brain. Ian does what he says and feels a little dizzy for a moment but it is only temporary. The magician smiles. He has discovered the mana brain and the mana heart inside Ian and says that his life is going to change for the better from now on. Ian doesn't seem happy about this information, probably because he was already expecting it. He tells himself that it is not enough for him to just get into the academy. He begins showing off his skills, lighting a fireball in one hand and manipulating water in the other, casting two spells at once. He tells the magician that he was just randomly able to do this one day. The magician can't believe it and asks if Ian is sure someone didn't teach it him. When Ian says no the magician gets serious and leans forward, asking Ian to speak the truth. He is able to use interrogation magic that can determine if a person is lying or not by analyzing the body's reaction. He tells Ian not to lie or he will be known as a traitor to the Empire, and his family may even get executed. Ian doesn't get flustered though and stands by what he said. He learned how to do that without being taught. The magician is impressed, his interrogation magic doesn't find any lies and he wonders who this kid is. They are interrupted by the sounds of Ian's mother screaming and he looks out the tent to see what's going on. Vanessa is being bothered by the guard that was standing outside the tent. 
Grabbing onto her arm, he says that she has been widowed for seven years and shouldn't be playing hard to get at her age. The magician and two knights exit the tent demanding to know what all the fuss is about. The guard gets scared, telling them it is nothing and some lowly kitchen maid was just causing problems. This makes Ian furious, how dare this punk call his mother lowly, it looks like he is about to do something. However, he is stopped by the magician, who tells the guard that since Ian has the power of mana he and his family are now equal to nobles, and insulting nobles is a crime that could lead to execution. The scumbag guard falls to the floor, begging them to grant him mercy and let him live. He then turns around to Vanessa and does the same, apologizing for the words he said and asking for forgiveness. Ian approaches the guard and tells him to listen carefully. Ian says that he knows all about the disgusting things the guard has said and done in front of his mother. He threatens the guard telling him that he should also warn all his scumbag friends. If any of them do something like that again he will have their head. The guard nervously says he understands. Sweat drips down his face. Bro is really scared of a 12 year old. After all of this Ian thanks the magician for helping him out back there. He says it was nothing and it is his job to protect fellow magicians after all. He gestures to the man next to him whose name is Lord Aaron. He is going to be guarding our protagonist and Vanessa for the time being while things are arranged. Aaron has a mustache upon his lip and a white cape on his back. He tells Ian that he is going to bring him to an inn where the Night Order is currently staying. They can live there temporarily. Ian holds the hand of his mother, agreeing to go with Aaron and start the next stage of his new life. The magician watches him leave and smiles to himself. He's impressed that someone is that intelligent and capable while being so young. He is so impressed that it looks like he is going to have to report it to the Imperial family. That evening the sky is dark and the town is quiet. The guard from earlier walks down the street angrily, drunk and furious that some kid and a lowly kitchen maid were able to force him to his knees. He tells himself that in the near future he is going to get payback by getting freaky with Vanessa while Ian watches. A hooded figure can be seen behind him. The hooded figure uses paralysis magic on the drunk guard and he is frozen in place on a bridge. The hooded figure is Ian who overheard what the guy just said about his mother and isn't happy. He removes the hood from his head and begins fabricating a story to explain the guard's death, saying he was humiliated and found comfort by drinking. He then got so drunk that he accidentally tripped into the river and drowned. While the man is paralyzed Ian pushes him into the water and watches him drown. Ian thinks for a while on whether or not it is okay to let him die like this. After all the whole reason he has come back in time is to be a better person this time. Looking into the distance he realizes that he will never be able to completely wash the blood from his hands, and the best he can do is to just protect the people most precious to him like his mother. He watches the guard's lifeless body float around and it reminds him of how the emperor left him to die in the cabin in his past life. Ian quickly returns home and begins feeling exhausted, using that one paralyzed spell has depleted his mana. He tells himself that he needs to grow his small body as fast as possible while approaching his sleeping mother. In his previous life he received recognition as a first-class magician after attending one year of Magic Academy. However, even though he became a magician his mother wasn't able to live a life of luxury and passed away. Ian looks down at his mother, saying he is going to be sure to protect her this time around so she can live longer. The scene cuts to a large regal building. It is the Green River Empire's capital. Inside is the Emperor of Green River whose name is Terry. He is blonde with a blonde mustache and fancy clothing. He is in the middle of a conversation with another magician named Herbert, and the two of them are discussing our protagonist. Herbert explains that mana is an energy that flows and circulates in blood, and from the moment someone possesses a mana brain and mana heart they are recognized as a magician. However, in order to actually use this mana properly to cast magic a person must be trained. Yet our protagonist was able to freely use magic without training. He compares our protagonist to someone called the first magician. This was someone long ago who taught himself how to use mana. He discovered how to manifest magic by himself and became known as the first magician. Terry scoffs, thinking that there is no way there is someone alive today using magic without going to an academy. Herbert agrees that it is suspicious and even he finds it hard to believe what he has heard. He says he will be going to confirm it with his own eyes. The Emperor thinks to himself for a moment, knowing that if it is true then our protagonist must possess a dangerous ability. He calls to the prince who is standing outside and has been listening to everything. In walks the prince of Green River. His name is Haydn and he asks his father why he called for him. Terry says that since it has been five years since the prince has left the castle he should go outside. Dude needs to touch some grass. Terry tells his son that he is going to give him 300 soldiers and three magicians, and he should go and collect a boy named Ian Page. 
For a moment he hesitates, thinking it foolish for him to trust his son with something so important. However Haydn insists, saying he can be trusted and will complete the mission. The emperor tells him okay and that he should go and start preparing immediately. The journey to Magrian is a long one. Herbert who is still standing in the room jokes, saying that he should go and prepare too since it's going to be hard for him to find three magicians that actually want to go outside. As soon as he leaves the room his face turns serious, his assistant next to him asks if he is going back to the tower to find the magicians but Herbert says no. He begins walking ahead with his eyes focused, saying that there is somewhere he needs to head first. The scene cuts back to the place where our protagonist is staying. He looks out the window as if he is expecting someone. He knows the Imperial family should be coming for him very soon and things are moving as planned. Ian knows that the magician must have been impressed by his skills and immediately reported it to his superiors, and that once the current emperor found out he would have sent the prince with a bunch of soldiers. He suspects Herbert will likely come too. He is the master of the ivory tower and sooner or later there is going to be an internal war between the imperial castle and ivory tower. Ian knows this from his past life. He doesn't know which side he is going to help though and just knows that he doesn't want to be exploited by anyone this time. His thoughts are interrupted by the Imperial Order who have arrived much sooner than he expected. Outside he is greeted by the magician from earlier who is holding a magic orb. He says that the Emperor has issued an Imperial Order. Ian follows the customs and gets down on one knee while putting his fist over his chest. A message from the Emperor appears from the magic orb and the magician begins to read it aloud. It states that the Emperor has heard of the high abilities that have been displayed by Ian Page, and as he has received recognition as a magician in this empire his name will be recorded in the Ivory Tower's registry. The Emperor also invites Ian to visit him at the Imperial Castle, and he is sending his eldest son to accompany him there. Once the message has been read Ian begins to rise to his feet. He is immediately greeted by a knight named Arnold who informs our protagonist that he and his fellow knights have been assigned the honor of serving him and will be escorting him to the lord's castle while they wait for the prince to come. The lord of the Magrian territory, Marcus awaits their arrival. He has a full beard and a fur coat. He looks over to his children telling them to be mindful of their speech. Although Ian is young he is still a magician and the emperor is interested in him so Marcus wants to leave a good impression. He extends his arms wide for our protagonist, welcoming him to their castle. Ian spends the next few weeks at the castle. He becomes a hot topic and even the maids begin to talk about him. They are impressed that someone so young is able to create fireballs with his bare hands. We see Ian at the training grounds where he has been spending the majority of his time. He practices his magic by raising his hand and summoning a frost nova. It looks like he's got himself a fresh new fit too. His frost nova worked and around him is now a bunch of ice and snow. However, Ian isn't happy and thinks that this isn't good enough. If he was in his other body he would be able to freeze the whole castle, and not just the training grounds. His powers are limited and he needs something to make up for his lack of mana. Someone interrupts his training, rushing over all out of breath like something is wrong. The man has a monocle and grey hair. He asks for Ian's help saying that the Lord Marcus has gone missing. He has yet to return after he went to hunt goblins yesterday. His son and all the knights that went too have also not returned. Ian tries to think back to his previous life to find out where they could be but he is unsure. He knows it's not time for them to die yet. Lord Marcus died at a later date when he was assassinated by an enemy empire right before a big war. His son would abandon the Magrian territory after his father's death to escape the war, and he would later be beheaded for his crimes. Each territory in this empire has its own stationed magician. Ian tells the man to go and ask their magician to help instead. However, the old man informs Ian that the magician that was stationed here has been assigned other missions and is not currently in the Magrian territory. They are alone. Ian is shocked. It's rare that a magician would leave his assigned territory. He wonders if it is related to him and if he has altered the timeline by doing something. For example, he could be away giving information about our protagonist to Herbert the Tower Master. This could be dangerous. Ian's most powerful weapon right now is his ability to know what's going to happen in the future. If the timeline gets screwed up then he would lose this weapon. Ian looks at the old man telling him he will help them look for Lord Marcus, knowing that if the Lord dies it will create dire changes to the timeline. He immediately gets ready to leave and puts on his cloak. However someone calls out his name. It's his mother who has heard what is going on and is worried that it is too dangerous. Ian is still a child after all. Ian tells his mother not to worry. He may be a child but he is also a magician now and he'll be back before she knows it. 
Lord Marcus's daughter also approaches our protagonist. She begs him to bring back her mother and father, saying she will do anything for him if he is successful, whether it be money, land, or servants she will make it happen. Ian notices a specific ring on her finger and says that he will bring them back, but asks to borrow her ring as he can feel mana from it. He says it will help him in finding them so the daughter agrees and hands it over. Ian puts the ring on his finger and can't believe it. It looks just like the one he saw in his previous life. It's known as the Magrian Ring, a low-grade artifact that increases the mana of the person who wears it. It looks like the Lord passed it down to his daughter. She tells Ian that she wants it back after as it is important to her. With the ring now on his finger Ian gets a party of knights and heads out to find the missing lord. The Magrian ring will make up for his lack of mana to a certain extent. The knights take our protagonist out to where they tracked Marcus to. There is a bunch of goblin corpses on the ground but there are no humans to be found. The knights suspect that a monster must have caught them. Ian scratches his chin, they must have been ambushed by hundreds of goblins and he needs to find them before it's too late. He begins to use his magic to summon a wolf. What he is doing is blocked by a bright light and the knights watch in amazement. After the spell is cast out appears a cute little wolf with a fluffy body and wagging tail. In Ian's previous life a huge wolf appeared but he guesses he isn't strong enough to summon a full-sized one yet. He points to some blood on the floor, asking the wolf to pick up the scent and follow it. The wolf does as it is told, getting a good sniff of the floor and leading the way. The scene cuts to Lord Marcus who is still alive and slaying goblins. They are green and ugly, with long tongues, pointed noses, green skin, and red eyes. Marcus and his party are surrounded and they are coming from all angles. If this continues they will all be annihilated. Marcus turns to his son, telling him to escape to the castle while he distracts the monsters. While the two of them are talking a goblin begins approaching from behind with a club in its hand. The sun calls out at the last second but it is too late, the goblin is already high in the air, and is about to bring its weapon down on the lord's head who has his back turned to it. Suddenly, a flash of ice appears and all of the enemies are frozen in place. The green scenery turns to the arctic and everyone wonders what just happened. The ice came from Ian who has arrived at the last second to save the day. Any longer and the lord would have died and the timeline would have been ruined. Marcus is so surprised by the situation and the sight of a child saving him that he begins to pass out. When he wakes up again he finds himself back in the castle with his daughter by his side. She explains that Ian saved everyone and the lord and his son have both been asleep for two days straight. The old man from earlier enters the room and is glad to see Marcus is awake. He appears to be a butler and his name is Hogger. He explains that 12 soldiers didn't make it back and Marcus is upset by this news. He asks where Ian is now as he would like to meet with him. Hogger leaves right away, rushing to the training grounds where he finds our protagonist. He says the Lord has woken and he would like to meet him in the reception room. Apparently there is a lot he wants to talk about. Ian looks a little confused as to what he could possibly want but follows Hogger inside. Here he finds Marcus and his son, whose name is Lobi. They thank Ian from the bottom of their hearts for saving them. The Lord says he protected both Magrian's current and future leaders. Not only this but he also protected the territory by defeating the goblins and he wouldn't feel right if he didn't repay him for this. He gestures to a box on a nearby table, giving it to Ian as a reward. Ian opens it and finds the Magrian ring that he borrowed inside. Marcus heard that Ian had felt mana in it earlier. He thought it was just an old family treasure and asks what kind of power it possesses. Ian explains that it is just a ring that gives the wearer the power to increase their mana, and it helped him greatly in defeating the goblins. The Lord says he can keep the ring and he should think of it as a token. A token of promise that from now on the Magrian family will serve him forever as an eternally honored guest. Ian is always welcome to visit and they will always stand by his side whenever he is in need of help. Marcus and Lobi lower their heads, saying that this pledge will last for future generations and will go on for a thousand years. Ian is grateful and asks the Lord if there is an alchemist in this territory who is skilled in making elixirs. Marcus informs him that there is an alchemist named Ledio in a place called Royd Village. He was originally from the capital but moved further north because of a rare medicinal herb. Ian heard of the name Ledio in his previous life. He knows that he needs to get his hands on some elixirs that can help make up for his low mana levels. He heads out with a small group of knights to find this roid village that the Lord told him about. When they reach there they become shocked at what they see and one of the knights points over to the village. It's completely on fire and is in the middle of burning down, something bad is clearly happening. Inside the village we see a bandit with an eye patch and a bloody hatchet over his shoulder. He tells his men to take the children so they can quickly move on to the next place. They grab a boy who kicks and screams, begging not to be taken from his family. 
The boy's name is Douglas and his father calls out to him in desperation, telling the men to stop. However, the guy with an eye patch appears behind him and kicks him to the floor. He keeps his foot on the father's back so he can't move. Douglas continues to struggle, trying his best to get free of the villain's grasp, but it's no use. The guy with an eye patch pulls out a knife, saying he is going to kill Douglas's father to punish him for putting up a fight. He gets ready to swing his knife. A sudden piece of ice comes seemingly out of nowhere though, striking the villain in his back and taking him out. Douglas can only watch, still stuck in the grasp of another man. The remaining villains all look over wondering what just happened. A piece of ice really just appeared on a sunny day. More pieces of ice begin to rain down from the sky, like they were sent from God himself. The men all flee in terror, not wanting to die like their leader. It is revealed that this ice has come from our protagonist who is perched on the edge of a nearby cliff looking down on the situation. It seems like his new ring really does help and has increased his mana a bunch. He looks down at it, wondering if it allows his mana capacity to reach that of a third-class magician. He walks down to join the people in the village who are mourning over citizens who were killed by the bandit attack. Luckily none of the knights were injured. Ian wants to know if the alchemist they came for named Ledio managed to survive. He hears someone in the distance calling the alchemist's name and he immediately turns around to see who it is. It's Douglas, and it seems like his father is the alchemist our protagonist has came here for but he is in bad shape. Ian pushes past Douglas wanting to get a better look at Ledio. He sees that he has a pale completion and strands of whitened hair, and he can tell this is mana poisoning. Mana poisoning is a disease also known as God's curse. If someone who has a mana brain and not a mana heart is injected with more than their body can handle, the overflow of mana will stimulate the brain and cause great pain continuously for the rest of their life. Ian knows it's impossible for Ledio to inject mana into himself and so this must have been the work of a magician with ill intent. He raises his hand to the alchemist's forehead and tries to alleviate the pain a little. It works and Ian gets ready to leave, seeing that there is nothing more he can do. However, the boy Douglas grabs a hold of him and asks what he just did and if his father is going to be okay. Ian unfortunately explains that his curse can't be cured and he only provided temporary relief. Eventually he will just go back to being in pain again and will face a tough decision. Either he finds a magician to keep alleviating his pain for the rest of his life or he dies. Douglas looks heartbroken. He says that he needs to quickly go and find a special flower so that he can make some medicine for his father. He says this flower can help neutralize the mana in his body. He pushes past Ian and rushes to go and get it. At this moment Ian remembers where he heard the name Douglas before. In his past life Douglas was one of the most outstanding alchemists in the entire empire. Although he had a tough childhood, he was a genius and eventually became the emperor's closest aide. However, he had a deep hatred for magicians after his father was poisoned by one, and may have even been the alchemist that helped to poison Ian in his past life. After realizing this Ian turns around and catches up to Douglas. He grabs a hold of him and tells him that he can't go into the forest alone as there might still be bandits out there. Douglas objects, saying if he doesn't get this flower then his father will die. A tear runs down his cheek. Seeing he isn't going to stop Ian uses his magic to put the kid to sleep. After a few seconds he is out cold and collapses onto Ian's shoulder. He takes the kid to a discreet location behind some bushes and lays him down, thinking about what he is going to do. He looks at the boy thinking that he should just kill him now, that way the poison will never get made in the future. He quickly pulls himself together, the timeline could get screwed up if he acts too rashly. Douglas possesses the talent to become the best alchemist in the history of the Empire, and our protagonist might even be able to convince him to join his side. However, even if he does this there is still no guarantee that he won't betray him in the future. Ian's thoughts are interrupted by one of the knights that has come over to check if he is okay. He notices Douglas on the floor and is confused. Ian says that he just put him to sleep because he was about to do something reckless while there is bandits about. Ian tells the guard he can carry him back to the village now, then he begins walking away into the forest. When the knight asks where he is going, Ian says there is something he needs to do alone. The scene cuts to night time back in the village. Ledio approaches Douglas who is awake now and lying in his bed. Ledio has heard from a knight that he tried to do something stupid earlier. Douglas explains that he just wanted to find a flower that could help. Ledio shakes his head, telling his son that it was reckless to try something like that when there are still bandits around the village. Douglas gets angry, rising out of the bed he asks what else he is supposed to do. The two of them have been searching for this special flower for over a year with no luck. If they don't find it then Ledio will die. Douglas begins crying, wondering if this flower even exists. Suddenly, a voice calls out to them from outside. They both turn their heads at the same time asking who's there. 
It's a cloaked man who says he heard they were looking for a flower known as Randier's flower. The man enters the building and removes his hood, of course it is our protagonist who apologizes for disturbing them. He introduces himself and puts an object down on the table. Letio looks speechless when he notices exactly what it is. It's Randier's flower that has been encased in ice. Ian must have found it in the forest earlier. Ian says he will give them the flower if they answer a question first. He wants to know how they learned about a flower like this whose effects are unknown to others. Letio reluctantly reveals that he read about it in a book that was passed down by his father. It sounds hard to believe. However, he pulls out this book and flips to a specific page, then he begins reading from it. Randier's flower is a plant that can neutralize mana and can only be found in the northern lands. It has 12 deep purple-colored petals, and its leaves and stem are very poisonous. If you pull it directly from its roots it will wither immediately so gathering and cultivating it is almost impossible. Letio explains that his father researched alchemy too, and it is a family business. Ian assumes that this must mean that he knows about this flower's other use, which is that it acts as a deadly poison to magicians who possess both a mana heart and mana brain. Letio insists that his family would never make elixirs that could be used to harm people and he won't be poisoning any magicians ever. He even swears it on his entire family's honor. Ian looks over to Douglas on the other side of the room. He looks a little nervous at the topic of conversation being discussed. Ian picks up the flower and begins to melt the ice. He thanks the alchemist for answering his question but also apologizes to him. Once the ice melts the flower withers, and Ian reveals he wasn't able to harvest it properly and was only able to preserve its shape by freezing it. Letio feels let down and betrayed, he wants to know what kind of sick joke that was. Our protagonist only bought the flower over to prove that he can actually find it. He proposes a deal to the alchemist, saying that he will continue to alleviate his pain using magic while searching for a way to harvest the flower. However, in return Letio must follow him into the capital where Ian wants him to produce special elixirs that can help his lack of mana and to also make medicine for his mother when she gets sick in the future. Letio is confused, he asks why he can't just get someone else to do it since he isn't even that great of an alchemist. Ian insists that he needs someone who is going to stay by his side and make custom elixirs. He tells the alchemist to take a moment to think about it, and that he should consider his family too. Since earlier today Douglas was about to risk his life just to find the flower, and he doesn't want that happening again. Letio goes up to the side with his son to discuss things and our protagonist watches them. He thinks about what happened in his previous life. Back then Letio died due to an evil magician and Douglas was captured by bandits. This is what led to him meeting the Emperor Ragnar and hating magicians. And eventually what led him to creating the poison that killed our protagonist. Ian watches them closely, telling himself that he isn't going to let any of that happen this time and he is going to make sure they both live good lives. The next morning comes around and Ian is getting ready to return to the capital. One of the knights approaches him and tells him all the preparations are complete and they can now leave. Ian hangs his head in disappointment. He still hasn't gotten an answer from the alchemist and assumes this must mean it is a no. Right as he is about to leave the door opens and out comes Letio and Douglas. They have reached a decision and are going to come. After all they don't have any other options so they have to give it a try. Douglas looks over to Ian and asks if he will really be able to cure his father of his curse. Ian smiles and says that he promises, a deal is a deal. This makes Douglas happy and he says he is going to call our protagonist boss from now on. Ian finds this a little weird but allows it. He finds it weird seeing Douglas so cheerful, since when he knew him he was always so grumpy. One of the knights speaks up, saying they should head back to the Lord's castle immediately. He has just received word that the Prince Haydn has crossed the Gamas River and will arrive shortly. Ian is surprised to hear they are there so quickly and that they have only just contacted them. He tells the knight that he will need to borrow his horse if he is going to make it back in time. He approaches the mighty steed and uses his magic to tame it, asking it to take him back to the castle as fast as possible. The horse lowers itself to the floor, making it so Ian is able to climb onto the saddle. Once on his back he turns to the alchemist and the others, telling them to take their time and that he is going to go ahead. He prepares himself to ride off into the distance. We cut to the prince who is traveling in a white carriage surrounded by soldiers. Inside the carriage Prince Haydn seems to be in deep thought about something. He remembers a conversation he had with his father before he left. His father told him that one of the other princes has started to become close with the Tower Master Herbert. The Tower Master has a lot of influence and who he sides with is very important. He says that currently Herbert is more in favor of the fifth prince taking over the crown instead whose name is Ragnar. The Emperor tells Haydn that if he doesn't want to lose his position to his brother then he better not screw this up. 
He needs him to do his best to get Ian on their side. Haydn remembers this conversation while in the carriage and it makes him stressed. He's angry that the magicians at Ivory Tower don't support his claim to the throne, and instead they want his brother Ragnar to take his place. He thinks to himself about what he is going to do when he finally becomes emperor, saying that he is going to get rid of all those annoying magicians at Ivory Tower along with their tower master Herbert. It is also revealed that Prince Haydn didn't tell the Lord Marcus he would be coming until two days before his arrival on purpose. He smiles to himself, wondering how the great Magrian Lord is going to prepare for his arrival with only two days notice. This dude just seems like an all-around terrible person I'll be honest. Currently at Lord Marcus's castle there is a lot of panic and rushing. Marcus orders his maids around telling them to make sure there isn't even a speck of dust anywhere. It needs to be perfect for the prince. He had no idea they were arriving so soon and has had barely any time to prepare. The butler Hogger approaches, informing him that most of their party has arrived and the prince won't be far behind. However, they are still unable to locate our protagonist and it seems like he isn't going to make it in time. Marcus holds his head knowing he is going to have to greet the prince without Ian, who is the entire reason he is coming. It doesn't take long for Haydn's carriage to pull up, led by numerous horses and knights. He steps out like he is about to walk the red carpet, with a long white cape and a blue jacket. Marcus still looks nervous, knowing our protagonist is nowhere to be seen. Luckily the horse shows up at the last second, with Ian lying on its back like he has been sleeping. He raises his head, apologizing to everyone that he is late. Ian gets off the horse and steps forward with Marcus to greet the prince. Haydn looks down at him, asking if he is the child magician that everyone keeps talking about. Ian just remains silent. It's been a while since he has seen Prince Haydn's face and he takes a moment to take it in. He also recognizes some of the guests he came with. One of them is a girl named Cecilia who was a spy from another empire in his previous life. Everyone enters the castle and later we see Haydn drinking some wine next to a knight. He is the captain of the Second Imperial Knight Order and his name is Oliver. Prince Haydn is annoyed and says he hates everything here except for the wine and he doesn't like our protagonist either. Oliver just stays quiet, not wanting to say anything that could make the prince more annoyed. Elsewhere in the castle is Cecilia, she is a spy from the Coldwood Empire. She has been given orders to confirm if the rumors about Ian are true, and if they are she must capture both him and his mother alive and bring them back to the Coldwood Empire. She looks around but can't see him anywhere so she begins to wander around trying to find him. She finds Ian outside at the training grounds. It's the middle of the night and bro is still out here. Cecilia smiles to herself while sneaking up on him. She decides to check if he is really as strong as people say and prepares a magic attack. She decides to just use a weak attack and sends a bunch of magic missiles down onto Ian. He reacts quickly by putting up a shield. He then turns around asking why she would greet someone in this way. The woman smiles saying she was just playing a prank on her junior. Ian gets serious though, addressing the woman by her full name, Cecilia Coldwalker. This wipes the smile off her face as she realizes her cover is blown. She asks Ian how he knows her name. Ian's face appears sinister, of course he knows her name. He was the one who got rid of all the Coldwalker spies that were hidden in the Empire in his previous life. He slowly begins approaching her, while naming the names of all the spies that are here. Cecilia backs up in shock, thinking that Ian is crazy and she definitely wasn't expecting him to know all of this. Eventually she realizes that Ian is just a kid though, and she is a much older magician. She smiles and prepares to launch a fire attack, sending a curtain of flames out in front of her where our protagonist once stood. She says that even if he knew she was a spy it was foolish of him to reveal that he knew. She assumes he is dead until a foot steps out from the flames. He is very much alive and smoke evaporates from his body. He begins to charge up a magic attack of his own. Cecilia looks up at the sky and her eyes grow wide. She wonders who exactly this kid is and why he is so strong. The moon is blocked out by a bunch of ice crystals that are about to rain down. Ian tells Cecilia that he was expecting her to come and find him, and he was waiting at the training grounds just for her. He raises his hand, launching the ice crystals forward like bullets. Cecilia quickly reacts and puts up a shield, protecting her from the incoming projectiles that strike it with great force. Things don't look good for her and the shield begins to crack when faced with the power of Ian's attacks. Ian doesn't stop with ice, he summons a huge fireball in the palm of his hand. He then pushes it forward in the direction of his enemy, it's at least three times the size of him. Cecilia can only grit her teeth and hope for the best as her shield slowly breaks down. She isn't able to move while it is up. Some of the attacks break through, slicing at her arms and legs. She realizes she isn't going to be able to keep this up. 
as the fireball comes crashing and she releases her shield and tries to run out of the way before it hits her. She collapses onto the floor and is just grateful she is still alive. Her body is covered in wounds and her cheek is cut. Cecilia thinks that Ian's mana should be depleted by now, and someone will for sure arrive after hearing the commotion so she should be okay. Ian slowly approaches and says he is going to expose her to everyone, telling them that she is a spy. Cecilia smiles, knowing that there is no evidence to prove something like that and there's no way people are going to believe a kid over her. Ian smiles too though, saying that he has evidence on the Coldwalker spies that even she doesn't know about. It doesn't take long for the night Captain Oliver to arrive along with others, he asks what happened. People rush over to Cecilia to check on her injuries, helping her up off the floor. Ian speaks up, saying that he caused all of those injuries. Everyone quickly turns their heads to look at him. He continues, making up a lie that he saw Cecilia talking to someone wearing a mask, and when Cecilia spotted him she tried to kill him to shut him up. Oliver finds this hard to believe. However, Ian claims that he has proof. Apparently Cecilia has a special marking branded on her body that all Coldwalker spies have. Oliver demands that Cecilia has her body searched for this marking which causes an uproar. Two men stand in front of her saying that this is inappropriate. He claims that they are all just magicians that were sent by the Ivory Tower. However Oliver pulls his sword. The prince is staying here and he will get to the bottom of this incident to make sure it doesn't put him in danger. He signals to some other knights to come over and search Cecilia. They do as he says and there is no more arguing. After the search Cecilia looks unhappy. Blood still covers her clothes and she is badly injured, needing immediate medical attention. The knights inform Oliver that they couldn't find anything on her body that resembled a marking. The knight captain looks over to our protagonist, wanting to know if he was lying. Ian assures him that he wasn't. He walks up to Cecilia and places his hand on her back. He casts a magic spell and a blue light omits from his fingertips. Cecilia looks worried and asks what he is doing. Suddenly, the marking he was talking about appears on the back of her neck. It's a circle with a triangle in the center and weird symbols. Cecilia didn't even know she had this and Ian smiles to himself. Coldwalkers are sent to training institutes while having a mark branded on their body from when they are babies. Even they themselves don't know this information. Ian found this out in his previous life after interrogating an administrator. Oliver and the others are shocked, however they have no idea what the marking means and haven't seen it before. Based on the current situation he thinks it would be best to treat Cecilia's wounds first, and then interrogate her later. He turns to two other magicians, telling them to prepare a mana prison to keep her from escaping for the time being. He then turns to Ian with a serious expression. Stars shine in the night sky behind him and his sword shines in its sheath. If everything Ian has said today turns out to be the truth, then Oliver says he will have to report it to his majesty immediately. This is exactly what he does. He heads straight to Prince Haydn and tells him how our protagonist managed to beat Cecilia, a third-class magician. Haydn is impressed and didn't think the child was that strong. He asks Oliver what his opinion on Ian is. Oliver states that it seems like the rumors about his skill are true, however the way he speaks and behaves is unusual for a child. The prince wants to meet and talk to the boy so he can find out for himself. It doesn't take long for Oliver to get Ian and bring him into the room. Ian lowers his head and greets the prince with respect. Based on what Haydn has heard, our protagonist has discovered that one of the magicians sent by the ivory tower was a Coldwood spy. Since Ian exposed the spy and beat her in battle Haydn says he has contributed greatly to the empire, and he would like to reward him. He wants to know if there is anything specific that Ian wants. Ian becomes suspicious, thinking that the prince must be asking what he wants so he can find out what he is up to. Ian looks up, saying if the prince is okay with it he would like to visit the old ivory tower's site on the way to the imperial castle. Haydn is baffled, wondering why this kid wants to visit the old abandoned ivory tower site as a reward. There is nothing to see there. He ends up agreeing though, when Ian says it is a place he has only heard about and he has always wanted to visit. Ian smugly smiles to himself. It looks like he's going to be able to attain it much sooner than he thought. In the deepest basement of the old ivory tower site there is an item known as the Dragon Tongue Book. The dragon's language in the book played a crucial role in his research of time magic in his previous life. This one book contains the records of the essence of time magic. He found it a few years before he died but was only able to understand a very small part of it. He wonders how much he will be able to understand if he studies it from this young age. It doesn't take long for nightfall to hit and everyone begins their long journey to the Emperor's Imperial Castle. Ian's mother Vanessa is excited, as this is her first time traveling so far out from Mogrian. Letio the alchemist begins to flirt, saying he will be Vanessa's guide when they reach the capital. 
even though he doesn't look like it. He has lived and worked in the capital for a long time. Vanessa blushes, thanking the alchemist for being so kind, while Ian remains silent, wondering what this guy is doing flirting with his mother. They are interrupted by the vice captain of the knights named Paul. He has green eyes and a blue ribbon around his body. He says that they have arrived at their detour to the old ivory tower site. They are going to be staying here for two days and during this time Ian can explore the historical site whenever he wishes. Paul leads everyone to a nearby village to give them their accommodations for the next couple of days. The village seems quiet and cute, nothing too fancy and not a place you would expect royalty to stay. The commoners greet the prince upon his arrival, saying they are honored to have him here. Haydn thanks them for their kindness. Ian looks over and is surprised to see the prince acting so nice towards the commoners. When he met him in his previous life he always greeted him with hostility, appearing gloomy and giving him dirty looks. This was because our protagonist was always alongside his brother, Prince Ragnar who he knew was trying to take his future position as emperor. Now in this life Haydn can be seen smiling brightly, having conversations with commoners who are not nobles or royalty. A part of Ian begins to understand why the current emperor is so fond of him. A voice calls out Ian's name. It's Douglas who wants to know when Ian plans on going into the old ivory tower because he would like to tag along as well. Ian sighs, knowing that he probably won't be able to find the book in the basement with Douglas by his side. He can't bring himself to say no though and agrees. Douglas's eyes grow wide, he's super excited to go inside. Their parents are both watching them from a distance. They are glad to see their children are getting along. Letio turns to Vanessa, asking her if our protagonist has always been so mature. He doesn't act like other 12-year-olds. Vanessa reveals that he matured early. He remembers her late husband a lot and is very thoughtful and considerate. Even though he doesn't say it, Vanessa can see him trying to fill the absence of his father in the family. His father wasn't a magician like him and was just a normal person named Prayan. Before Ian was even born, he went to work one day as usual, and then suddenly went missing. Bro really went to get the milk before his child even left the womb. He left a bunch of items behind for them that they only received five years after his disappearance. Still looking over at her son Vanessa begins to struggle to get her words out. She has noticed that recently Ian seems different. Ledio is concerned and tries to comfort her. However, Vanessa just says that it's probably nothing. They get ready to go to sleep for the night as it's going to be a busy day tomorrow. In his previous life Ian traveled by following the wind and the stars. The unifying war had ended and he had left the ivory tower and emperor's side. He spent his days traveling around without a destination in mind. This was how he stumbled upon the old ivory tower site and the book in the basement. He wonders if it was a pure coincidence or if there was something there that was calling out to him. Here he stands in the same place but in his childhood body. It looks exactly like it did in his previous life. 300 years ago a war between the ivory tower magicians and the dragon's descendants took place here. The dragon's descendants were known as Dragonians. Their gargoyle squad and powerful black magic was strong and it seemed like they were going to defeat the Empire. A skilled magician and the prince of the Empire at the time named Mitchell led the Ivory Tower. They actively suppressed the Dragonians and annihilated the gargoyles, protecting the peace within the Empire. After the war Mitchell refused to become Emperor and instead became the Ivory Tower Master. He built a new tower in the current capital and this old one was abandoned. It has been a long time since people have even cared to step in this place and it has fell into ruin. Ian walks around the rubble searching for a specific spot that he remembers from his previous life. When he finds it he waves his hand, casting magic to open a secret passage. The passage is dark and has a long staircase leading downwards. He follows it. Upon reaching the bottom he uses his magic again, this time to light up the room that is hidden from any sunlight. In front of him stands a gargoyle statue, its wings spread wide and teeth sharp. Ian was surprised when he first saw this gargoyle statue but it's not going to catch him off guard this time. Suddenly, the gargoyle comes to life, its eyes glow purple and it lets out an echoing roar. It leaps into the air coming straight for Ian. In his first life he had no idea that a gargoyle he thought went extinct 300 years ago would be hiding here. Things are different now though and he uses his magic to summon a ball of water. He launches it at the stone monster, striking it in the chest. It flies backwards and crashes into a nearby wall. It's not dead though and recovers. In his previous life Ian was able to blow it away in a single breath, but with his current abilities he is going to have to use more power. The gargoyle comes charging in again, eager to cause harm to our protagonist who readies his next attacks. He summons his ice spears to shoot out of the ground and pierces the gargoyle's rocky body. 
He then uses a lightning attack to zap the beast. Bolts of yellow electricity crash down from above. That seems to have done the trick and the gargoyle has stopped moving. Ice surrounds it and smoke comes from its body. After it is defeated another secret passage opens up to Ian's right, which is exactly what he expected to happen. He jumps into the hole, using his magic to stop him from taking fall damage. He has found what he came here for. The book sits alone on a nearby surface with a light shining down on it. Ian has reached the Great Dragon Tongue book sooner than he expected. He has no idea who put it here. Whether it was the dragons or the first magician it doesn't matter, because it is his now. He holds the book in his hand. It is written in Dragon Tongue which is an unknown language that he wasn't able to fully decipher in his previous life. If he could understand it in this life then there will be no limit to his power. Ian becomes shocked though, when he opens the book and discovers that all of its pages are empty. He begins frantically flicking through it, wondering what could have happened. He realizes that the pages are probably empty because he already used the book in his previous life. Using it to turn back time probably erased everything. Ian closes the book in disappointment. He still remembers some of the magic that was written in the book though and tries to recite some of it. To his surprise he can't get his voice to come out. Dragon tongue isn't a language that people can simply just speak, it's a language that is rooted in magic and requires strong magic to speak it. Ian looks down at the book in deep thought. This means that he won't be able to use the time magic in this book again, meaning he can't return to the past again. He thought he would be able to keep going back again and again and retrying, but that isn't the case. The second life he has been given has all of a sudden become much more important and he needs to take it seriously. A few days pass and Ian completes his journey to the capital to meet the emperor. He looks out the window of his carriage and the scene around him. Tall buildings made from stone and a bunch of citizens that seem happy. He looks over to another carriage he has been traveling with and at the back is a cage. Inside this cage is Cecilia. Ian knows he needs to make sure she doesn't escape or else she will go back to the Coldwood Empire and tell them that he knows all about their secrets, which would cause problems for our protagonists. The party continues riding into the capital making their way to the Imperial Castle until they are blocked. It is Herbert the Tower Master who is standing at the gates alongside a row of magicians. He demands that they stop. Oliver gets off his horse, asking what authority Herbert has to be blocking the path to the castle. The tower master explains that he has a direct order stating that he is in charge of everything related to Cecilia's investigation. Oliver seems suspicious, wondering how he managed to get an imperial order for something like that before she even arrived in the capital. Herbert puts his hand on the knight's shoulder, saying that all rebellions should be dealt with as quickly as possible and that the ivory tower will handle this interrogation. Oliver knows something fishy is going on but can't argue with a direct order. He tells his men to hand over the criminal Cecilia to the tower master. Upon hearing the word criminal Herbert turns around seriously. He says that she has not yet been proven a criminal and so should still be treated like a regular magician. He tells Oliver to be mindful of how he speaks towards her. The other knights aren't happy with the situation either. They worked hard to catch Cecilia and the ivory tower magicians are just going to take her away. Ian looks over and understands what's going on. He knows that the ivory tower isn't trying to protect her just because she's a magician. They just don't want the knights interrogating one of their own. He knows that Herbert will probably just lock Cecilia up in the deepest prison and it will be near impossible for her to escape from that place. He looks out the carriage with his mother, not bothered at all that Cecilia is being taken. Someone approaches our protagonist, saying they need to visit one more place before going to the Imperial Palace. They go there and it is a large regal mansion, with a water fountain at its center. Ian recognizes the mansion. In his previous life it was gifted to him by the fifth Prince Ragnar. This time it is Prince Haydn who is handing it over. He tells Ian that the Emperor specially made arrangements to give him the mansion during his stay. Ian is grateful. He lowers his head and thanks His Highness for his generosity. He didn't get the mansion until he was 26 in his previous life, yet here he is as a child. Haydn tells Ian that his family can stay here with him for the time being, but now the two of them must go to the Imperial Palace to see the Emperor. Ian understands, but asks if he can show his mother around his new mansion first. Haydn accepts and Ian takes his mother inside. She is stunned by everything she sees, it's all so expensive and shiny. She becomes even more stunned when Ian tells her that this is going to be their new home. No matter how great of a magician he was in his previous life he couldn't bring her back to life. Now that she is alive again things are different and he is going to do all the things he wanted to do before. He was never able to see her living a normal life and vows that this time he is going to make her happy. Vanessa can't believe her own eyes. She says the place is so big that she has no idea how she is going to clean it. She really is a true mother thinking only about cleaning. 
Ian informs her that she isn't going to be doing any housework. She is going to be so comfortable that she won't even think of having to clean. The new mansion is nice, it has many windows and white brick with a blue roof. However, it is now time for Ian to meet the Emperor. He heads over to the Imperial Palace which is much larger, red banners hang in multiple places and everything is perfectly symmetrical. Ian is nervous, even in his previous life he was never able to meet the current Emperor alone because by the time he had graduated from the Magic Academy the Emperor was already on his deathbed. He was said to be someone with outstanding judgment and wisdom and Ian is looking forward to learning about him. While walking through the palace he spots a familiar room across the courtyard. It's the room of the fifth Prince Ragnar. He was the son of a concubine. He resembled the Emperor in appearance but his personality was completely different. He was cold-blooded and merciless. Ragnar was our protagonist's old friend and worst enemy, the man that poisoned him at the start. Ian continues walking. Clenching his fist he wonders what he is going to do with Ragnar when he sees him again in this life. They arrive at the Emperor's room and the guard gestures towards the door telling him to enter, his majesty awaits. The white and gold doors swing open and Ian stands in a fancy outfit. The time for him to meet the Emperor has finally arrived. The Emperor sits on his throne. It's tall and made from white marble with red cushioning. Upon entering Ian immediately kneels down to the ground. As a humble servant he wishes the Emperor health and peace. The Emperor Terry tells him not to try so hard and to rise. Ian has achieved so much in so little time and there is no need for him to use manners. Ian does as he says, remembering that the Prince Ragnar said the same thing to him in his previous life when they first met. Next to Terry is his son Prince Haydn who waves and smiles, asking if our protagonist likes his new mansion. He does, it's more luxurious than he ever could have imagined. Sweat drips down his face as he is still nervous in the presence of the royals. Terry asks if Ian knows the reason he has brought him here, and the reason he was gifted a mansion as soon as he arrived. Ian doesn't know what to say, should he be more direct and speak his mind or hold back and be respectful. He remembers the Prince Ragnar liked people that were honest and straightforward and there is a high chance the Emperor is the same. However, he ultimately decides it is too soon for him to act so confidently and for now he should just continue acting like a 12-year-old. He replies to the Emperor's question, saying that he thinks he bought him him because he's a little talented. Terry folds his arms, asking if Ian really thinks he went through all this trouble just because his magic abilities are unusual. Haydn snaps at his father to be more patient. Ian is just a child that doesn't know much about politics. Terry sighs, it's true that he called our protagonist here because he thought highly of his talents, and he was a great help to the Empire in catching the spy. The Emperor sits on his throne saying that Ian should be rewarded for his achievements regardless of his age and that is why he is here. He asks what he wants. Ian looks down at the floor, he was expecting a reward from the Emperor, and has spent a lot of time thinking about it. If he was an adult what he is about to ask wouldn't make sense but since he is just a child he can get away with it. He tells Terry that he would like to go sightseeing around the Imperial Palace, so he can tell his mother about all the beautiful things he sees. The Emperor finds this request a little unusual, however Haydn informs him that he also asked to go sightseeing at the old ivory tower, and it must be a passion of his. It's normal for children to be curious after all. Terry grants our protagonist's wish and hands him an imperial seal. It's golden and shaped like a ticket, using this he should have access to most of the imperial palace, and if he shows it to a royal guard they can guide him around. The Emperor continues, saying there is more stuff he would also like to reward Ian with. He has his servants bring in a giant chest filled with gold. I don't know how they carried that thing it looks really heavy. He also gifts Ian a bunch of maids, saying he will send them to his mansion to make sure his stay is as comfortable as possible. Ian can't believe it. It looks like his mother isn't going to worry about cleaning anymore. He thanks the Emperor for his kindness and leaves. He closes the door behind him and takes a deep breath. The Emperor sure is different from the others, and Ian seems to think he is suspicious of him. He begins walking off, assuming that the Emperor must be like that with everyone, just like Ragnar was. For now Ian needs to get a move on. He doesn't have much time and wants to use his Imperial Seal. He goes outside and shows it to a guard, asking if he can show him the way to the garden. The guard obliges. After some help he arrives in the place he wanted to go, the Imperial family's safe haven. He remembers it from his previous life. Ragnar described it as a sacred place where people would serve the Emperor and Empress, and only the most elite can enter. Ian sneaks inside. He peeks around a corner trying to see if there are any guards around. There are a few but they are all sleeping. They've got to be the worst guards ever. Ian sneaks up to them and uses his magic to make sure they are really unconscious. He then begins to walk around looking for something. 
It's unclear what he wants but he knows it's somewhere around the first emperor's coffin. It takes a while. He checks everywhere using his magic to light the way until he eventually finds it. His eyes grow wide and he is unable to even believe what he is seeing. This is the whole reason he wanted to explore the palace. The item he has found is stone heart mushrooms. They are brown and capped and are sticking out of the floor next to a coffin. Ian rushes over there and harvests them. He puts them inside a brown bag thinking that this should be enough for what he needs. Suddenly he hears the voices of two people talking nearby and they are approaching. He quickly turns off his magic light and hides wondering who it could be. It's a magician and he seems to be worried that he shouldn't be in this place. The person he is talking to is one of the princesses. Princess Harry, who has long blonde hair and a blue jacket over a white dress. She assures the magician that they both have legitimate reasons to be here. At the moment it is unclear why they are down here and Ian secretly spies on them for a while. The magician, whose name is Kevin, is worried and thinks the ivory tower should know about what they are doing. However, Harry insists that they can't find out as it would be too dangerous. Kevin asks her if she has memorized the basic spells that he taught her and the princess smiles, saying that of course she did. She begins to demonstrate her magic powers by letting her mana flow and summoning a ball of light. Ian looks over in complete shock. He had no idea Princess Harry could use mana. He remembers her from his previous life. She spent her whole life in a cage like a bird. When Ragnar became emperor he executed Prince Haydn which broke her heart and ultimately led to her ending her own life. Ian can't believe this woman is a magician and is hiding it from everyone. In this empire hiding the fact that you possess magical talent from the ivory tower is a very serious crime. The magician Kevin must also know this, yet has agreed to help her practice magic secretly, which is why they are down here in this secluded place. Ian leaves and the two of them turn around after hearing a noise. Kevin freaks out, not wanting to get caught he says they should just end today's practice early. The princess Harry tells him to relax and that only the imperial family can enter so she is sure they are alone. Ian makes it outside without being spotted. He has learned many surprising and interesting facts today. To think that the princess has committed a crime by hiding her talent. He realizes that she probably did this because she is scared of the ivory tower. The tower master Herbert clearly wants her brother Ragnar to inherit the throne and having a powerful magician in the family could change that. Even making her a target for assassination. Ian continues with his day, exiting the garden and thanking the guard for showing him the way earlier. The guard asks if he enjoyed himself, to which Ian replies that he did with a smile on his face. He rushes back to his new mansion ready to make use of the mushrooms he just found. As soon as he enters he is greeted by a butler who takes his jacket, and the alchemist Letio. Letio explains where everyone is. Vanessa is in another room talking with the new maids that have arrived from the emperor, and Douglas is looking around the mansion having a good time. He's never seen a place so big. Ian is happy to hear everyone is doing great and asks to talk with the alchemist privately. The two of them go into a secluded room and our protagonist shuts the door behind him so no one can listen. He looks at Letio with a serious expression, asking if he can make a secret potion for him. Letio is confused, wanting to know what kind of potion he needs and why it is so hush-hush. Our protagonist pulls out the stone heart mushrooms he just collected. They are able to numb nerves and can even stop a heart. He pulls them out of the brown bag and shows them to Letio. This just makes the alchemist even more confused. How can he be expected to make a potion out of something so poisonous? His purple eyes are baffled and his hair with white streaks comes down onto his face. Ian explains that he needs a potion that will make him immune to interrogation magic, which is when a magician is able to tell if someone is telling the truth or lying. He stands in front of Letio asking if this is something he will be able to do for him or not. Letio has heard of interrogation magic before and doesn't know if it is even possible to make a potion to stop it from working. He says that he is going to need to run a lot of experiments to get it right and that it is going to take him a while. Our protagonist expected an answer similar to this, knowing that it is not an easy thing to ask. He tells the alchemist to just do his best and to take his time. While they are discussing this someone knocks at the door to the room they are in. Upon opening the door Ian sees that it is a maid. She lowers her head to show respect and is holding a tray with a letter on it. The letter is addressed to Ian. He removes it from the envelope and begins reading it. He sees that it is from the ivory tower. It states, Dear Magician Ian Page, Just like the Imperial family, the ivory tower eagerly looks forward to meeting you. We would like to schedule a meeting with you before you start attending the academy. You are already a decent magician who possesses abilities beyond the average magician, and it will be hard for you to relate to the students who can still only use beginner's magic. Therefore, we would like to arrange a simple meeting with you exactly a week from today. After reading this letter Ian gets a little worried. 
If he is going to be visiting the magicians at the ivory tower soon then he needs to prepare. He changes his mind to what he said earlier, telling Letio the alchemist that he will be needing the potion in a week and he should move quickly. He needs it before his meeting at the ivory tower. Letio thinks that this is going to be impossible and that even if he sacrifices his sleep he is going to struggle. He wonders what on earth he is going to do in order to get it finished in time. Ian just apologizes, but assures Letio that he needs the potion in a week no matter what so he should try his best. He's confident in his abilities and is sure he can do it. Going to the ivory tower without this potion would be fatal. One week has now passed and it is now time for Ian to attend his meeting at the ivory tower. He is currently on the way there riding in a carriage. Just like he asked the alchemist Letio has managed to make the potion. It is made from the stone heart mushroom ingredient and will allow the consumer to maintain a normal heart rate for two hours after drinking it. This means our protagonist will be able to use it to avoid being detected by interrogation magic, which is a type of magic that is used to see if someone is lying. Ian looks out the window at the ivory tower. It's tall and white and in the shape of something dirty that I can't say on YouTube. He remembers it so well from his previous life and now he is back again. The carriage pulls up to the front entrance and the driver informs our protagonist that they have arrived and he can exit. Upon stepping out of the carriage he is greeted by a female magician who welcomes him. She has large glasses, freckles and her hair is braided. She tells Ian that she will take him to the tower master Herbert. He follows her inside and they enter the entrance hall. The woman begins describing the layout but Ian already knows all this. The place hasn't changed at all from his previous life. It's the same in the present and the future. The woman gestures over to a golden disc that is on the floor. This device is called a mana elevator and can help people travel to different floors in the ivory tower. Just sounds like a regular elevator to me but okay. The golden elevator is able to reach the top floor immediately and is exclusively used by high-ranking magicians. The woman tells our protagonist to step on the golden disc. On the top floor he will find the tower master's room where high-ranking magicians will be waiting for him. Ian does as she says and a beam of golden light shoots straight up. I guess it's not a normal elevator then. As he is traveling upwards Ian pulls the potion out of his pocket and holds it up. He raises it to his mouth and throws it back like he's taking shots at a club. The effects will last for two hours from now. The elevator completes its journey and comes to an abrupt stop, the gold light still shining to the heavens. In front of Ian is a large door. This must be the Tower Master's room. He gets ready to go inside. Upon entering the first thing he sees is the Tower Master Herbert. He greets our protagonist and thanks him for accepting the invitation. He tells him not to just stand by the door and to come and sit closer. Herbert isn't the only person here and when Ian looks to his right he sees a bunch of other men all with serious expressions like they aren't here to mess around. The scene is similar to his left, except instead of men there are women. He is told not to be scared or intimidated. This is just tradition for those that are accepted as a magician in the ivory tower. He approaches a lone chair in the middle of the room and sits on it. Looking at the atmosphere in here he can tell these guys are trying to instill obedience in him right from the start. Herbert summons some kind of script from the palm of his hand and begins giving a speech, saying that after hearing of our protagonist's exceptional abilities everyone has become quite suspicious. However, as magicians all share mana they have a bond even stronger than that of blood brothers. They have invited Ian here today to start fresh and get rid of any suspicions they may have. Ian jokingly asks if this means they are going to torture him or something. Herbert's serious tone is broken for a moment when he smiles a little, of course they're not going to torture him. The ivory tower doesn't use such barbaric methods. They are just going to ask him some questions and he needs to answer them truthfully. Herbert's eyes glow blue as he activates his interrogation magic that can detect lies. They get ready to begin. Herbert and our protagonist sit opposite each other while everyone else sits on the sides. They're really going through this much effort to intimidate a 12-year-old. Herbert begins reading Ian's biography out loud. His full name is Ian Page born in the year 488. His father's name was Pran and was a wandering adventurer. His mother Vanessa is a servant in the Lord's Castle. The Tower Master asks him to confirm if this is all accurate and Ian nods. Some bald guy speaks up, asking what Ian's relationship is with the alchemist Letio. The light shines on his hairless head. Ian informs the baldy that his mother has a frail body, and he needed an alchemist that could constantly provide him with medicine. Someone else asks another question, wanting to know why he visited the old ivory tower in part 1. He actually went to find a rare spell book but of course he doesn't tell them this. He lies saying that he heard a lot about the place and just wanted to check it out. A man in a green jacket brings up Cecilia, the spy from the Coldwood Empire that Ian helped capture in part 1. Ian made up a story saying he witnessed Cecilia talking with another spy 
and that she tried to kill him after he saw them. The man in the green jacket wants to know if this story is really true, as he hasn't been able to get Cecilia to confess to anything yet. Sweat drips from Ian's cheek. He lies through his teeth saying the story is true. He can't tell them that he really knew she was a spy because of his previous life. The questions keep coming. It's like he's being interviewed by the police. An older woman wants to know if he has really never been taught magic by anyone before like he claimed. Usually people who possess magic power need to go through vigorous training at an academy to learn to cast spells. However Ian was able to use fireballs, spirit summons, and even frost nova spells supposedly without ever being taught. The woman wants to know how something like that is possible, and she wants a real answer not just something vague. Ian gets ready to tell yet another lie. Bro really put on his acting pants today. He says that the spells just appeared in his mind. All he did was imagine burning fire above his palm and then one day it became a reality. He demonstrates this to prove his point. The room bursts out into chaos, with many of the people there shouting that this is impossible and his story is absurd. The room is filled with shock and disbelief until they all turn to the tower master Herbert, who has his head resting on his hands. He confirms that it must be true. He is using the most powerful interrogation magic available in the ivory tower, and he isn't able to detect any lies from our protagonist. Ian's skills are so impressive Herbert even thinks he might be the reincarnation of the legendary first magician. Either that or he is a high-class magician who is able to bypass interrogation magic. However, since Ian is only 12 he thinks it's impossible for a small boy to have the amount of mana to be able to do something like that. With his head still resting on his hands Herbert just stares at our protagonist. Silence fills the room for a moment. The silence is broken when a woman with red hair stands up from her chair in a loud manner. Her name is Helene and she yells out that this is stupid and everyone is asking such trivial questions. The others tell her to calm down but she wants the truth. She marches right up to Ian with her hand on her hip. She asks him the question everyone in the room is dying to know. Who exactly are you? She wants to hear who he is from his own mouth. Just who exactly does he think he is to keep spouting these ridiculous statements? Ian knows Helene from his previous life. She really is that kind of woman. She was the youngest fourth-class high-ranking magician before Ian arrived. She's also very aggressive and temperamental. Her attitude has even earned her the nickname, the Woman of Fire. Ian decides to clap back at Helene's aggression, saying that everyone already knows who he is. It's all written in the text the Tower Master pulled up earlier. He begins reading from it. His name is Ian Page and he was born in the year 488. He asks the woman if she knows how to read, why would she ask such a stupid question? Of course this makes Helene furious. She begins to bubble with rage, ready to teach our protagonist a lesson for acting so cheeky. Herbert stops the situation from escalating though. He yells out enough and his voice echoes through the room. Everyone turns to look his way. The tower master gets ready to ask one final question. By the looks of things it's going to be a good one. He brings up the guard that Ian met all the way back at the start of part one. His name was Jonathan and he insulted our protagonist's mother. That very same soldier was found dead the next day, drowned in a nearby lake. When they found him they detected trace amounts of mana on his body meaning that this was the work of a magician. Herbert wants to know if Ian had anything to do with his death. He watches closely with his interrogation magic. He sees that Ian's demeanor hasn't changed. A normal person would have lost their composure when being suspected of murder, but not our protagonist. This is all due to the effects of the potion though, deep inside Ian is worried, thinking that if his heartbeat were to remain normal in a situation like this it would be even more suspicious than if it was raised. He gets ready to answer, wondering if he should dispel the potion's effects now. He tells everyone he is going to give them the answer they want to hear. With his hand on his heart he says he had nothing to do with the guard's death. Interrogation magic fills the room and all the magicians look over in his direction. It's as if they can all tell that he is lying. The tower master doesn't call him out on it and just asks him to confirm what he just said. Ian doubles down and a brief silence circulates the room. Herbert decides to leave it at that, thanking Ian for answering such a troublesome question. He says that the guard must have tripped off the bridge and drowned to his death by accident while drunk. Ian looks a little confused, unable to be sure whether the master knows that was a lie and why he didn't call him out on it. Herbert moves on. He would like to finish up and eat a meal together however there are still some procedures they need to do. The ivory tower has never seen anything like Ian's ability before. It's an unknown power that they have no knowledge of. That's why they need a method to test his skills that considers his mana capacity and growth potential. In front of Ian is an item known as a mana accumulator. You could say it's the driving force that moves most of the components in the ivory tower. 
It doesn't look like much because it hasn't been filled with mana. The more mana it is charged with the more blue it becomes. Herbert asks Ian to approach the accumulator and inject all his mana into it so they can find out what his limit is. Ian approaches the large ball and rubs his hands on it. He knows the accumulator can be charged up to a third class master's amount of mana, and so the safest option would be for him to charge it up to a second class level. If he shows these guys the level of mana they are expecting he can reduce the suspicions surrounding him. However, while injecting his mana into the ball he begins to have second thoughts. In his previous life he was merely an 8th class magician and worked hard to grow his powers. He wasn't a sage or a leader and just got by by observing the situation and calculating the best move. In his new life he has been hiding everything and giving things up so he doesn't get caught. He could have power, wealth, and fame but those things are not important to him. He's willing to give up anything to hide his secret but not his magic. Anything but his magic. He continues injecting the accumulator, telling himself that he is not going to let anyone become stronger than him, and he is not going to hide the powers he worked hard for in his previous life. The ball is now a bright blue color and is filled with so much mana it shatters, pieces of it fly around the room. The people cover their faces and try to get a glimpse of what just happened. The room is filled with smoke though and this obstructs their vision. As it fades our protagonist is revealed. He is gripping his chest and breathing deeply from exerting so much power. Herbert's mouth drops open and he is speechless. The same can be said for everyone else, who are all wondering how something like this is possible. The redhead Helene bends over and picks a broken shard of glass up from the floor. She looks over to Ian. The limit of the mana accumulator was that of a third class master's level. Since Ian broke the device, that must mean that his abilities are even higher than that. The last of the smoke begins to clear from the room and Ian recovers from his exhaustion. There's no going back for him now, they know how strong he is. Sometime later all the other magicians go into a private room to discuss the situation. A fist slams down onto the table. All the rumors everyone has heard about our protagonist is true. He must be at least a fourth class master, meaning he is on par with everyone in the room except for Herbert the Tower Master. And when he said he didn't kill Jonathan he was definitely lying. The Ivory Tower must learn to control Ian or they risk him becoming a very dangerous person. A magician suggests that they make him exempt from the Academy's admission, and instead focus on making him loyal to the Ivory Tower as quickly as possible. Herbert admits this would be harsh but it would probably be best. It would be a waste of time if Ian joined the Academy and his outstanding abilities would just make the other students feel out of place. Even the highest ranked magicians at Ivory Tower were left bewildered by his abilities. Imagine how young students who have barely started to use magic would feel. Herbert says that whether or not he killed the guard is not important right now. As long as they have interrogation magic he won't be able to lie to them. Yeah bro I wouldn't be so certain about that. The Ivory Tower's goal is to maintain its status as the elite. The stronger its magicians are, the higher the status of the Ivory Tower will be compared to foreign empires. Therefore they are going to recognize Ian Page as a high-ranking magician and let him sit among them, announcing the birth of a new fourth-class magician. Considering his age and abilities, Herbert thinks it would be best if he received personal training from other high-ranking magicians. Everyone in the room agrees. Herbert is glad they are all on board. He is about to choose which magician will be in charge of our protagonist's training. However, someone raises their hand and volunteers to do it. The scene cuts to Ian who is outside looking at the ivory tower with admiration at how beautiful it is. To think he'd be recognized as a high-ranking magician so soon. He sort of expected it to happen but not this fast. Someone interrupts his thoughts by calling out his name and he turns over to see who it is. It's the woman he met when he first arrived. She heard the news and is so happy to hear Ian is now a fourth-class high-ranking magician. It's incredible that he has come so far when he is only 12. She concludes that this must mean the crazy rumor is true. Ian looks a little confused, wondering what kind of rumors are spreading round about him. The woman moves on, saying that she is going to be his assistant magician for the next year and will guide him around. She looks forward to them working together. Ian tells her that she doesn't need to speak so formally, after all she is his senior. In that case, as his senior the woman offers to give him a tour of the place. The first place they go to is the Tower Academy. It has a lot of pillars and a Roman aesthetic. This is where he was supposed to enroll at the Academy, but instead he will be receiving personal training from high-ranking magicians. Ian knows that personal training is just a fancy word. He knows that they are really just trying to keep him on a tight leash. He thinks it was probably Herbert's idea to turn him into an obedient dog. He notices something while walking through the academy. It's all his old friends that were training in the academy at the same time as him in his previous life. 
He remembers that all of them were killed during one of the first wars and he thought he would never see them again. Ian knows it will be difficult for him to be as close to them as he was before, but he is for sure going to greet them if he gets the opportunity. His guide shows Ian to his personal research lab. She gestures to a wooden door with golden markings saying she used cleaning magic to make sure the room was tidy. Our protagonist enters the room and can't believe it. A grand piano can be seen in the back and a desk with flasks can be seen on the right. This is the same lab that he used in his past life. The woman explains that 300 years ago when the ivory tower relocated there were 24 high-ranking magicians. However, now there is less than half of that so there are a lot of rooms available. She informs Ian that the tower master has given him this one to use as a research lab. She tells Ian to wait here for a moment while she goes to get the magician who will be teaching him. She exits the room and closes the door, leaving our protagonist alone, in the same room he spent so much time in during his previous life. It's been such a long time since he was last here. He didn't get this room until he was 19 before and here he is at age 12. He begins thinking of a long-term plan. Now that he has the authority of a high-ranking magician, there is only one thing left to do. He needs to create a new group within the Ivory Tower. During the next six years Prince Ragnar is going to start making moves to become Emperor. This is the same man that betrayed Ian in his previous life by poisoning him. The Tower Master Herbert is going to be in strong support of Ragnar becoming Emperor, so Ian needs to establish a group that can fight against this. It's going to be difficult as the magicians are all so loyal to their Tower Master, mostly due to his overwhelming power and high class. Ian realizes that in order to influence people he needs to become stronger than Tower Master Herbert. Our protagonist is going to work hard and there will come a time when he rules over all of the Ivory Tower. Until then he should just act like an obedient little kid, as he knows it's going to be a while before he gets stronger with this small child's body. While he is thinking of his master plan someone bursts through the door like they are the FBI conducting a raid. Ian quickly turns around. It's the redhead Helene, and it looks like she is the magician who volunteered to teach our protagonist. Upon seeing her Ian lets out a sigh. It really had to be her of all people. Helene enters the room and has a smile on her face, knowing she is about to have some fun with this. She greets our protagonist by calling him an arrogant brat. Ian just looks over annoyed, like he is already done with this childish behavior. Helene changes her mind, saying he isn't simply arrogant but is something way beyond that. She begins to approach telling him how things are going to be. Things like basic mannerisms, history, and magic theory would have all been taught at the academy. However, the Tower Master wants our protagonist to learn all these things without attending the academy. The excuse he gave was that our protagonist would make all the other students feel discouraged or something like that. Helene uses her magic to flick a bunch of books from a nearby bookshelf. Saying that these things are all useless she throws them to the ground. Doing lame things like that isn't her style, and she is going to let the old folks teach Ian about all that. Helene leans in close to Ian and mentions Cecilia the spy from the Coldwood Empire that our protagonist caught in part 1. Helene remembers her from the Academy. Cecilia was quite known in the field of magic combat, and given time she could have been on the same level as Helene. Yet she turned out to be a spy of all things, and was even defeated by a child. Ian just stands there still, he hasn't said a word since Helene entered and has just been listening to her gossip and insults. Helene decides that since she is going to be Ian's teacher she should at least teach him something. There are many different types of magicians, magicians trained for combat and are aggressive, magicians that are supporters and are more defensive, and some magicians spend their whole life simply researching. She explains that a magician that doesn't fit into any of these categories is just considered trash. Looking at Ian she asks him to guess what kind of magician she is. Ian looks uninterested, finally opening his mouth and guessing that she is probably the first type, a combat magician. Helene confirms it, there is no one that is better than her in the combat field and she is different to all the other magicians. Since she is different she is going to be teaching Ian in her own way. She tells him to follow her, knowing he doesn't have a choice and has to do as she says. They head outside in the sun and into an open area to get started. The reason they are out here is because Helene wants to battle. She tells Ian to come at her like he is fighting for his life, only then will she teach him. Ian is reaching his limit. He can't believe this woman is exactly the same as she was in his previous life. Back then she would always keep pestering him for battles too. Ian's eyes turn blue. This time he's not even going to give Helene the chance to start and will put a stop to her nonsense right here. Spectators begin to gather, wondering what is going on and why some 12-year-old is fighting someone as strong as Helene. The redhead smiles at the crowd, already assuming she is going to win. Since she is the teacher she says that Ian can make the first move. 
Gian removes a piece of clothing from his body and begins approaching slowly, asking his opponent if she is sure. Helene just scoffs, saying he shouldn't be getting scared now when he was so cheeky earlier. Ian can't wait to shut this woman up and the battle begins. He raises his hand and a blue glow appears. Helene thinks he is deploying some kind of barrier or shield. She laughs saying that no matter what barrier he deploys she will destroy it in an instant. Flames surround her getting hotter and hotter as she prepares an attack. Ian uses an ice block spell that causes a shard of ice to wrap around his body and protect it. Bro has got to be chilly in there. Helene is unimpressed and walks right up to him knocking on the ice. Is this really the best he could come up with? She wonders if he is intending to just sleep in there until his mana runs out. Ice block is the most powerful barrier that can protect magicians, but it causes magicians to go into a half-conscious state where they are unable to use any other magic. Helene shrugs her shoulders, thinking she was foolish to expect a decent fight from a child. Suddenly a sound begins to emanate and the ground shakes. All the spectators look around wondering what is happening. The redhead turns around to check on our protagonist and what she sees shocks her to the core. While still inside the ice block he looks right up at her, staring right into her eyes. Somehow he is able to move and be awake while being inside the ice. Ian uses his magic and grass-like vines begin to grow tall. They surround Helene like trees. She can only look up with a pale expression wondering how this is possible. This is crazy, and she begins to regret her decision to battle. These vines come right for her, they stretch into the sky and can be seen for miles. Helene desperately tries to avoid them by dodging and weaving but it's no use. There is no end to them and no matter how many she burns they just keep coming back. She knows if this continues then she is going to lose, losing to a 12 year old would be embarrassing. In order to win she knows she needs to find a way to get Ian out of the ice block. She begins trying to think of a way, wondering how he is even able to use magic from inside there anyway. Her thoughts distract her for too long and the vines sneak up and grab a hold of her. They wrap around the redhead's neck and limbs, making it so she is no longer able to move. Once she has been immobilized Ian exits from the block of ice with his fists clenched. All Helene can do is laugh and admit defeat. She heard rumors that Ian had the same abilities as the legendary first magician. It looks like they were right. She asks our protagonist to release her from these disgusting vines. However Ian refuses saying not yet, it would be a shame for the battle to end so soon. Helene appears a little frightened. She already admitted her loss yet Ian is planning to do something else. Ian slowly raises his arm into the air with his palm facing behind him. The sky begins to crackle and dark clouds begin to form over the two of them. Helene gets desperate, begging him to stop. They were only supposed to be sparring and it's all over now. Ian ignores her though, he summons lightning from the cloudy sky, pointing his finger down at Helene. Bro is ready to cook her like a chicken strip. The roar of thunder booms and a flash of yellow lightning comes crashing down. For a moment everyone expects the worst and watches with worried expressions. Many of the spectators have sweat dripping down their faces. It is revealed that the lightning missed the red head and instead hit the ground right between her legs. She gasps while out of breath from the sheer panic of the situation. She's just thankful she survived and begins to calm down. However, Ian gets closer and kneels down which just makes her start panicking again. She yells at him to stay away from her. He comes in real close with a smug look on his face, asking if there is still anything that Helene would like to teach him. The redhead doesn't respond and just hangs her head in shame, not wanting to do anything that could get her killed. Seeing that she is now well and truly defeated Ian releases her from the vines and walks away. He pushes back the crowd of spectators that has grown since the battle started. He asks them to move out of his way as he is feeling a little tired. With all these witnesses, rumor of Helene's defeat quickly spread. A few days pass at the ivory tower. We see the tower master Herbert walking with his big stick and another magician next to him. The magician informs Herbert that Helen is not doing well after her defeat. She is not in a good state and hasn't eaten for the last couple of days. On the surface Herbert shows great concern. But on the inside he is extremely disappointed. She really challenged and was humiliated by a 12-year-old kid. How pathetic. Herbert wanted to tame our protagonist and intimidate him but now that he has seen his strength he now knows this won't be possible. Our protagonist is not a dog that can be put on a leash. He's a wolf and it'll take a while before they can turn him into a tool they can use. Herbert continues walking and thinking about what he can do until he reaches his destination. He enters a room and greets someone inside, apologizing for his tardiness. The person he is speaking to is revealed to be Prince Ragnar the fifth prince who became the emperor in our protagonist's previous life. The two were close friends until Ragnar betrayed him. Upon seeing the tower master has arrived Ragnar closes his book and puts it down. 
He looks at Herbert and asks what information he has for him today about the popular magician Ian Page. It seems like Herbert has been informing Ragnar about everything that has been going on and the two are planning something. The scene cuts to Ian's mansion on a bright sunny day. We see Douglas, the alchemist's son, all dressed up and ready to go somewhere. He calls out to his father. The alchemist Letio appears and is happy to see his son. It's time to head out. The two of them turn to our protagonist saying farewell. It's time for Douglas to head to the academy for his first day of class. We see Ian who is sitting down reading a book. He can't believe that today is already his first day. To think that the Imperial Alchemist Academy accepted him as the top of the cohort as soon as he registered. There's no doubt about it. He definitely has extraordinary talents and a bright future as an alchemist. Ian knows all of the subjects that are taught from his previous life and knows that Douglas is going to have a good time. Unfortunately the same thing can't be said for Ian, who is sitting around with nothing to do for a while. He decides to get up and get back down to business. Ever since he returned he has been working non-stop. Even though Ragnar hasn't made any moves yet he knows he can't just sit around. Ian knows that if he wants to reach the same amount of power he had in his previous life then he needs to strengthen this weak body. A maid enters the room with a letter on a tray from the Imperial Palace. Ian picks it up and sees that it is an invitation to some sort of special event hosted by Prince Hyden. He can't believe it and begins getting ready. That night he arrives at the location still finding it hard to believe he was invited to an event like this. It is an unspoken rule that a magician cannot be invited to social events if they aren't born from nobility, yet here he is. Ian finds it surprising that Prince Hyden is hosting this event himself. In his previous life when it came to interacting with the nobles, Prince Hyden always did so half-heartedly and never hosted events for people of high statuses. Because of his lukewarm attitude he lost his opportunity to enter the political world and all of the empire's nobles turned their backs on him. Prince Ragnar was different though. Not only was he active in the kingdom's political scene but he also made it a point to become friends with other nobles and make connections with them. This is ultimately what led to Prince Ragnar stealing the throne from his brother once their father had died. Ian doesn't know why Haydn is acting so differently now but he doesn't care as it works to his advantage. Anything that can prevent Ragnar becoming emperor is good to him. Ian approaches the door and prepares to enter the event Haydn is hosting. The man at the door takes his invitation. Inside is a sight to see, marble walls and floors, with golden chandeliers and decor. They definitely didn't get this stuff from Ikea. All the nobles in the room look at our protagonist as he enters, chatting amongst themselves, probably wondering what he is doing here. It begins to make Ian a little unsettled. He was never one to associate with nobles in his old life. The awkwardness comes to a stop when Prince Hyden enters and everyone lowers their heads to show respect towards him. He appears on a nearby balcony looking down on everyone wearing more pieces of clothing than I can count. Haydn thanks everyone sincerely for gathering here tonight. As everyone is probably aware he is hosting this banquet on behalf of his father, the Emperor. Normally he would do the opening speech first but before that Haydn would like to take this opportunity to introduce everyone to a special guest. Ian appears a little flustered, wondering if he is talking about him or not. Haydn continues, This person is someone he took the time to personally invite, and he is the youngest fourth-class high-ranking magician in the Ivory Tower, an honored guest from the Magrian territory in the north. Ian Page, upon hearing his name a smile appears on our protagonist's face. The prince invites him to come over and so he does. Haydn tells him that the sole purpose of this event was so he could introduce Ian to everyone. Upon hearing this Ian seems a little confused, he thanks the prince for his graciousness. Though deep inside he knows this was probably all just a ploy, so Haydn could show the nobles that he has a powerful magician on his side. The event probably wasn't even his idea, and the emperor probably forced him to do this. Haydn continues speaking about our protagonist's many accomplishments, to think that Ian managed to take up a high-ranking position as soon as he arrived at the ivory tower. The prince can only imagine the looks on the snobby magician's faces. He admits that when they first met back in part one he wasn't very impressed, and wondered why Lord Marcus put so much effort into such a filthy child. He had no idea Ian would turn out to have such outstanding abilities. He admits that he was ordered to host this event by his father, however he is glad that he did. Ian doesn't know what to say. Dude really just insulted and complimented him in the span of a couple seconds. Haydn turns around and tells Ian there is someone he wants him to meet. He gestures to a shadowy figure to his right. When our protagonist sees this person his eyes grow wide and he becomes even more speechless. The person is Haydn's sister, Princess Harry, who Ian saw secretly practicing magic in part one. 
She introduces herself and says that she is well aware of our protagonist's reputation as he is quite famous in the Imperial Palace. The princess is shining so brightly like a star that Ian can barely look her in the eye without going blind. Harry states that unfortunately she doesn't have long to talk today, but she invites Ian to another event as she would like to hear all about his other accomplishments. Ian tries to tell her that he only has boring stories about monsters or magic however the princess insists. She finds magic interesting and would love to talk more about it. She tells him that she will send a letter with more information on it and for now he should just enjoy the rest of his night. She walks away with the prince. Ian watches her leave, noticing she looks completely different to when he saw her practicing magic earlier. Her clothes are more regal and her hair is covered in flowers. She's really beautiful. Prince Haydn seems nervous but that's to be expected, as he is fulfilling his responsibilities as the host, talking with guests, and making sure things are fine. Ian decides it's time for him to leave. There is nothing more for him to see or do here. He walks past the nobles who are all dancing and heads for the terrace. While exiting he sees a familiar face to his right. It's Oliver, the captain of the Second Knight Imperial Order. However, instead of wearing his usual armor he is in a fancy new suit. Ian compliments it saying he looks fantastic. Oliver is a little flustered at this compliment and says he had to wear it because Prince Hayden ordered him to. After this small talk passes there is a brief silence and things get awkward when the two realize they have nothing left to say to each other. Ian thinks that it perhaps wasn't the best idea to step out onto the terrace. Oliver diffuses the awkward silence by beginning to talk about Helene. He says he has heard rumors of how our protagonist beat her. Ian is surprised that there are so many rumors going around about him. He had heard that most things that happen in the ivory tower are supposed to be considered confidential. Oliver smiles. If a knight can't even get information what else is he supposed to do in this era? In this era the empire is currently led by a handful of high-ranking magicians at the top of the military hierarchy. Because the knights have less military power they have fallen from prestige and are now considered nothing more than accessories. Oliver was surprised when he heard that not only is Ian the youngest fourth-class high-ranking magician, but he also defeated Helene, the woman of fire. If he's honest he sometimes wonders if Ian is really that young. Ian just blushes at the compliments saying he is flattered. Oliver keeps them coming, saying it's undeniable that Ian is now trusted by Prince Hayden. He is usually reluctant to interact with other nobles yet he personally hosted this banquet just for our protagonist. Oliver gets down on one knee and prepares himself to ask Ian a very important question. Despite looking like he is about to ask him to marry him this is not the case. What Oliver wants to know is what side our protagonist is on. Most of the magicians at Ivory Tower are all supporting Prince Ragnar to be the next emperor, yet the knights all remain loyal to Prince Hayden. Oliver asks who Ian is going to support. Ian just awkwardly shrugs the question off, saying it's a meaningless question and it's hard for him to give a proper answer in a situation like this. However Oliver insists he answers, as a knight loyal to Prince Hayden he wants to know if our protagonist is an enemy or an ally. Ian knows Oliver is loyal to the prince. In his previous life he stood by Haydn's side until his last breath. Ian doesn't know how to answer the question at first. After thinking about how Ragnar betrayed him he speaks up, saying that he isn't choosing a side. However no matter what happens, he will never take Prince Ragnar's side. Oliver looks around nervously to see if anyone heard our protagonist bad-mouthing Ragnar. Ian assures him that he used magic so only the two of them heard what he just said. Although Ian didn't really pick a side, Oliver is still happy with his answer, it's good enough for him. He asks for one more favor, wanting Ian to spar with him in the future as he would like to get stronger. Such a question comes as a surprise to Ian. Oliver wants Ian to teach him how to fight against magicians when he is a magician himself. He jokes that Oliver must be pretty shameless to ask something like that. He refuses the request saying there is nothing he could gain from it. Upon hearing this Oliver removes a necklace from his neck. It's a necklace that the former empress gave him on the day he was appointed as a bodyguard for the prince. It is said that it's an enchanted necklace that helps to keep one's mind clear. Ian recognizes it as one of the imperial family's treasures that he wasn't able to secure in his previous life. The only thing he was able to find out about it was that it belonged to the late empress. He is surprised that Oliver is offering this to him since it was a personal gift. Oliver assures our protagonist that it is fine. The necklace was given to him so that he could support Prince Haydn in a better manner, since he is giving it away to become stronger to protect the prince he is sure the empress will understand. Seeing how far Oliver is willing to go Ian accepts the necklace, he will gladly spar with him. Suddenly, an echoing boom shatters the peace, and a curtain of flames blocks out the night sky. The two of them quickly turn around to see what that was and what is going on. 
By the looks of their faces it isn't good. The explosion occurs in the distance and some of the flames even strike the building of the event where they are. Oliver's immediate thought is that the prince could be in danger. He bursts back inside from the terrace with Ian close behind to assess the situation. It appears like everyone here is okay. Haydn has his arm out to protect his sister. Those explosions all happened at the Sun Palace and he wonders what they could have been. Oliver rushes over to the royals frantically, asking if either of them are injured anywhere but they are fine. More knights burst through the doors. It is revealed by one of the knights that multiple explosions were detected in the Imperial Palace, and they have activated something called the Emergency Communication Zone. All troops are currently looking for the cause of the explosion. Ian has heard of this Emergency Communication Zone before. All of the Templars' headquarters and the Imperial Army's barracks operate in a network connected by Ivory Tower which is available to troops so they can focus on protecting the palace. If the emergency communication zone is activated all of the Imperial troops are to gather around the Imperial Palace. Ian wonders if this was the goal of the explosion to begin with. He immediately activates his magic powers and summons a mana barrier to protect the royals. He turns to Princess Harry and asks her if she is able to support this barrier since he knows she can use magic. Princess Harry tries to pretend he doesn't know what he's talking about but Ian insists since it is an emergency. She admits that she learned a bit so she can probably do it. Ian exits the barrier leaving her to handle it. He approaches a nearby maid and asks them if someone by the name of Isabella has come here recently. The maid is shivering from fear at the whole situation. She gets her words out, revealing that someone named Isabella did in fact come here. This is just as our protagonist expected. He assumes people have come here to rescue the spy Cecilia. After blasting the palace, the plan was to disperse the troops and approach while the ivory tower surveillance was preoccupied. It doesn't matter what happens to Cecilia, but Ian knows she has valuable intel on him and he doesn't want this falling into the hands of the cold walkers. We see that Ian's theory was correct. While everyone is distracted with the explosion someone has approached Cecilia's cell. He removes his hood revealing he is a man named Daniel with long hair parted down the middle. He is disappointed in Cecilia and thought she was a competent magician. Cecilia, happy to see him, leaps up to the bars and asks him to let her out of here quickly. She hasn't snitched on any of the other spies. She tells Daniel that our protagonist just knew about everything from the start. About the existence of Coldwalker spies and even the affiliation list. He also knew about the mana imprint that all Coldwalker spies have on their back, which even she had no idea about herself. Daniel doesn't seem to be in a rush and asks if Cecilia has any more information for him. She doesn't. There isn't time to chit-chat right now and she wants to be let out. Daniel obliges her request and opens the door to her cell. It creaks as it is swung open. A smile radiates on Cecilia's face. It's unclear how long she has been down here but now she is free. Free to go into the afterlife I guess, because Daniel slashes at her with his weapon. She falls to the floor gripping her fatally wounded neck. While she was imprisoned in the ivory tower the other cold walkers had long discussions about what they were going to do with her. Since she is a precious third class magician for a moment they really considered rescuing her. Alas they ended up deciding against that and came to the final decision of just executing her. Daniel bids her good night and goodbye, weirdly happy about what he just did for some reason. A voice whispers behind him in a deathly voice, saying you too. Daniel quickly turns around and throws his dagger in the direction of the voice. It slams right into the wall next to our protagonist's face, even grazing his cheek on its way past. Daniel asks who he is. Ian notices Cecilia's body on the floor. Daniel has already taken care of her and thanks to that he has one less thing to worry about. He uses his ice magic to freeze Daniel in place. He met this man in his previous life. He slowly approaches. It was quite lucky of him to meet Daniel here, since he wanted to kill him with his own hands. Now he can finally avenge the tragedies of his classmates. Daniel has no idea what he is going on about. He's never killed any of our protagonist's classmates. Clearly he hasn't yet but Ian knows it is bound to happen in a decade. His ice grows and grows, moving up the spy's leg and wrapping itself around his entire body. Ian has made a decision since coming back to the past. A decision that he is going to put everything back where it was. He taps on the ice and it shatters into a thousand pieces. Daniel falls to the floor with a thud, frozen and presumably dead. Even defrosting him can't bring him back. Ian waves his hand on the back of his neck to reveal that he also has a mana imprint. He knows this will be sufficient to use as an excuse. Magicians come around the corner after hearing suspicious noises. They can't believe what they see. Ian stands and on the floor beneath him lays Cecilia and Daniel, both dead. The cold walker marking glows on their necks. The scene cuts to the emperor who slams his fist down onto his throne. 
Two people have already disappeared from within the palace. He is talking to Herbert the tower master. From the palace maids to the secretaries everyone is in danger. He wants to know what the ivory tower is doing while these scumbags are just walking around, demanding an answer. An audience watches awkwardly as the emperor scolds Herbert. He entrusted all of the authority in regards to the searching of spies to the ivory tower with the guarantee that they'd pull out all the rotten roots. The Emperor Terry states that he can no longer trust the ivory tower's guarantees. And from today onwards all authorities that were given to the magicians in regards to the search will be taken back. Bro isn't messing around. Still yelling. He tells the tower master to pass on all the information he has collected up to this moment to the imperial family and the knight's order. Everything he knows must be shared with the empire's army. Herbert understands that the magicians have failed in protecting everyone and he says he will do as the Emperor requests. The Emperor waves him away saying he can leave now, he has much to do. Terry has given himself a headache from all his shouting. Herbert shamefully walks out of the throne room while everyone stares at him and whispers about him. An assistant to the Emperor calls for our protagonist to step forward and pay his respects to his majesty. Out walks Ian, the esteemed guest of the North. The Emperor is happy they are meeting again. Ian lowers his head. They were able to maintain the security of the Empire thanks to Ian's outstanding competence this time around. If it weren't for him they would have lost so much intel to an unknown enemy that they are unable to catch. In the end the Empire and Imperial family would have been reduced to nothing but a laughing stock across the world if their sloppiness had been exposed. The Emperor will not overlook what our protagonist has done. He is grateful and would like to give Ian something personally for the contribution he has made towards the Empire's protection. A man approaches Ian with a case. He wonders what his reward could possibly be this time. It's a robe. It belonged to the Emperor's ancestor and the Imperial family's only magician named Mitchell. The magician that founded the Ivory Tower. This is the only relic he left behind. Ian is amazed at such a gift. His eyes sparkle while looking at it. Usually this is not an item that could be given to another that is not a part of the Imperial family. So the Emperor tells Ian that he is not giving it to him but just lending it. He wants the robe returned to the Imperial family when Ian eventually dies, or until the moment when he no longer wishes to possess it. Mitchell was the Empire's Imperial family's first and last magician. Mitchell was not only a hero that saved the Empire, but was also a tower master that was acknowledged for his competence in magic. This robe is an item that Ian has never seen before even in his past life. As it is a robe he doesn't have to take any of his clothes off and tries it on right away. He pulls it out the case and throws it onto his back. As nice as it is it is way too big. The Emperor giggles, it's too big now but give it a few years and it'll fit. While wearing the robe Ian notices that it has a spell technique engraved, he'll definitely try to make it fit now. Using his magic he waves his hands and the robe shrinks down to size. All of a sudden it is a perfect fit. The people in the room look over in amazement, wondering how something like that was even possible. The Emperor is equally amazed, he compliments our protagonist saying the blue looks astounding on him. Ian kneels to the floor with his brand new robe thanking the Emperor for his kindness. This robe will for sure help him get the phone number of some hotties. He exits the Imperial Castle and gets on with his day. While walking out he is approached by Princess Harry who wants to talk. Harry says it's nothing important but she just wanted to tell him something. She struggles to get her words out and is clearly hesitating. Ian takes over the conversation, apologizing to the Princess for being disrespectful back at the event and leaving her inside the Mana Barrier. He raises his finger up to his lips, saying that what she is worried about won't happen so she doesn't need to worry anymore. Princess Harry smiles, obviously she was worried he would tell everyone about her magic powers, it looks like he is going to keep her secret though. Ian begins to walk away when he is stopped by yet another person who wants to talk. However, the voice of this person sends shivers straight down his spine. It's the voice of Prince Ragnar, who congratulates Ian on the great job he did. Thanks to our protagonist, the Imperial family and the whole Empire's peace was protected. Ragnar realizes he hasn't introduced himself yet and gets ready to do so. Ian stands perfectly still, this is the moment he has been dreading. He is about to come face to face with the man who betrayed him in his past life, and the man who was once his closest friend. The prince introduces himself as the Great Emperor's fifth bloodline, Ragnar Greenriver. Just the sight of him brings back awful memories for Ian. The night he was poisoned by him and left to die. After years of loyal service and he was just discarded like trash. Here he is in the present, albeit much younger. Ian's face looks like it has just seen a ghost and he has yet to open his mouth to say anything. 
it's too early and it shouldn't be time for him to meet him yet. Ragnar congratulates Ian on becoming one of the Ivory Tower's high-ranking magicians. He sincerely offers his respect to Ian for his outstanding work he has done. From helping the Lord in the Mogrian territory, to catching the Empire's spies and protecting the Empire's security. As a member of the Imperial family Ragnar offers his thanks and invites Ian to lunch today. He asks if he is available. Ian's fists are clenched tightly. It seems like he is ready to get his revenge right now. However Princess Harry pushes in front of him, saying that she already has plans with our protagonist today so he isn't available. In that case Ragnar hopes he will be available tomorrow instead. Ian finally calms down and opens his mouth, saying he won't be available tomorrow either. Ragnar understands and thinks it's a pity. It looks like they will have to make arrangements for another time then. He is still happy to have met our protagonist though. He walks away with his guards leaving Ian with the princess. Ian just stares at him walking and there is a long pause for a while as he tries to take in what just happened. Princess Harry apologizes for interfering in their conversation. She was on autopilot and didn't even realize. Ian assures her it was fine. He takes one last look at Ragnar before he leaves his field of vision. He met him two years earlier than he did in his previous life. He's still nothing but a brat that needs to hide his ambitious heart. Ian makes a vow that he will make sure his plans are hidden from Ragnar. Until Ian has gathered an extremely powerful force and until Ragnar is no longer able to do anything, he will make sure he ultimately falls into devastation and meets his tragic end. The story jumps forward a whopping five years into the future. It is still set at the same place. In the Imperial Castle we see Prince Haydn who is reading a book, however he cannot understand a single thing. Can't they just write these things in an easier way to read? Who wrote the books in such a way that is so difficult to understand? Another man approaches with a whole other stack of books. He informs Haydn that the book he is reading was written by the first ever emperor himself. As heir to the throne he advises Haydn to become familiar with it. It contains the knowledge of how you should behave and rule as an emperor. Haydn looks at all the books around him, depressed that he has to read and study all of them. The books don't end there though and keep piling up. He needs to learn about the empire's history, philosophy, economy, politics, and etiquette. At least there's no algebra I guess. Haydn lets out a sigh, telling his teacher that there is no way he is going to read all these books today. He turns to the knight next to him, asking if this is the last day of training between Captain Oliver and Ian. The knight says that he is right. Haydn takes a moment to daydream about what they must be doing. He is stuck behind this desk while they are probably in the middle of an intense fight right now. He slams his hands on the table and stands up. He's not doing any reading and wants to go and see them fight. It's been a while. The scene cuts to the training ground of the Second Imperial Knight Order headquarters. We see the knight Oliver who has been spending all this time practicing his sparring with our protagonist. He readies his sword, as this is the last day he wants to give his best. A bunch of ice crystals shoot off in his direction, presumably from our protagonist. Oliver charges forward while bobbing and weaving between them. The ice crystals stab into the ground behind him. He comes to an abrupt stop when something begins to shoot out of the ground in front of him. Sweat drips down his cheek as he is in deep focus. More of these things shoot out of the ground but Oliver keeps moving trying his best to avoid them. He can see the shadowy outline of his opponent in the distance and he is getting closer. He leaps into the air and begins jumping between the objects that are sticking up like large rock spikes. He eventually clears them and lands on the floor. However things are not over yet and he knows there is more. Fire heads right in his direction, getting hotter by the second. It looks like someone just summoned the sun with first class delivery. He swings his weapon with force creating a gust of wind. This pushes the flames out of his way as they approach. As this is the last day of training, Oliver begins to hype himself up. This time around he is going to get the magician. We see our protagonist Ian who after five years has grown quite a bit. Oliver pounces forward. He has made it past all the magic obstacles and this is his opportunity. He thrusts his sword forward aiming straight for Ian's heart. However, Ian teleports behind him and taps him on the shoulder. He congratulates Oliver and says he did well. Oliver isn't as proud of himself though, he didn't even manage to land a scratch after all of that. We get a better look at Ian. Now around 17 years old his hair is much longer and he is still wearing the robe that was gifted to him by the Emperor. He jokes with Oliver, it's good that he didn't land a scratch as he was aiming for the heart. If his attack landed Ian would have died for sure. The two shake hands as they finish their training that has lasted years. Oliver thanks our protagonist who says it was no problem. This training was all for the necklace he gave him. Oliver admits that this training was worth it, he received a lot more value than that of the necklace, and he has indeed improved a lot in comparison to five years ago. 
Oliver asks Ian how much he has improved in this time. Surely he must be a higher class magician by now. Ian says he is not as strong as he had hoped. After five years he has gone from a fourth class master to a fifth class master. It's quicker than his previous life as it took him until he was 26 back then. However, he was hoping to at least have reached sixth class by now. Unfortunately he was unable to accelerate the growth of his physical body and mana heart so it seems like fifth class is his limit for now. He's just waiting for the day when his body is completely grown. The two of them are approached by Haydn who congratulates them on their last day of sparring training. He proposes that they all go and eat breakfast together to celebrate. He's going to have the greatest breakfast prepared to celebrate the massive improvement of his right hand and left hand men. Ian politely refuses. He has to perform his high-ranking magician duties after he finishes his lessons in the ivory tower and has to go and see the tower master right now. Haydn is disappointed at this but understands. They will have to have a meal together another time instead, as soon as possible. Ian gets ready to leave. He raises his right hand to his chest and a gust of wind circles around him. He shoots up into the air like a rocket ship. Looking down on the others they all look like ants. He has definitely gotten stronger these past five years. He dashes away through the air like some kind of bird. Haydn looks up and is a little jealous. The robe our protagonist was gifted from the emperor had a flying spell engraved into it, which is why he could do that. Oliver lowers his head towards the prince, asking what his orders are for today. From the small amount of the battle that Prince Haydn saw it looked like Oliver was on equal ground with Ian. He asks if Oliver is now able to fight with magicians. Oliver can only say two things. First, he thinks that it is impossible for him to land a scratch on our protagonist. The gap between the two of them is only continuing to grow. However, when it comes to any other magician, Oliver thinks that he would definitely be able to take them down. Prince Haydn seems happy with this information, as if he knows that they will need to fight magicians sometime in the future. Ian flies all the way over to the ivory tower to meet with the tower master Herbert. Herbert is happy to see him. The feeling is rather strange, as it seems like it was just yesterday when Herbert heard about a special youngster who had appeared in the north. Now Ian has already become a fine young man. He jokes saying that must mean he has aged quite a bit himself. Ian smiles and lowers his head, assuring the old man that he's still got a few more decades in him. The tower master looks at Ian's reports and thinks they are incredible, they are filled with praises. Ian is truly a blessing to the Empire and Ivory Tower, even the young ones look up to him. This is the kind of magician everyone strives to become. Ian is flattered by his comments. Herbert tells him he won't be flattered for long. As our protagonist already knows, this is his last day. If he was a normal student of the academy he would have been placed in another estate as soon as the graduation ceremony was over. But his case is a bit different. Although it is Ian's last day he has to spend it talking to an old man like Herbert, what a shame. Ian assures him that it is not a shame and is instead an honor. Herbert is thankful for his kindness, even if those were empty words. He reaches over to his side and removes something from a box. He congratulates Ian for carrying out his duties and becoming a full-fledged magician, handing him some kind of metal rectangle with a cross on it. Using this Ian may now have soldiers and local residents in any area that he pleases. Herbert is sure he will make good use of it. Ian looks up, wanting to know if there are any places that need high-class magicians. There are more than he can imagine though. They have lost a lot of magicians. With Helene gone they are more desperate than they have ever been. Herbert doesn't want to pressure our protagonist but he could really use his help. There is lots for him to do. He is practically the most skilled magician of the ivory tower so he will have much responsibility. But since this is his first time Herbert says he will let our protagonist choose. He waves his hand and three blue texts appear in front of him each with a different estate on. The first is Lord Meyer Estate, which contains the largest port city in the empire. Next is the Benson Estate, the estate that produces the largest amount of iron. And Ian knows the final place all too well. It's the Pyrrhic Estate, and it was the estate he was sent to in his previous life. The mage who was originally sent there accidentally died so Ian was sent there to replace him. He stares at the state. As it is from his previous life it is the one that piques his interest the most. Herbert informs him that out of the three, that is the estate that is the most desperate for help. Although they were sent three full classes of magicians and the Imperial Army it still wasn't enough. The monsters from the savannah seem as if they are raging. Herbert slides Ian a piece of paper. The details are all written on it so he should read through it thoroughly. The Tower Master would like to hear his decision by the end of the day. As if he changes his mind he will have to look for someone else. Ian doesn't need the day to decide and immediately says he will go to the Pyrrhic estate to help. He returns to his mansion where he still lives, that was gifted to him many years ago. 
Inside is the alchemist Douglas who has now also grown into a young man. He is shocked that Ian's first dispatch is to the Pyrrhic estate. That place is known for having all sorts of monsters. Ian gives him a stern look from across the table, as if he doesn't want him to talk about how dangerous it is. That is because his mother Vanessa is sitting at the table with them and she begins to get worried about Ian leaving. Ian assures her that it isn't that dangerous, it's just a temporary dispatch and he will be back in a few months. Vanessa's worries are put somewhat to rest. However, she is still upset about her son leaving next week, the large mansion is going to feel so empty without him. Ian continues to comfort his mother, saying he will try his best to finish quickly and return. Douglas speaks up again, calling our protagonist boss. Bro is really still calling him boss after all these years. He tells Ian to come by the laboratory before he leaves as he has made some useful items that could come in handy during battle. Douglas's father Ledio is also at the table. He tells his son that now he is grown up he should stop calling Ian boss. Douglas doesn't see a problem with it but looking around he sees that everyone else finds it awkward. He decides to come up with another nickname and asks everyone at the table if he should call him brother instead. Everyone's faces become dumbfounded. He went from calling him boss to calling him brother. Douglas doubles down, calling out to brother Ian with a smile on his face. Ian can't believe this guy is really the famous alchemist that created the poison that killed him in his previous life. Vanessa joins in on the banter, saying Ian is super lucky to have a cute little brother like Douglas. And now she also has another son. Ledio gets flustered at this statement, since for Douglas to be her son it must mean that the two of them are in a relationship. This whole situation is just crazy. Ledio slaps his son at the dinner table, telling him he should just address Ian properly like a normal person. The two get into a little argument and playfully shove each other. Vanessa looks over and giggles at the scene. Ian is happy to see his mother so happy and can't help but smile at the sight of it. He looks around the table at everyone realizing he has got himself a nice little family here, and everyone seems to be having a good time, which is a lot different to his previous life where the parents both ended up dead and Douglas ended up bitter. It's a wholesome moment. Ian ends the arguing by telling Douglas he can call him anything else but brother. The next week goes by pretty quickly, and it is now almost time for Ian to leave. He is talking to Ledio who asks when he is going. Ian says he just has to drop by the ivory tower first and bid farewell to the tower master then he will head for the Pyrrhic estate. He begins explaining to Ledio how to work the mansion's security systems. However, Ledio just laughs and says he already explained them yesterday so there is no need. There is no need for our protagonist to worry and Ledio will protect the mansion and Vanessa with his life should anything happen. Douglas rushes over to the two of them screaming brother. When they look at him with stern expressions he quickly changes back to using the nickname boss. Douglas hands Ian a red potion known as a harp elixir. It's one that his father makes however this one Douglas made all by himself. He leans over to whisper into Ian's ear that this one is probably way better than any his father makes. Ian thanks him for the gift and looks at him, finding it hard to believe how much he has grown. There are three years left until Douglas graduates from the Imperial Alchemy Academy, yet he has been ensured the position of an Imperial Alchemist through his own talent. Ian holds the elixir in his hand, confident that if Douglas made it then it must have great effects. Right before he leaves his mother rushes out with a large box filled with food. She hands it over to her son for him to eat, she made a lot. In the first section is food he has to eat today, and the rest is dried food which can be stored for a long time. She even made him his favorite bean pie that he loves so much. There's really nothing better than your mother's cooking. Vanessa leans in to hug her son goodbye, telling him to make sure he stays safe and to make sure he eats three meals a day. Ian is happy and grateful to still have his mother around. She died from illness in his previous life yet in this one he has managed to keep her alive. After they hug he tells her not to worry about him and that he will be back before she knows it. He hops into the carriage and it begins riding off to Pyrrhic Estate. Everyone stands and watches as our protagonist leaves for the next few months. Ian looks back at them hoping they will all be okay while he is gone. Especially his mother who he worries about a lot. He trusts that she will be safe here even if he isn't around. The mansion is protected by the royal family in a city with high security. Ian also has security installed in his mansion that can only be activated by his mother, Ledio or Douglas. It is known as the Mana Trap. That level of security will be able to eliminate most threats. It's been 25 years since our protagonist was last at the Pyrrhic estate in his previous life, yet here he embarks on a journey to return again. We see rocky cliffs and a battle going on down below. Wooden watchtowers are dotted around the battlefield. There are green goblins and orcs that are charging forward and they are being held back by knights. One in particular has red hair and a scar on his cheek. 
he orders his men to bring him the heads of the enemies. They shouldn't even think of dying before they are successful. The knights do as he says, running forward with their swords in hand ready to slay some monsters. There's too many though and someone arrives on a horse, informing the redhead that the rearguard has been attacked by orcs who have climbed over the mountain. This is not good news and the redhead knows it. Those orcs were supposed to be at the front line yet somehow they managed to reach the rearguard. He begins making orders to his men. Sections 2 and 3 should stay here with the magicians to protect the front gate. Section 1 should follow him over to the rear. He climbs atop his horse and gestures forward with his sword, it's time to kill some orcs. The horses gallop away, their hooves pound on the floor like a heartbeat thumping. Orcs aren't intelligent creatures but they move systematically. Experienced knights would be able to defeat the orcs but they can be very threatening in the rearguard which is fully composed of inexperienced volunteers. The redhead charges forward as fast as he can with his men, hoping to reach the rearguard in time before it falls to the villainous orcs. It's going to be tough and they have probably already lost countless men to the monsters. All of a sudden snow begins to fall from the sky which comes as a shock to everyone on the battlefield. There's no way it could snow in the east. Their eyes aren't deceiving them though and the scene is chilly. With frost hazing their vision they keep moving. Upon reaching the rear guard they see towering shards of ice sticking out of the ground and even going past the tree line. The soldiers get a closer look at this scene. Each of the icicles is home to its very own orc, frozen in their permanent graves. The redhead can only sit atop his horse with his mouth hanging open. How on earth did something like this happen? On the tallest peak there is a shadowy silhouette, standing and looking down at them. In an instance the figure vanishes, jumping down from the peak and striking the floor. It strolls forward slowly, stepping over all the fallen orcs and goblins that are scattered. The soldiers are understandably petrified at the sight of this person. They raise their sharpened weapons and joust them in his direction, demanding that he reveals himself. Of course it is our protagonist, no other person possesses power like this. He removes his hood and introduces himself. He's Ian Page, a high-ranking magician dispatched from the Ivory Tower. The redhead's nerves calm. For a second he thought he would have to fight this powerful person. He laughs. He never expected our protagonist to be so young. He's heard all about his accomplishments, especially when he eliminated the Goblin Brigade to save the Lord back in Part 1. Extending his hand, he is truly honored to meet Ian at last. The feeling is mutual, and Ian is also honored to meet the redhead, the greatest warrior of the East, whose name is Lord Kalyan. Kellyon knows the journey all the way here must have been tough. However, he asks if Ian can spare a few moments, there is a lot they must discuss. They head back to base. Large stone walls and multiple watch towers offer protection from any potential threats. Such a large number of orcs was never expected and it overwhelmed the soldiers. Kellyon expected something along the lines of this, but not to this magnitude. The orcs seem really intent on winning these days. Something must be going on in the Great Plains otherwise this wouldn't have happened. Kellyon explains that he specifically requested two things from the Imperial family and Ivory Tower to aid them in their battle. The first was a supply of troops and equipment needed in order to fight. The second was to dispatch a high-ranking magician, someone who would be able to resolve the current situation, which is Ian. His ability to obliterate the orcs with an ice wall was impressive. It also blocked off the canyon so everyone should be safe for a while. But that's only a temporary solution. Soon the monsters from the Great Plains will return and the war will continue. Since they have been fighting here for a few years, Kalyan explains that the troops are all exhausted and the rations are running low. If they were to receive supplies and reinforcements they would be able to continue fighting. Unfortunately it seems like the Empire is still considering their request for that. In any case, the second request has been granted and a high rank magician has arrived. Kellyon wants the two of them to work together and come up with some feasible plans for the upcoming fight. Ian understands, the ice wall will secure them for another 10 days. As long as they keep watch for monsters coming in the mountain paths they should be safe for the moment. He volunteers to go to the Great Plains alone within the next 10 days, with the goal of finding the cause of this situation and if possible, a way to resolve it. Kellyon is happy to hear he is so confident, however they have been dispatching numerous troops to the Great Plains for the last several months and have been unable to find a cause. The only thing they have discovered is that there are various types of monsters out there who all share the same goal. 
Instead of attacking each other they have teamed up, and their bear fangs are only used against humans. It's not just the Green River Empire that is under attack either. These monsters are simultaneously invading the Coldwood Empire in the north, and the Principality of Roe in the west. The paths leading to the other regions are narrow so they won't be as heavily affected by the monsters. However, there is a huge path known as the Grand Snake Canyon, and the monsters from this canyon are concentrating their attacks on the Pyrrhic Estate. The strange thing is the monsters aren't attacking the south of the Great Plains where the native tribes live. It's as if the south has something that's preventing the monsters from approaching them. There are suspicions that the south is responsible for whatever is causing the monsters to act strangely in the Great Plains. However, no soldiers have been able to go there to investigate as there are monsters blocking the canyon. Ian rubs his chin at all of this information. All of this is new to him and in his previous life there was no unexpected change in the Great Plains. Monster attacks that came from the Great Plains were pretty common but it was never to the extent of this. From the looks of things it seems like the best thing to do would be to go and visit the southern native tribes first. Kalyan agrees, there is a shaman king there who may know something about the unexpected changes that have been happening. The plan is set in place and the knight looks down on the castle after a long day. Ian stares right back at it, thinking about the Great Plains and what it was like in his previous life. There should still be an item there that he is interested in. The Staff of the Great Plains, this artifact was given to the Shaman King who leads the natives. Ian really liked this staff as staffs made from birch wood are pretty rare. In his previous life when the monsters in the plains got out of hand, the Green River Empire, the Coldwood Empire, and the Principality of Ro all joined forces to subjugate the monsters of the Great Plains. Most of the monsters were exterminated and the rich resources of the Great Plains were shared among the three of them. And in that process the Shaman King vanished and his natives became servants. All of this craziness that is happening now never happened. It seems that since Ian has come back to the past differences have been occurring in the timeline. The unexpected changes in the Great Plains is one of these things, and Ian fears it might have something to do with him. The next day he prepares to leave, in ten days the ice will melt and he aims to find the cause and solution for this situation by then. If he isn't back by ten days then it will probably mean something went wrong. However, Lord Kalyan is confident he will return and wishes him Godspeed. The plains are dry and desolate, with sounds of the wind blowing being the only friend to keep our protagonist company. He looks out into the distance, thinking that it is strangely quiet here. Compared to the hordes of monsters in the north, he hasn't come across a single one as he's come through the south. He wonders if this place truly is the cause of all the problems. He steps forward through the dry sand and dirt, until he comes across a group of natives, shirtless, with red tattoos and long spears. They immediately confront Ian, demanding to know why he is here and who he is. Ian just remains calm and raises his hands in the air in a non-threatening manner. He's not an enemy, he is a magician of the Green River Empire. The men want to know how he is able to speak their language. However, there is no time to explain. Ian is just here to meet with the Shaman King. Upon hearing this the men are speechless, did you really just say what they think he said? The Shaman King is the native's version of the Tower Master. The natives are all born with both a mana heart and mana brain. However, the way they control mana is more basic so they are labeled as shamans instead of magicians. The Shaman King is the leader of these people, the greatest in their ranks. Seeing the men aren't moving Ian continues explaining his arrival. He's come to discuss the situation regarding the monsters in the south. The Shaman King must already be aware of what's happening so he just wants to speak with him. The men violently jab their spears towards our protagonist. How dare a dog of the empire act so arrogantly? There's no way the Shaman King would meet with someone like you. They threaten Ian, telling him to return back to the empire. One more word from his mouth and they are going to sacrifice him to the spirits of the Great Plains. Getting impatient Ian narrows his eyes. Does he really look like someone who is going to leave just because they were told to? One of the men dash forward with their spear in hand, ready to follow through with their threats. Ian just uses his magic abilities to create a sword from ice. Using this sword he slashes at the tip of the spear, slicing it off. It falls to the floor and the man is left holding his stubby stick that is no longer capable of hurting anyone. With his ice sword raised, now Ian begins to make the threats, demanding they take him to the king or it will be their heads next. As he says this someone calls out and steps forth. The voice asks why a person of the empire is here. Ian recognizes him instantly. He has a long braided beard and a bald head. The birch wood staff sits in his hand and is taller than him. He is the shaman king. Ian doesn't waste time and begins his questioning right away. 
The monsters of the Great Plains are now invading other empires, yet not a single monster can be found in the south. He was hoping the king might know the reason why the monsters are only targeting the north. Monsters invading borders happens quite frequently, and the shaman king says he has no idea why this is happening. However, Ian knows he is lying. His eyes are bright blue and he is using interrogation magic, informing the king that his lies won't work on him. He asks to know the truth about what is going on. The natives aren't happy with our protagonist's arrogance. They get ready to attack again until the king stops them by raising his hand. He had heard that the magicians of the empire knew magic that could detect lies, but it's truly astounding to witness it in person. Ian keeps his focus on the king, paying attention to all his movements and his heart rate to detect his honesty. Knowing it is pointless to lie the shaman king begins telling the truth. Several years ago there was a prophecy that the once beautiful great plains will turn into a sea of flames and a golden light will dye the land red. The clans that have lived on this lands for thousands of years will then be dispersed and made into servants. Ian listens intently to this prophecy, and the king continues. The natives are aware that they are powerless, and are fully aware that their clans would be destroyed if a war occurs. But they can't just do nothing and pray that the prophecy doesn't come true. One day, a lady found them. She imbued her magic into the shaman king's staff, sharing her power with them and then vanishing. The king taps the staff on the ground twice as if summoning something. Suddenly, a backdrop of flames buries the plains and traps Ian inside. The shaman king reveals that the woman that visited them also told them one last thing. If a foreigner ever comes here, they should not be allowed to leave alive. The powers of the staff have revived a bunch of undead and they begin to climb out of the ground. They line up behind the king and await their orders. With the flames still circling the surrounding area, the king apologizes to Ian, but he is going to die here. It's all a little clearer to Ian now. The staff must be imbued with black magic. He thought black magic had ceased to exist 300 years ago after it was forbidden. To think that this timeline could have strayed so far off course. The natives have severely underestimated him. He doesn't intend on dying without a fight. Even if he has to pry it out of his hands, he will be taking the staff from the king. The king is unthreatened with all the undead here to back him up. He taunts our protagonist, saying he can try but will ultimately fail. Ian prepares his magic, blue light engulfs his body and eclipses the flames. The Shaman King is for sure going to regret his actions. The scene cuts back to the Pyrrhic estate and the ice has almost melted at the canyon. Ten days have passed since our protagonist left for the Great Plains and he still hasn't returned. The block of ice is about to turn into water and the canyon will soon open up. Lord Kalyan turns to one of his men. It's time for them to prepare for battle. All the troops and catapults should be readied. The man lowers his head and will do as his leader commands. He is nervous though and a drip of sweat glides down his cheek. Kellyon slams his sword in the ground and closes his eyes, giving himself a motivational speech. He can stop the orcs. He will protect the land of his people. And in order to do this he needs to become the strongest shield of the empire. Lord Kellyon looks out into the canyon as the ice fades away. The soldiers behind him set up the catapults for immediate use. However, what they see emerging from the canyon is our protagonist. He pushes through the mist and fog whilst gripping his chest tightly. The redhead's eyes light up and he calls out to Ian, glad he is alive and back. Ian is in bad shape though and is carrying the staff imbued with dark magic. He stumbles forward and can only say one thing before passing out, warning the men to never touch the staff. He crashes to the ground and his vision collapses into darkness. His eyes open some time in the future, sunlight beams through a circular window and he gets a hold of his surroundings. He recognizes this place as Yongjusyong. A bandage is wrapped around his chest and he lays in a large bed. Leaning up he holds his pounding head. The first thing that crosses his mind is the staff and what happened to it. Lord Kalyan bursts into the room wearing a large fur robe. He is happy to see that our protagonist is finally awake. He has been unconscious for three whole days. They begin to approach asking how Ian is feeling. The doctor said he shouldn't be moving around yet however Ian sits up wanting to know where the staff he came with is. Lord Kalyan informs him that some magicians put it inside of a box. It is said to be a storage box made with a similar principle to a mana prison. Ian approaches this box that glows blue. He's happy to hear they have handled it well and he is about to take it out again. Kalyan and the man beside him appear worried at Ian's condition. The doctor told them that his mana and energy were all depleted and if he had arrived a second later his life would have been in danger. Kalyan knows it is impolite to bother someone who is still recovering. 
but he has to know what exactly put Ian in such danger. Ian holds the staff in his hands, explaining that this staff is the cause of the abnormal change in the planes. It is imbued with black magic spells and the Shaman King used this black magic alongside illusionary magic to control monsters. This information shocks Kalyan. He was under the impression that black magic perished 300 years ago. Despite retrieving the staff Ian was unable to discover who exactly the perpetrator behind all this is. They have no idea who originally imbued the staff. After the Shaman King died all of the black magic and illusionary magic was dispelled. The Great Plains monsters then started to attack our protagonist, the new owner of the staff. Ian assumes it's probably because a curse was placed on them to destroy the evidence. Thanks to that it was extremely difficult for him to come back with the staff in hand. Kalyan is curious as to why Ian didn't just destroy or throw the staff away then. Ian smiles while looking at the staff. He raises his hand and begins using magic on it. The reason he didn't leave it behind is because he likes it. Bro really risked his entire life just because he liked the look of a glorified stick. With the waving of his hand Ian is able to erase all of the dark magic techniques that the staff was imbued with. Suddenly he gets a sharp pain in his chest which causes him to drop the staff to the floor. He grips his heart and grits his teeth. His world spins and his vision fades. The redhead rushes over to help. Something is happening to Ian's mana heart. Eventually the pain subsides. However, looking down his chest is covered in blood and some of it has even began to pour out of his mouth. Kellyan yells out for the doctor thinking that there is some kind of emergency happening. However, Ian is okay and that was just something called shedding. It's something that happens when one's mana heart that hasn't grown enough breaks through to a new class. It looks painful but it's nothing to worry about. This must mean that Ian has ranked up, going from a 5th class to a 6th class master. He feels an enormous amount of mana that feels different from what he had previously. His mouth upturns into a subtle smile. Finally it has happened. Kalyan is relieved, but still thinks it's best to let the doctor take a look just in case. He also has something that he needs to give to our protagonist. Three days after Ian left for the Great Plains he was sent a letter from the Ivory Tower. They were told to hand it over to him once the mission was over but since Ian has only just regained consciousness they were only able to give it him now. Ian picks up the letter, which is in the form of a blue magic orb, wondering what it could be. That's not all though and there is one more thing Kalyan has to give him. It's a letter that came directly from the Emperor via a horseman. Kalyan was given strict instructions to hand this over personally. The Emperor didn't send this message through the ivory tower, but used a horseman and a paper letter instead to use a method that could be late in its delivery, with a high possibility that it might not even arrive at all is unusual. Ian thinks it could contain information that the Emperor doesn't want the Ivory Tower discovering. He decides to read the Ivory Tower's message first, picking up the blue orb and glancing at a text that appears. It states, Hear this high rank magician Ian Page. As the contents of this letter might affect your current mission, we have asked for it to be given to you after it has ended. It was an inevitable decision that has been made. I hope you understand our situation. There has been a slight commotion within your household and an unknown suspicious person invaded your mansion. But we were able to keep your family and assets safe by mobilizing the Imperial troops. Reading this letter causes Ian to begin worrying about his mother, wondering who could possibly be invading his mansion. He continues reading. Currently, the Imperial family and Ivory Tower are providing protection to ensure the safety of Ian's family. This letter has just been sent to inform him that there is no reason to be worried. The letter ends here and Ian isn't happy about it. Why would the ivory tower send him such a worrying letter and then expect him not to get worried? The tower master Herbert must be up to something. Before jumping to conclusions Ian decides to read the paper letter from the emperor. It states, To my dear magician Ian Page, If this letter reaches you safely, then it means that both me and my son aren't out of luck yet. We give thanks to the goddess of luck and I'd like to make a request of you. The treaty that will be made by the three countries in regards to the subjugation of monsters in the eastern part of the Great Plains will take place in the free city named Demidera. The Crown Prince Haydn, the Fifth Prince Ragnar, the Ivory Tower Master Herbert, and the Empire's Great General Duncan have all been selected to be a part of the delegation. By the time you're reading this the delegation should have started their march towards Demidera. In the delegation this time, there isn't anyone who is on the Crown Prince's side. Therefore I'm making a request to you Ian Page, a friend of the Crown Prince. Please head towards Demidera and support the Crown Prince. I will invite your precious family into the Imperial Palace and promise to grant them the highest possible protection possible. 
Ian finishes reading the letter from the Emperor. He wasn't expecting the treaty between the empires to be taking place already. In his previous life it wasn't supposed to happen for another three years. The Demiura Treaty was the first stage where Prince Ragnar started to fight for the throne succession. And it's also the start of the fall of Prince Haydn. Ragnar displays exceptional diplomacy during this treaty, and even manages to get the Green River Empire an advantageous position. Because of this the nobles and commoners recognize Ragnar's abilities. It's also the crucial part in history where the public notices just how incompetent Prince Haydn is when it comes to political matters. While thinking about both the letters he has received Ian can tell something is wrong. Everything is happening so differently than it did in his previous life. The change in the Great Plains that caused the monsters to group together and attack. The shaman king that received black magic spells from an unknown woman. And the three countries treaty that's happening three years too early. Ian can't help but thinking that this is all related to the Tower Master somehow. He also thinks that the suspicious person Herbert said invaded his mansion could just be a distraction. It's possible that the Ivory Tower have figured out his secret. Usually he would be more worried about a possibility like this, however something no one expected has occurred. Ian's mana heart has ranked up, and he now has access to 6th class magic that can only be used by a 6th class magician. Magic that even the Tower Master couldn't have expected. Magic that's not recorded anywhere in the world. He turns to Kalyan who is still in the room. Bro really stood there in the corner while he read through two letters. He asks the redhead if he can do him a favor with a smile on his face, as if he has a plan. The scene cuts to Demidra, the city where the Three Countries Treaty is taking place. Prince Haydn stands with his arms crossed. He is frustrated and wants to ask Ian to come. The captain of the knights Oliver asks the prince to refrain from acting so brazen. He is here to represent the empire in this meeting. Prince Haydn knows this but still has an uneasy feeling. He looks over to his brother Ragnar. Everyone from their empire, including the tower master, are all supporting him. Haydn doesn't like where this is going and would prefer if our protagonist was by his side in a time like this. Behind Ragnar is Herbert the tower master who appears rather happy about the situation. He's planned for this day for a long time. The letter he sent Ian was a trick, and he knows our protagonist is probably on his way back to his mansion now to check on his family. With him out of the way Ragnar will be able to shine in this negotiation and will no doubt earn the public's favor. Suddenly a crowd begins to form, they point up to the sky noticing something flying towards them. They think it is a bird. Haydn looks up too, but he knows better than to assume it's a bird. It's Ian who has arrived with his flying robe. He lands on the ground and apologizes to Prince Haydn for being late. Prince Ragnar looks over in shock, and so does Herbert. They can't believe Ian chose to come here and support Prince Haydn, instead of going home and checking on his family. Meanwhile, at the Emperor's Imperial Palace, Douglas is incredibly bored. Everyone is being kept inside this room for their safety and he can't leave to go to the academy nor meet friends. His father Letio tells him to just bear with it for a little longer. They should just be thankful they are being allowed to stay at the Imperial Palace at a time like this. It was a relief that the Imperial Knights were able to catch the intruder at the mansion, and they all were unharmed. Ian's mother Vanessa is here too, and Letio assures everyone that they are fine. After all the Emperor's palace is the safest place on earth. He knows the ivory tower sent a letter to Ian and he suspects he will arrive anytime now and walk through the door. As soon as he says this he hears someone approaching, and the doors swing open with force. It's Ian who has arrived to see his family. Somehow he is currently in two places at once. He knows everyone must have been worried but now they can relax. He is here to protect all of them. We get a flashback to the day before all of this, back at the Pyrrhic estate with Lord Kalyan, when our protagonist approached him asking for a favor. Since Ian saved both Kalyan and his territory he has happy to do any favor that Ian wants. In that case, Ian asks the Lord to protect him for the time being. He is about to use magic that will plunge him into a trance-like state. In the scenario where something happens, he asks the Lord to dispatch magicians to inject mana into his brain. This will wake him back up. He is going to make use of his new powers as a 6th class magician. No one has ever reached the 6th class before, so there are extremely few records of it. In his previous life Ian had to make his own spells, or search for spells bit by bit using unknown ancient documents. He waves his hand out in front of him and a circle appears that shines blue. Out of this circle appears two versions of Ian, and his original body collapses into Lord Kalyan's arms. This spell is known as Puppet Play magic only usable by magicians who are 6th class and above. The original body becomes a puppeteer and falls into a trance, while two puppet bodies are created that can move freely and use rather powerful 5th class magic. 
Lord Kalyan is holding onto our protagonist's body, unable to believe what his eyes are seeing. Two other versions of Ian are standing right in front of him. They turn and look in his direction, saying that they trust that he will take care of their original body. Meanwhile at Demidera, Prince Haydn is over the moon that Ian actually came here for him. He guesses their hearts must have been aligned since he wished for such a thing. With his long robe and gray hair, Herbert soon approaches the two of them. He heard about Ian's mission to the plains and that it was so tough he fainted. He really is a treasure to the Empire. Herbert wasn't expecting to see him here though, and thought he sent a letter telling him to go back to the ivory tower to see his family and rest. Ian did receive this letter after completing his mission. However he explains that he also received an imperial order to join the delegation and assist Prince Haydn immediately. He pulls it out and shows it to the tower master, who isn't happy with what he's seeing, though he doesn't show it on the surface. He closes the imperial order explaining that it is impossible for Ian to join in when it is already underway. Haydn yells out in disbelief, there's no way he is disobeying his father, the emperor's, orders. However, this is a matter concerning the trust between the three countries. The number of people and bodyguards involved has already been set and they can't be changed. These numbers were negotiated previously, and for Green River Empire to just add a high-ranking magician could cause problems. Though the emperor ordered it, Herbert thinks he would understand why it can't be allowed. Ian knows the tower master isn't wrong. Although they are not at war now there is a history of conflicts between the countries. It took a lot of negotiating and trust to even get each country's nobles to be gathered here today. There's a total of three high-ranking magicians who are here currently, including the Tower Master. If one more were to be added, especially one as strong as Ian, the treaty would go haywire. Ian understands what the Tower Master is concerned about and it is a reasonable explanation. If he truly understands, Herbert says he should go back now. The fact that he is even here in this city could cause problems. While he feels sorry that Ian took the trouble to travel all the way over here, there is nothing that can be done. Before he walks away Ian gets an idea. Surely if one of the high-ranking magicians were to give up their spot in the delegation, he would be able to take their place. Sweat drips from Herbert's cheek. He knows that this could be possible but attempts to come up with some kind of excuse on the spot. Before he can do this one of the high-ranking magicians named Ronan speaks up, giving up his place to our protagonist. As a citizen of the Empire he has no desire to disobey Imperial orders, and he knows by handing his spot to Ian it would assist both in the treaty and in the completion of the Emperor's orders. Ronan turns to Prince Haydn, requesting his highness for permission to make this change. Of course Haydn agrees and is deeply impressed by Ronan's sincerity and loyalty to the Empire. Ronan will receive safe travel back to the Ivory Tower. He turns to Ian, entrusting his position in the delegation to him and asking that he fulfills this mission without fault. Ian is grateful and can only thank his senior while grinning widely. He remembers the high-ranking magician Ronan from his previous life. He was one of the few decent magicians. Though he was extremely uncompromising in all matters, he made his own choices and his actions were not blindly based on loyalty to the Ivory Tower and Herbert. His only concern was about his own magic abilities, and Ian was easily able to win him over to his side just by teaching him a few rare magic spells. Ronan lowers his head preparing to leave. A high-ranking magician who isn't a part of the delegation could cause problems. It's what the Tower Master said after all. Herbert can only awkwardly laugh with nothing more to say. He can't believe it. He thought Ian was just some kid that didn't know anything, but it seems that he's already begun influencing the members of the Ivory Tower. Herbert's brow furrows. He won't allow for a kid like Ian to spoil his plans. His plans to take over the Green River Empire and turn it into Ivory Tower's empire. Someone also watching our protagonist closely is Prince Ragnar. He looks over with a neutral expression. Purple gemstones sit around his neck and it is unclear whether he is angry or intrigued. Damidra is a neutral and free city that doesn't affiliate itself with any other country. Due to this it acts as a diplomacy bridge between the three countries, the Green River Empire, Coldwood Empire, and the Principality of Roe. It has been a symbol of freedom and neutrality for more than a hundred years. The current mayor is a man named Ingolo, who wears a monocle along with white attire. He gestures towards a large mansion. Each country gets their own individual VIP mansions. This is the one that will be used by Green River, and not far from it is a separate mansion where Prince Haydn will be staying. It's a private mansion that has been provided to the most important guests. Haydn is impressed. He turns to the Tower Master asking if there is anything else scheduled for today. There isn't and nothing is scheduled until the day of the treaty discussion. Due to this Haydn tells his men that they can all go and rest now. He asks Ian to follow him somewhere private so they can talk. Prince Ragnar and Herbert watch them walk away. 
and the two of them decide that they should also have a private talk about things. Ragnar walks inside a room and Herbert is close behind him. Ragnar doesn't blame the Tower Master for Ian showing up as they tried their best to keep him away. However, he admits that he is bothered by Ian and Haydn's close relationship. Herbert understands where he is coming from, but Ragnar should not be concerned. Ian might be capable in terms of magic but this upcoming meeting requires political skill. He probably won't even be able to speak. It's an important diplomatic meeting between the countries, and there is no good ideas a mere magician like him could offer. Typically high-ranking magicians are nothing but accessories at these discussions. Herbert assures Ragnar that he will be the focus of the public's attention, and that he won't be overshadowed by our protagonist. Sighing and closing his eyes, Ragnar knows there is nothing he can do about the situation. He's tried countless times to get Ian Page to be on his side, but Ian has always pushed him away and stood by Prince Haydn. Ragnar is certain that our protagonist is going to cause big problems for them in the future, and he trusts that Herbert will deal with him as quick as possible. Herbert lowers his head telling Ragnar not to be concerned. Everything will soon work out as planned. Meanwhile, Haydn is cheery and sits on a chair in his new room. The nightlife in Demidra is fabulous and there are really good street performances. He is looking forward to the fun he is going to have. Of course he will need to wear a disguise so he doesn't get recognized. He is about to ask a servant to go and fetch some for him. However, he notices Ian and Captain Oliver who don't seem excited, and their minds seem preoccupied with something else. Ian in particular has a scary look on his face, unable to believe Haydn is acting this way at a time like this. He explains to Haydn that he is here to represent the Green River Empire, and he is also the successor to the throne. Haydn is also the person responsible for negotiating at the treaty discussion. There is no time to play and he must start preparing from this point onwards. Haydn's dreams of going out and having fun have been crushed. He turns to Oliver hoping that he will say something. However, Oliver just turns his head to look away, knowing that our protagonist is right and the prince has work to do. He is going to be the first to speak, and if he is unable to say anything substantial the turn to speak would be passed on to Prince Ragnar. If that happens then Ragnar will take over as the main lead in this treaty discussion. Haydn doesn't want that to happen but also has no idea what to say. Everyone is going to be talking about military strength, commodities, and the distribution of land. Not only does he not know a lot about this, there is also not many people on his side to help him. They are all with his brother Ragnar. Haydn thinks that instead of humiliating himself by saying something, it would be better if he just kept his mouth shut. Ian is disappointed. It seems like Haydn has always been used to just giving up and running away from reality. This time that won't do. Prince Haydn is our protagonist's greatest chess piece, one that he can use to deliver great despair to his enemy Ragnar, who betrayed him in his previous life. Ian snaps his fingers and paper begins flying around the room. Haydn must be the one to lead the treaty discussion. The Emperor has tasked Ian with supporting the prince, giving him specific orders not to allow Ragnar to steal the show and to help Haydn take control of all the discussions by ensuring he knows how to answer and respond appropriately. Using magic he begins writing on the papers in the air, and he slams the doors to the room shut, locking them. From now to the day of the treaty discussion, he is going to make sure Haydn stays inside and memorizes all of these lines no matter what. A week passes and it is now the day of the three-country treaty discussion. Ragnar and the Tower Master are on their way now discussing Haydn. They haven't seen him leave his mansion for the whole week. Herbert was curious about this and placed surveillance over the mansion. However, nothing happened. And only occasionally did Haydn come outside to the garden while looking all tired. Their conversation is stopped when they spot the very person in question they are discussing. The two brothers stand opposite each other and their rivalry brews. Ragnar asks if his brother slept well last night, to which Haydn informs him that he did. The tension grows and the two brothers say very little else to each other. They pass by getting ready for the difficult day ahead. Haydn clenches his fist and shakes and our protagonist notices his discomfort. He tells him not to worry, as he has already done everything he possibly could this past week to prepare. The main lead for the discussion will for sure be him. This gives Haydn a little confidence. He knows he's put the work in and that his brother won't take his place. The person who has been tasked with arbitrating the treaty discussion is the mayor, Ingolo. From this point on all the details discussed will be recorded, and he will be overseeing the whole thing. With everyone sitting around a circular table they prepare to begin. A representative of the Principality of Roe speaks first. His name is Maxwell, 
Due to the road leading to their land being narrow and dangerous it's hard for them to procure troops and supplies. They are hoping to get magicians and elite knights instead of foot soldiers, and money instead of commodities. In fact they have already come to an agreement with the Coldwood Empire on this, however they are prepared to discuss it further if the Green River Empire has any objections. Ian looks over to the prince, knowing that they have practiced this topic in the previous week. Haydn gets ready to answer, but Ragnar looks at him with a smug smile as if he is already suspecting his brother to fail. He clears his throat and prepares to take over the discussion. Haydn speaks up though, informing the table that in regards to military issues the person who will be answering such questions is the Empire's great general, Duncan. Ragnar wasn't expecting him to say something like this, and Haydn continues, ordering Duncan to respond to the Principality of Rose query. Duncan has a dapper military uniform on with gray hair and light stubble. Just like he was ordered he begins giving his opinion on the situation. Ian has a smile on his face while looking down at the floor. It seems like the discussion is off to a good start. They just need to carry on like this. The talking continues for a while with Prince Haydn taking the lead. With our protagonist standing behind him in support it's like he could take on the world. Throughout the discussion Ragnar has his arms folded and appears annoyed. He hasn't been able to get a word in and things haven't gone as planned for him. The sun shines through a large window providing light to the room of bickering elites. After a lengthy conversation it begins to set and the bright blue sky turns to a somber orange. Ian knows things are about to come to an end and so far there have been no problems. The prince of the Coldwood Empire, named Hector, begins to speak. They are unable to split the lands of the three countries fairly. There hasn't been a lot of planning and the borders are so close to each other. Also, the quality of natural resources varies in each land. Someone could land a rich piece of land and strike the jackpot, whereas someone else could get a total dud, with nothing below the surface. Something like this isn't fair and could lead to jealousy, or even cause a war to break out. This is the most important topic of the discussion and our protagonist knows it. The Negotiation on the Division of the Lands and Natural Resources Prince Hector states that the Coldwood Empire doesn't want any trouble, and would be happy to maintain peace for the next 10,000 years as long as they are given a good deal. The Principality of Roe begin to mutter among themselves, holding up pieces of paper and crossing their arms. Prince Ragnar looks over to the Tower Master as if wanting approval to speak. Herbert nods in his direction. This gives him the confidence to raise his hand, wanting to share his humble opinion with the table. However Haydn slams his hands down creating a loud sound that overpowers his brother's words. This gets the attention of all the other countries who look in his direction. Prince Haydn stands up, claiming that he knows just the method they can use to divide the land. That can't go wrong. Ragnar timidly lowers his hand in the background, wondering how his brother got so competent when it comes to political affairs. Haydn continues, speaking of a new type of magic that has apparently been developed by the Ivory Tower, with the ability to detect and roughly quantify the amount of minerals buried under a certain area. Ragnar and Herbert snap their heads in his direction wondering how on earth he could have possibly known this information. Haydn introduces everyone at the table to Ian, the Empire's youngest high-ranking magician, the one who has created this magic. A wave of distress washes over the Tower Master's face, realizing that our protagonist somehow came up with the same idea he had. He stares at Ian with disdain, trying to think of how he could have possibly predicted a topic like this would be a problem, and how he could possibly have came up with the perfect solution. Prince Haydn is still talking to everyone. They are thinking of using this detection magic to create a sort of resource map to see how good the land is. Using this completed map they will be able to divide the Great Plains into multiple plots of lands and each country will get their fair share. He's sure the boundaries will probably be messy, but the land is going to be cultivated and mined for tens of years to come anyway. This is the best solution they have. Also looking at Ian with disdain is Ragnar whose fists are clenched and gaze narrow. Ian can see him staring and just smugly looks back at him, with a light smile on his face, knowing he has ruined all of Ragnar's plans today. The discussion ends here for now, with Haydn's proposal for the creation of a resource map. Everyone exits the room where they have been trapped this whole time. The first thing Haydn does is go and find Captain Oliver, proud of himself of how he was able to keep control of the meeting as its lead speaker. He wishes Oliver was there to see the sour faces of Ragnar, and the Tower Master. Oliver is just happy that everything went well. The two get ready to go out to have a drink and tour the city to celebrate. They turn to Ian asking him to come with them. Ian accepts this offer, which is something they didn't expect. They're glad as this is how it should be. Ian will be an adult soon and so should accept drinks that are bestowed upon him. Haydn hasn't stopped smiling since he left the discussion. 
He can't wait to teach Ian how to drink. His smile fades when Ragnar calls out his name and approaches from behind. Everyone turns around to face him. Ragnar shows respect, lowering his head. He was impressed with his older brother's performance today and learned a lot from him. Haydn wasn't expecting such a compliment. He's glad his brother was able to learn from him. He should continue to improve and develop, and if he needs advice he can ask anytime. After paying that compliment Ragnar walks away, leaving Haydn, Oliver, and Ian. Haydn turns to look at his two friends. Today has really been the best day of his life. He can't wait to go out and celebrate since he has been locked up inside the mansion all week. He orders Oliver to not be so hard up and to let his hair down. And he orders Ian to accept any drinks that he offers. It seems like everyone is ready to have fun when suddenly Ian's hands begin glowing blue. Everyone looks over wondering what is happening, including Ragnar and the Tower Master Herbert. It seems like this is the limit of Ian's puppeteer spell and his clone is vanishing. He apologizes to the prince, but he will have to have that drink another time at the Imperial Castle. He says he will explain everything to Haydn later and vanishes. Haydn is confused as he disappears from in front of him. Upon seeing this Herbert understands everything now. He grips his staff tightly. It was a clone all along. Ragnar looks baffled, thinking that it was impossible for clones to exist. This is why he came to the treaty discussion instead of checking on his family. He was in two places at once. Herbert realizes he was played. For a while he looks pissed, until a light smile appears on his face and the sound of his sinister laugh travels through the air. The scene cuts back to the Pyrrhic estate where our protagonist's original body is laying. Lord Kalyan is watching over him closely, making sure he is safe and okay. He's not awake yet and has been in this dreamlike state for days. It can be seen from his body that he's slowly getting weaker. Kalyan remembers Ian telling him that if there seems to be a problem, he should inject mana into his brain to wake him up. He rises from his seat, thinking that it's probably best to call the magicians over to wake him up forcefully. Just as he is about to do this Ian regains consciousness, so now there is no need to do so. Kalyan looks over Ian, wanting to know if he is feeling unwell after being in such a state for so long. Ian is having some problems right now, his head hurts and he can't move. Most importantly his stomach is hungry. Its groans echo around the room. Kalyan was expecting the worst but bro just needs a snack. It doesn't take long for Ian to get back on his feet and prepare for his journey back home. Kalyan wants him to stay one more night. He at least owes Ian a banquet since he is their savior, even if it is a small one. Ian refuses, and Kalyan doesn't need to pay him back as he has already done enough by watching over his body. He doesn't consider himself a savior and was just fulfilling his duties as a high-ranking magician. If he didn't help then another magician would have just come along and done exactly the same thing. Kalyan disagrees. Had any other magician come they would have returned to the tower immediately after fending off the monsters and blocking the canyon with ice. Admittedly Kalyan had his doubts when they first met, finding it hard to believe that someone so young would be able to handle the problems in the Great Plains. However, in a mere 10 days Ian was able to do what they couldn't for years. It's clear to him that Ian possesses a special kind of strength that others don't have. Since he isn't accepting a banquet he proposes they do something else before he leaves. Back in part 1 he informed a thousand years steamed guest pact with Lord Marcus in the Magrian territory, stating that Ian is always welcome in the Magrian territory and they will fight by his side no matter what. Kelyon would like to offer him a similar pact. Anytime he wishes to come to the Pyrrhic estate he is welcome. There is no greater honor than for them to have the Empire's only 6th class magician as their guest. Kelyon tells him he won't regret it, and such a pact will be beneficial to both parties. Ian is a little taken aback by the offer. It's not every day someone proposes a thousand-year pact. He accepts it gratefully. Kelyon is happy to hear it and decides they should do something more formal to mark this event. It's a thousand-year pact after all. He takes a sword from one of his men. While removing it from its sheath he warns Ian that this might be a little awkward but it will be over quickly. Slamming the sword into the ground and closing his eyes he begins to officially recite the new pact, stating that his family will always welcome high-ranking magician Ian Page anytime. If he requires the strength of the Eastern Territory, they swear that they will always stand by his side. This is something that will carry on in both current and future generations. After that speech Kalyan giggles to himself and blushes. He's embarrassed to speak so formally and can't get used to it no matter how many times he does it. Ian is grateful and bids farewell to Lord Kalyan and the Pyrrhic estate. He will be sure to stop by in the future to make use of their new pact. Using his flying robe he shoots up into the sky. While floating high in the air he looks down at the scenery. Large rocky mountains litter the floor. It has been a short time, but a lot of things have happened. He also got his hands on a fine new item as well. 
the shaman king's staff which he is holding in his hands. Ian still has no idea who the woman was that visited the shaman king and imbued the staff with magic. And he has no idea why black magic that disappeared 300 years ago is suddenly being used again. It looks like he's going to have to do a lot of investigating when he makes it back home. When he arrives back at his mansion he is almost immediately greeted by his mother. She runs down the stairs voicing how much she was concerned about her son. Especially when the clone he sent to check on her suddenly disappeared into smoke. Seeing Ian she notices that he has gotten a lot thinner and the size of his face has almost halved. This is seriously upsetting to her. Thinking about how her son must have gone through a really tough time while away for him to get so thin. Ian calms her down, he got distracted and just needs to eat a little more to gain back the weight he lost, it's no big deal. He begins to remove something from his pockets to hand over to her. It's a mana communicator that's made from a mana crystal ball. He had it specially made at the workshop. Ian has his own in his staff, and in the future if they are at a close enough distance they can communicate through it. He apologizes for causing his mother so much worry, and from now on he will always be by her side. The wholesome moment is ruined when Douglas bursts into the room calling Ian Boss again. He bombards our protagonist with a flurry of questions, wanting to know what type of magic he used to appear in two places at the same time. Was it mirrors, clones, or something similar? Ian tells him to slow down and to just ask his questions one at a time. To put it simply, that type of magic was only possible because he is a sixth-class magician now. His family are bewildered by this information. Knowing that this must mean Ian is now the highest ranked magician in the empire. Letio knew our protagonist was extraordinary when they first met but he had no idea it was to this extent. Ian doesn't want them to see him as someone so superior, stating that nothing has changed so they should just treat him as they would usually. In that case, Douglas is about to test out some new potions he just made in the research lab. He wonders if Ian would like to join him. He can't though and will have to do it another time, as right now he has already been invited to another appointment. Wearing more casual clothes he leaves his mansion and enters some kind of pub, with many people sitting around having a good time. He is welcomed inside by Prince Haydn, who reveals that this is a celebratory banquet that he has prepared for our protagonist. When Ian was asked to wear his casual clothes it made him curious as to what kind of banquet he was going to. He looks around a little surprised at the scene. Inside is also Oliver and another knight who are both out of uniform drinking from large wooden cups. One of these drinks is slammed onto the table for Ian to drink. He looks down at it awkwardly. Haydn has arranged this banquet to celebrate Ian upgrading to a sixth-class magician. He has bought barrels of the best beer into the Imperial Palace specially for this. This kind can't be easily found outside. He asks Ian to enjoy himself and drink up. Ian appears a little hesitant. He was never one to drink a lot back in his past life since he was loyal to Ragnar back then. Ragnar always said drinking would cause one's thoughts to become dull and would cause a person to let down their guard. For this reason he avoided it. He and Ragnar are obviously not friends in this life, so Ian picks up the large cup and raises it to his lips, chugging it down like he's a frat boy. Upon finishing he slams it back onto the table and wipes the excess from his mouth, surprised that it actually tastes quite good. Prince Haydn is happy to hear it. A gleeful smile radiates on his face as life has been going so good for him the past couple of days. Some men at the bar call out to him, asking the prince to come over and tell them all about the successful treaty discussion in Demidora. He rises from his seat and obliges their request, getting ready to brag about his political skills. He approaches the men leaving Ian sitting alone. Bro really got abandoned at his own celebration. Fortunately he is approached by Oliver who offers him a refill. As this is our protagonist's first time drinking he warns him not to overdo it. He jokes, after all if Ian gets too drunk and things go wrong, he could accidentally fire a magic missile and kill everyone. Looking around Ian is surprised by how casually Prince Haydn is acting with all of the knights at the bar. He wonders if it is okay for him to hang around with them like that. Oliver knows everything is fine though. All the knights here have sworn their loyalty to the prince and can be trusted. Ian holds his head in his hand, seeing Prince Haydn's relationship with the knights has reminded him of his old relationship with Prince Ragnar in his previous life, one built on trust and loyalty that was ultimately betrayed. Noticing he appears melancholy, Oliver starts a conversation with Ian, saying he knows why our protagonist doesn't have any friends. Dude really started up a conversation with an insult. Oliver remembers the first time he met Ian very well. It was the night he captured the Coldwood spy Cecilia back in part 1. Even though Ian had just captured a spy who was a third-class magician, Oliver remembers that his face was completely emotionless. Kids at that age shouldn't be able to hide their facial expressions nor true feelings in such a manner. 
Oliver couldn't read any form of expression in his face, almost as if he was a soldier who had received several years of training to not expose their true feelings. That's when Oliver first realized Ian was a closed-up person even though he was so young. He knew he would be unable to make any real friends that he could share his heart with. Ian admits that that is true, he does have trouble opening up to people. He reveals to Oliver that he did have a friend once, however things didn't end well for him. The night captain takes a sip of his drink, curious as to what a friend of Ian's might even look like. They must be a pretty extraordinary person too. There is something else Oliver has noticed while observing Ian. When the two chat, it feels like Oliver is talking to some middle-aged man who's sick of life. Ian awkwardly laughs, saying Oliver has surprisingly good eyes when it comes to judging people. He raises his drink to his lips, then he holds it up to hide his mouth to everyone at the bar and whispers to the captain, revealing that he's actually going to be 48 years old soon, and he is maintaining his youthfulness using magic. Oliver's world spins as he tries to wrap his head around what was just said. Does he really have access to time magic like that? However, Ian diffuses the tension by explaining he was just joking. He's not very good at making friends and sharing his feelings, so that was just his bad attempt at saying something funny. Oliver understands and nothing more is said about the topic, which was a close call for Ian. He almost blew his whole cover from getting a bit too drunk. If Ian hadn't stopped himself, then Oliver would have discovered all about how he used time magic to reincarnate himself as a child again, and how he has been living the past several years knowing everything that's going to happen in this timeline. Some time later Ian comes stumbling out of the bar holding his head, he didn't drink this much even in his previous life. Outside he notices a man squatting next to the wall. It's the vice captain of the knights named Paul. He embarrassingly admits that he's not a good drinker and his face turns red after drinking one glass, so he is hiding out here to catch a breather. Ian stands next to him, admitting that he is also outside for the same reason. He's just not used to the kind of atmosphere inside. He looks over to the vice captain Paul remembering him from his previous life. He was a great swordsman, second best to Oliver. Although he was born a commoner he was able to rise up to the rank of a vice captain, all due to his swordsmanship and loyalty to the imperial family. He's a man that both Prince Hayden and Captain Oliver trust. Making conversation Paul asks Ian how drinking was for the first time, to which Ian replies that it wasn't too bad, he just has to pace himself better next time. Paul is glad to hear it. The knights are thankful to have him here and he is welcome to come drinking with them again any time in the future. He reveals that both Captain Oliver and Prince Hayden have been really cheerful since Ian started to support them. Ian is thankful for the kind words. He's just trying to give them a slight push in the right direction so that things can be better in the future. Though he admits that seeing them so cheerful has made him feel a lot closer to the two of them. Their peaceful conversation is interrupted when the door to the bar opens and the banter from inside invades the street. It's one of the knights who has come looking for the vice captain. Apparently Prince Hayden is looking for Paul, and if he doesn't come back inside and have another drink he is going to demote him from his position as vice captain. Realizing he has to get back inside Paul leaves Ian leaning up against the wall, the party awaits him. Ian takes a walk to a nearby ledge and looks out into the distance at the village. The stars shine down on him and things seem hopeful for the future. He knows that all the memories he has from his past life are no longer relevant and can't be used anymore. His choices these past few years has altered the timeline. He has made new friends and helped Prince Hayden do well in politics. He has saved his mother from the tragic illness she suffered in his previous life and has also saved Douglas and Ledio's life. All of these changes are sure to create a very different future to the one he remembers. He's unable to know how it has changed the future at this point in time. The only thing he can do is to keep protecting the people who are most precious to him, and to strive to make the new future a better place. He smiles while thinking about things. This is where the real game starts. Now he has to deal with whatever else Ragnar could be planning. While he is thinking about this the moonlight beams off the Imperial Palace. Inside is Prince Ragnar, and the Tower Master Herbert is behind him. Ragnar isn't happy and asks Herbert what his plan is now. He told the Tower Master countless times that they needed to get rid of Ian before he stood in their way. And every time the Tower Master would just tell him to wait. That's how he always replied. Now his waiting has caused them so much trouble. Ian has got in the way of all of the plans they had. Herbert admits he was wrong. He should have taken care of things in a swift manner, but he was too late. He didn't expect that our protagonist would make the moves he did. He's not going to make any more excuses, and this is the last time that he's going to ask Prince Ragnar to wait. Since all of the preparations are done, Ragnar wants to know what this old guy is talking about. His question is answered when a person in a hooded cloak appears from behind Herbert. 
a subtle hint of red hair can be seen within her hood. Upon seeing this person Haydn's face lights up with fear and distress. This mysterious person begins to remove the hood from their head and reveal their identity. It's Helene, a high-ranking magician that disappeared a few years ago after she was defeated by Ian in part 2. However, now Helene has a death-like appearance, with pale skin, red eyes, and chapped lips. Herbert tells Ragnar not to be so frightened. Helene is still a human and is now a loyal subordinate that will do anything Herbert asks. She would even sacrifice herself if that is what he wished. Ragnar's palm covers his mouth due to the perplexity of what his eyes are witnessing. His mind begins to wander, thinking that this is the work of something dark. Tower Master Herbert confirms it. This is the work of forbidden magic, black magic to be more specific. Using this magic they could even turn Ian into an obedient servant, who would be willing to offer his life in service of Ragnar. With his hand on heart Herbert tells Ragnar to not worry anymore. Everything is fine and he will still become emperor in the future just as they planned. Sometime later the tower master is sitting inside his office in the ivory tower. Reading some papers he can't stop thinking about the fact that our protagonist is a sixth class magician. It makes him so angry that a purple glow emanates from him and things are flung around the room in a fit of rage. Another magician enters the room and becomes worried at the scene. Papers are scattered across the floor and things are smashed. Herbert's face changes from fury to delight when he sees this magician, whose name is Marco. Marco wonders if anything is wrong judging by what he sees around him. However, Herbert brushes off his question and begins talking about something else. Marco was abandoned when he was a child and Herbert found him wrapped in a cloth. It has been 20 years since that day already and Herbert remembers it vividly. At that time it was too early for him to know what Marco would become. Yet here he is 20 years later a full-fledged magician. Herbert is proud of him. Marco smiles brightly and thanks the tower master for his kind words. In order to pay him back for taking him in, Marco states that he is willing to do anything. Herbert considers Marco to be like a son and he says he doesn't even need to think of paying him back. However he does want to ask a favor. He asks Marco to stop by his mansion later tonight to find out more details, and the young magician says that he will do just that. This causes a smile to reveal itself under Herbert's grey moustache, almost like he is planning something. Elsewhere in the village the sky is dark and the streets are empty. The door swings open to a nearby bar, and the barman is surprised at the person he sees entering. It's our protagonist, the youngest high-ranking magician at Ivory Tower, Ian Page. Ian wasn't expecting this man to know him, but he assures our protagonist that there isn't a person around who doesn't know his name. He can't believe such an important person came to a shabby place like this. He wonders what the purpose of Ian's visit is. Ian places a bag of gold coins onto the table telling the man not to be cautious of him. He just came here as a guest to buy information. This much money makes the man sweat. He had heard high magicians at Ivory Tower had a lot of money but wasn't expecting anything like this. He asks what kind of information Ian is looking to purchase. With his hood now removed, Ian asks for any information that he might have on black magic. All the rumors about it are either small or false information. He is looking to discover something that isn't known by the public. The man smiles knowing that he is about to get paid handsomely. Ian has arrived at just the right time. The man leans forward over the bar and gets serious, beginning to discuss something known as the Order of the Dragons. The Order of the Dragons is one of the many religions in the Empire. It's an organization that worships dragons as if they were gods. They aren't well known but their existence has been confirmed. The Order of Dragons started as a pseudo-group in the countryside, until one day a thief apparently came across the one and only descendant of the dragons. He began to preach the story of this descendant to the people in the countryside to stir them up. However, the people didn't believe his story and just treated him like a scammer. Although as time went by the Order of the Dragons formed a group and they started to grow. In the present very little is known about them. Their leader, amount of believers, and purpose, all of it is hidden. There are lots of speculations and rumors going around. But among them there are also scary stories about reviving the dead and brainwashing people. The barman explains that he isn't sure if there really are descendants of dragons, but one thing he does know for sure. The Emperor has been collecting information on the Order of the Dragons from many sources, and it is a possibility that there is a connection between this group and the return of black magic. There has even been discoveries of people in this very nation with connections to the Order of Dragons. Since black magic requires a lot of mana and inhumane resources it is only available to high-ranking people. Due to this, the barman suspects there to be high-ranking people currently using black magic in the area, with the ability to brainwash, and manipulate people. Unfortunately this is all the information he has at the moment, 
but if he is able to obtain any more he will be sure to send a letter. Ian understands and walks out of the bar with his hood back up. He returns to his mansion late at night, where he sits thinking about the information he just received. The Order of Dragons is not a name he heard in his previous life, which is unusual as they have supposedly existed for over a hundred years. He looks over to his staff that he got from the Shaman King in the Great Plains. It once had black magic engraved into it. Ian scratches his chin in deep thought, wondering what other high-ranking magicians could be using black magic. It's only speculation but the first thought that comes to his head is the Tower Master Herbert. It's entirely possible that he has connections to the Order of Dragons. Ian leans back and holds his head. Many things have changed from his previous life and it's not just the future but the past too. How could he not have heard about a group around for 100 years? There is a high probability that this entire world is changing little by little. And the differences between our protagonist's past life and current one are only getting bigger. His thoughts only get deeper and deeper. All the changes that have happened could be an effect of him messing with time. After all, the time magic he used to be reborn was taken from a dragon tongue spellbook. Ian fears that he has messed with something that he shouldn't have, and opened Pandora's box. He sits at his desk and removes the glasses from his face. He now realizes that he has been too relaxed, relying on the memories of his past life. From now on the future and even the past is unknown. He places a key into his desk drawer and unlocks it, removing a plain brown box from inside. He places his hand over the top of the lid and prepares to remove it. He looks down at the contents, a golden necklace with a blue teardrop-shaped gemstone in its center. Ian tells himself that from now on he has to be prepared for every possibility. Elsewhere on this same evening, the magician Marco is meeting with Herbert inside of his mansion. Herbert prepares to tell him why he has asked him to come. He snaps his fingers. This causes the door to slam shut and lock. What he's about to say should not be spoken to another soul. The tower master rises from his seat asking the young man to follow him. Marco seems puzzled by the whole situation. Herbert pulls a red book from a nearby bookshelf and opens it up, claiming that it will lead them to where they need to go. A blue mist surrounds its pages and grows more and more by the second, until a large portal-like doorway appears in front of the two of them. The inside is pitch black and its border is made up of the same blue mist. The tower master turns to Marco telling him to come over now. He enters the black abyss soon after. Marco is confused and frightened. Sweat drips down his cheek and shivers invade his body. The tower master Herbert is like a father to him though, so he trusts him and follows close behind. Walking right into this unusual portal that leads to the unknown. Darkness plagues their vision and the sounds of metal clanging and subtle groans is the only thing to break the eerie silence. Herbert chants out the spell Luminous and a bright light is summoned from the palm of his hand, which reveals where they are. Metal cages hang from the ceiling and large barred doors line the walls. It's almost like some kind of prison. Inside cells are people, scrawny and frail, with raggedy clothes and no shoes to protect their bare feet from the ice-cold floor. Marco can't believe it and struggles to even get his words out. Herbert tells him not to be so surprised. These people are just raw materials. Marco looks around at everyone to try and make sense of things. He notices a familiar face in one of the cells. With white hair and a missing arm his name is Chris. A while ago he almost died due to an accident during a magical experiment. In fact most of the people here are magicians that faced a similar fate. Either they died due to a mission gone awry or they were involved in an accident while experimenting. Some of them are even here due to illnesses. Some magicians have also been transferred here from other countries, and anyone here who is not a magician was found in the alleys. Their lives were trash anyway so at least here they can be of use. Herbert explains that here there is a multitude of people from different walks of life, even criminal magicians who use their magic to harm other people. Here everyone is used as a raw material, this way they can at least contribute to the ivory tower. A villainous look can be seen on the Tower Master's face. He raises his staff into the air and a red mist wraps itself around Marco like a snake. His face is petrified and body frozen from fear. Herbert claims he isn't going to let Marco end up like the others here. After all, he is like a son to him. The red mist gets darker and tighter around the young magician's body, causing him to cough violently and tremble in pain. Eventually, he collapses to his knees and the mist releases its grasp and slowly fades away. It seems like whatever just happened is over. Looking down at him, the tower master tells the young magician to stand up and look him in the eye. He does just that, and the two stand opposite looking into each other's eyes. For some reason Marco isn't hostile towards Herbert despite just being attacked with magic. His attitude is calm and compliant. Herbert throws a small dagger to his feet and it clashes against the brick floor. He orders Marco to pick up the dagger and use it to sever one of his fingers. And Marco does just that. 
Herbert watches as Marco's finger detaches from his hand and goes flying through the air. It's almost as if the young magician has no free will and is forced to obey the commands of the tower master. Herbert is happy with what he is seeing. Now he can truly think of Marco as his son. Sometime later they leave this wretched dungeon and the sun shines down on the ivory tower on a new day. Many magicians can be seen standing around having a conversation about things that have been happening as of late. Tower Master Herbert is in support of Prince Ragnar inheriting the Emperor's throne, whereas our protagonist Ian is in support of Prince Haydn. These magicians are the two strongest in the whole of the ivory tower, and the others don't know who they should side with. The young magician Marco can be seen walking past them expressionless and carrying three red books. He approaches a large door and knocks. Inside is Ian with his legs crossed and a stack of books at his desk, clearly doing some research. He is happy that Marco has finally arrived. Marco stands at the opposite side of the room, informing our protagonist that he has bought the books over that he requested. Marco seems like a shell of the person he used to be, and a bandage covers the hand where he severed a finger. He places the books on a nearby table and Ian is grateful. These books are something that he has been looking for for a long time. Realizing he hasn't seen the Tower Master around recently he asks the magician if everything is fine. Marco explains that it is nothing he needs to worry about. However, before he leaves Ian notices the bandage on his hand and is curious. Marco brushes off his concerns. It's just a little accident he had while practicing magic and it's not something worth worrying over. Ian can sense something isn't right. He feels a sense of disparity, almost like Marco has become someone else. He's talking with the same face and voice but he's different from before and is keeping his distance. Ian gets an idea for a way he can test Marco. He begins to bring up old memories of the first time they met six years ago which was back at the very start of this story in part 1. Marco was the first magician that Ian visited. That tested him to see if he had a mana heart and mana brain. Ian remembers this moment well, and apparently so does Marco. However, Ian brings up a second memory that Marco wasn't around for. When he saved Lord Marcus of the Magrian territory from a bunch of goblins, this was also in part 1. Despite not being there when this happened Marco acts as if he was, falling into Ian's trap. Now Ian knows that something isn't right, it's as if Marco doesn't have any memories of the past and is just going along with everything Ian says. He rises from his seat. He stands before Marco with his staff in hand, waving it around he uses to spell magic. A bright blue circle appears as he chants out the spell. Then the red mist begins to appear around Marco again. This time instead of circling around him it gradually unravels, until eventually it floats off into the air and dissipates, almost like it was just sucked from his body. Marco falls onto all fours and begins panting heavily. Bro can't get a break, people keep using spells on him. It was just an anti-magic spell though, that Ian used to cleanse him of the magic that was inside his body. He kneels down next to Marco, explaining that it looks like he was manipulated with black magic. When Marco's memories come back to him he yells out in panic, they must stop the Tower Master, they need to stop him now. Ian calmly looks at him with serious eyes, telling him to slow down and to describe exactly what happened, without leaving any details out. Later when the sun is setting, the scene cuts to the Tower Master's mansion. The Tower Master Herbert is greeted by his butler, who informs him that Ian has come by to visit. Herbert sips his tea, it seems like he knows why he is here and is surprisingly calm about it. It is revealed that Marco was just bait, and the whole reason Herbert infected him with black magic was because he knew Ian would find out about it and then come to confront him. Everything is going perfectly as he planned it to, and Ian enters the room. At first nothing of substance is said. The two just sit opposite and drink tea, commenting on each other's health and doing some catching up after not seeing one another for a while until Ian spits out what he came here to say, confronting the Tower Master. Marco revealed to him that there is a portal leading to a secret laboratory somewhere in this mansion, and that Herbert has been researching inhumane black magic there. Herbert just laughs and denies everything that was just said calling it impossible. Marco must have not been thinking straight due to his bad condition. Ian doesn't back down though, insisting that Marco told him Herbert has been using black magic. Herbert claims he has no idea what our protagonist is talking about. It's true that there is a portal that goes to a laboratory in this mansion. However, it is not being used for black magic. Herbert places down his tea and rises from his seat, offering to show this laboratory to Ian to prove he is telling the truth. A sinister look can be seen in his eyes as if this was his plan all along, to get Ian inside of his laboratory where he is most powerful. Instead of making accusations he says Ian should come and see with his own eyes so these rumors can be laid to rest. After all it would be a disgrace for the Tower Master, 
who is supposed to be a role model, to have people thinking he is researching black magic. Ian gets up and follows behind Herbert, who approaches a red curtain and pulls it back, revealing the same black and blue portal he entered with Marco earlier. The spell to create this portal is that of an 8th class magician. However, with the help of this red book it can be summoned and used by anyone. Herbert enters the darkness of the portal and Ian, who has remained quiet this whole time, does the same. He remembers Herbert from his previous life. He was recorded as one of the greatest tower masters in Ivory Tower history. He was simple and incorruptible, someone who served Prince Ragnar loyally and led the Ivory Tower with the highest amount of authority and benevolence. He was actually someone that Ian respected quite a lot. The two of them trail deeper into the abyss, with the only light being a red glow from the tower master's staff. He stops in front of it and sighs while looking down at the ground. He reveals that there was once a time when he wanted to be a hero, to become a magician that could be strong enough to protect the empire and save the commoners who were suffering. However, over time he realized that he just wasn't strong enough to change anything with his power alone. That's when he came across a separate power in the world that could make him into the hero he wanted to be. Herbert grabs a hold of his staff and turns to look at Ian, the red glow now shrouding the darkness. Suddenly, a spell begins to coil around Ian's body causing him to choke and keel over in pain, similar to what happened to Marco. Herbert continues his villain monologue. With his newfound power he is able to control numerous talented magicians, and by doing this he will be able to truly protect the peace of the Empire and its citizens. He tells Ian not to resist and to just fall under his control. The black magic continues to circle around our protagonist. He tries his best to fight it but it seems like there is nothing he can do. Eventually the spell is completed and Ian slowly rises to his feet, seemingly now under the control of Herbert. Herbert's mouth erupts into an involuntary smile. He had no idea it would be this simple and that his plan would actually work. He assumes that Ian must now be his puppet, that he can manipulate and command how he pleases. He tests this by asking Ian a question, who am I? Ian's stance is stiff and his face vacant. In a monotone voice he answers the question. You're the Empire's ivory tower master, Sir Herbert. Herbert's eyes light up and his smile continues to radiate. For a moment he thinks his spell was a success. However, Ian looks up with a smug grin on his face revealing that it didn't work. He calls Herbert a crazy rascal, and then serves him a double-crusted knuckle sandwich with extra cheese, straight to the nose. This sends the old man stumbling backwards onto his bony behind barely able to believe what just happened. He trembles while gripping his nose, something like that should not have been possible. Ian approaches him and explains things. When a fifth-class magician like Herbert uses black magic it is still only fifth class. Ian is a much stronger sixth-class magician. Plus he expected something like this to happen and came down with countermeasures prepared. He reaches his hand forward to grab a hold of the tower master's face like a basketball. Then he uses a mana drain spell. A blue circle appears and begins to suck the energy out of Herbert. After getting drained of so much mana it should be hard for him to move around. Ian tells him to rest for a little. Plus he's pretty old, so it should take a while for his mana to even recover. Ian walks away leaving Herbert on the floor. The tower master can barely raise his hand let alone stand back up. Ro really thought he could use mind control magic on the main character himself. While exploring this secret laboratory Ian comes across a hidden room filled with gold, rare elixirs, and treasure chests. He can only laugh to himself, he had no idea the tower master was such a hoarder of wealth. He asks the old man if he planned on taking all of this with him to the afterlife. Herbert doesn't answer and can only hold his head in shame. Still trembling and too weak to do anything. It doesn't take long for Ian to spot all of the people down here who are trapped in cages. He notices their condition is awful but there are a few people who are still breathing. He tells them to wait just a little bit longer, soon he will get them out of this place and give them proper treatment. At this point Herbert gets the courage to speak up, asking Ian if he really thinks Marco is the only other person he used the black magic on. He has many servants that are still on the outside, many of which are much stronger than Marco. They all have orders that if they don't hear from Herbert for some time then they should attack Ian's family and Prince Haydn. Herbert is sure that they are already on their way now. It doesn't have to be like this though and he proposes a deal. They can both leave this laboratory and forget all about what has happened today. Herbert will call off his servants and Ian will keep his mouth shut. Ian straight up refuses without even giving it a second thought. When Herbert reminds him that his mother and Prince Haydn will be killed if he doesn't cooperate Ian still refuses. Looking at the tower master with a smile on his face, he tells him that he is free to try and take them out. Meanwhile at Ian's mansion the moon is shining in the sky. 
Ian's mother Vanessa is waiting on the balcony, a little worried that her son isn't back yet from wherever he is. She is unable to contact him with her crystal ball and she is sure he would have informed her if he was going to be late. The alchemist Ledio steps out. The wind is getting stronger and he thinks it would be best if Vanessa came inside now. Ian is the only sixth class magician in the empire. There is no way he is in any sort of danger he couldn't handle so there is no need to worry. Vanessa yells out. He may be the sixth class magician but he is still just a child to her. Ledio apologizes for being so blunt. As a father himself he forgot to take her feelings as a parent into account. Vanessa forgives him. It's just hard for her sometimes. She feels as though Ian always has too much of a burden on his shoulders. He doesn't rely on anyone and tries to solve everything by himself. As his mother she feels as though she should be able to help lessen his burden. But she is angry at herself because there is nothing she can do but sit on the balcony and wait. Ledio offers words of comfort. She shouldn't blame herself. The reason Ian is so strong is probably because he has family at home who is waiting for him. Ledio remembers when he was at his lowest point suffering from a mana overdose. However, his son Douglas stayed by his side and gave him the will to live. This is what family is all about. The two sit next to each other and continue to discuss family. It's a very wholesome conversation on a very peaceful night. Until suddenly Ledio sees something moving down below and gets a bad feeling. He calls out, wanting to know who is there. It is two hooded figures, one with piercing red eyes and the other with his face too hidden to even see any distinctive features. They approach the mansion and Ledio screams out at them, trying to get them to stop and not take another step. However they aren't listening to anything he says, almost like they are possessed. On the floor at their feet is the mansion's security system, and Ledio tries to warn them not to cross it. He quickly grabs a hold of Vanessa and shields her as he knows the two men aren't going to heed his warnings. Once they cross the faint blue line, bright orange lightning comes crashing down on the mansion, frying the ground where it strikes and filling the air with the scent of burnt toast. Prince Haydn and Captain Oliver see this fireworks show from miles away, and they look up at it. Haydn is wearing a disguise so as to not be recognized in public. The lightning and thunder scared him and the two wonder why it occurred. Oliver has a bad feeling and thinks it would be best if they both returned to the Imperial Palace. Haydn doesn't want to go back yet though. It took a lot of convincing to get permission from his father to be out here. And he isn't done exploring the town. He also has something he wants to learn. He awkwardly asks Captain Oliver if he would be able to teach him some sword techniques. This question catches the captain off guard. Until the prince explains further. He doesn't want to learn too much just enough for self-defense. Things like fighting postures and how to properly unsheathe a sword. As he is saying this Oliver unsheathes his own sword, its blade shines in the moonlight. He senses something. Haydn becomes confused when Oliver pushes in front of him and holds his blade up. His eyes become narrow with focus and his gaze fixed ahead. Oliver swiftly orders all the other knights in the area to surround the prince and protect him no matter what. A hooded figure begins to approach menacingly and Oliver demands that they show themselves. They remove their hood and it is revealed to be Helene, an ivory tower high-ranking magician that disappeared a few years ago. Oliver is surprised to see her. With his sword still raised he asks what her purpose here is. For a moment she remains silent and an eerie tension brews in the air. She looks up with death-like eyes, stating that she is here to kill the Prince Hyden Green River. Helene darts forward and her wooden staff clashes with the captain's metal sword. Getting a closer look we can see that her left eye has turned to black. The two break their lock and Helene dashes backwards to create distance. Magicians are much better at long range. She begins using her magic, summoning a pyroblast spell which causes large balls of flames to come charging toward Oliver. Remembering his previous training with Ian in part 3 Oliver slices the air with his sword, creating a gust of wind that protects him from the flames. Helene wasn't expecting this and is staggered. Oliver doesn't hold back and hurtles forward through the flames to attempt an attack of his own. The redhead manages to block it with her staff but Oliver is determined. He rapidly comes in with a second strike, forcing Helene to use a mana barrier as protection. The captain's blade bounces from it and does no damage at all. He falls to his knee and a cocky smile appears on his face, almost as if he was hoping she would use a mana barrier. He removes a glove from his hand and it is revealed he knows a way to counter this barrier. It's something he wanted to show Ian first, but it looks like he is going to have to use it on Helene instead. Captain Oliver only has half a mana heart so he doesn't have the ability to release mana. However he does have mana that's dissolved in his blood, that can be released only for a short moment. He taunts Helene, saying he is about to show her the true power of what half a mana heart is capable of. His sword glows a bluish hue and he swings it with great might. 
It swipes right through the redhead's barrier and shatters it to pieces. Her eyes become filled with bewilderment, unable to believe that a mere human was able to conjure such power. Captain Oliver follows up that strike with a jab to Helene's shoulder. It pierces her, leaving her with a grave wound. However, it isn't enough to kill her. Oliver wants to keep her alive so he can find out who ordered her to try and kill Prince Haydn. He tells her to throw away any expectations of future peace, as she is going to be in for a whole world of pain for her actions. Cutting back to the hidden laboratory, we see Ian and Herbert who is still cowering on the floor, still attempting to make threats towards Ian's family and the prince. Ian just laughs, asking if Herbert really thinks he hasn't been preparing for something like this. He has trained Captain Oliver for years and knows he is capable of defending the prince. As for his family, the mansion is surrounded by layers of mana traps. Anyone trying to enter is going to have a hard time and will probably just end up dead. Ian holds his hands up. This conversation is over and he is not looking to negotiate as the Tower Master has nothing he can use against him. He slowly approaches the old man and his body casts an intimidating shadow over him. The Tower Master will have to go on trial for his crimes and will most likely be executed. After decades of his life as the Tower Master he will lose his job. Ian reaches forward with his hand. This wasn't something he was intending on doing but it looks like he will have to take over as the new leader of the Ivory Tower. He places his hand on Herbert's head and begins using his magic, creating bursts of blue lightning. While the old man is being electrocuted Ian confides in him. He understands why Herbert supported Prince Ragnar instead of Prince Haydn. After all, he did the exact same thing in his previous life. Accumulating a bunch of wealth and storing it down here is also understandable. It's nothing surprising for a human to do. However, Herbert's biggest mistake was bringing Ian's family into this. This is something that he isn't going to let slide. The lightning grows and grows and its crackling thunder is drowned out only by Herbert's screams. Sometime later the Tower Master's crimes are exposed to the Emperor. Emperor Terry sits on his throne relaying this information to the citizens of the Empire. Herbert was a criminal that had lost sight of what it meant to be a Tower Master and indulged in black magic. That's not all, he also used human souls as sacrifices, and cruelly exploited the lives of innocent citizens and his fellow magicians. This is a grave crime that he can't pay for, even with his death. It is unforgivable, and the Emperor has no intention of showing any form of mercy. From this moment onwards all of the titles and authority that belong to Herbert will be stripped from him, and he will be executed in public. His name will be forever recorded in the history of the Empire as the worst criminal of all time. And if he has any blood relatives or accomplices still around, Terry vows to find them and grant them this exact same fate. This is an issue he is taking extremely seriously. He will also be conducting an investigation to see if there are any other magicians who have been researching black magic. During this investigation no preferential treatment will be shown, regardless of someone's status. Even the nobles are expected to cooperate. He understands that there are likely people who assisted Herbert against their free will, likely unaware of what was truly happening. These people will not be punished as harshly providing they are purified of black magic and returned to their original state. However the same can't be said for high-ranking magician Helene, who attempted to assassinate the Emperor's son, Prince Haydn. Although she was just following Herbert's orders and didn't have control of her own thoughts, the act of trying to take out the heir to the throne is a grave crime that can't be forgiven no matter what. Due to this, Emperor Terry hereby sentences the redhead Helene to an infinite lifetime of imprisonment. Lastly, he can't end this speech without giving thanks to the two heroes that helped to stop this incident. Our protagonist Ian, who was the one that put a stop to Herbert, and the captain of the Knights Oliver, who did an excellent job of protecting Prince Haydn from Helene. As Ian is currently a part of the Black Magic investigation he will not be rewarded until after it has finished. Therefore, the Emperor calls for Captain Oliver to step forward. Oliver approaches the throne and lowers his head with his hand on heart. A knight protecting a prince from a fourth-class magician is an impressive feat. The Emperor says that he is a true blessing to the Empire whose actions should be celebrated. He is a role model not just for the Empire, but for knights all over the world. The Emperor won't let Oliver's actions go unrecognized. He rises from his seat and announces to everyone in the room. That is of this very moment, Oliver will be given the authority to control all of the knights within the Empire, and bestowed the highest title, Sword Lord. The Sword Lord title is one that hasn't been given to anyone for hundreds of years, mostly because swords have been pushed aside and replaced by magic. However, Oliver has shown the true strength of the sword by defeating the magician Helene which is why it is so befitting that he receives the title Sword Lord. 
Prince Haydn watches with a smile on his face as his close friend and protector gets the respect and recognition he deserves. The emperor removes a regal sword from its sheath. It's rather large and has a golden handle with a red gemstone. He asks Oliver politely to get down on his knees. Oliver follows his orders and the emperor prepares to officially christen him with this title. In the name of the first stream of the Emerald River, he commands for the title, Sword Lord, to be placed in front of Oliver's name. And along with it, all the honor that the title comes with. The emperor touches the sword to the knight's shoulder. And then Oliver looks up, swearing to everyone present that as the new Sword Lord he is willing to give up his entire life to protect the empire. Later the emperor is visited by Prince Ragnar who isn't happy about the upcoming execution of Tower Master Herbert. He tries to convince his father not to go through with it, claiming that it could cause enormous damage to the Empire. The Tower Master is a great fifth-class magician and to execute him would be the same as executing tens of thousands of magicians. And that isn't all. If the Tower Master is gone then all the other empires will find out about this. The Cold Wood Empire and the Principality of Roe would be sure to capitalize on their weakness. Since the strongest magician would be dead, Ragnar claims that the empire would fall into complete disarray. This would be the perfect opportunity for their enemies to attack. Terry turns his head calmly, informing his son that Herbert is not the strongest magician in the Empire. The strongest magician is Ian who is of 6th class. Soon he will take over the role as Tower Master and so there won't be any problems. In fact with the leadership of a 6th class magician the Ivory Tower may even rise to even greater heights. Ragnar grits his teeth and clenches his fists. With his eyes closed he tries to hide his anger at the fact that Ian will be the new master, until the Emperor asks if he is wrong, demanding an answer. Ragnar admits he is right. With Ian Page as the master of the Ivory Tower it will open up a new age. However Herbert is strong himself and is a magician who possesses tens of years of experience. Ragnar proposes that the Emperor make both Ian and Herbert Tower masters at the same time. With the two of them together the Empire will be undefeatable, and will become the strongest in the world in the shortest possible time. Also, if a young capable magician and a magician who is full of experience take charge together, they could keep each other in check. Prince Ragnar tries to convince his father to consider this as a possible option. At first the Emperor agrees that it would make them quite strong. However the Tower Master has been researching black magic, sacrificing innocent lives of commoners and magicians in the process. His actions were way too far and Herbert is undoubtedly crazy. He did all these terrible things all in the pursuit of power. Ragnar's fist clenches tighter as he struggles to come up with any way he can possibly defend Herbert's actions. While Herbert's methods were wrong, Ragnar claims that black magic could become a strong weapon for the Empire. He suggests that instead of using innocent lives they instead just sacrifice criminals. That way they can use black magic to their advantage. The Emperor sees with rage, unable to believe his son would come up with such a vile idea. This is exactly why he chose Prince Haydn to be the heir instead of Ragnar. Black magic is an absolute evil that corrupts one's soul and disrupts the order of the world. The Emperor knows that Ragnar has a lot of good qualities. He's bright, smart, and has an ambitious personality. However, he tells his son that he lacks one very important thing that is needed to become a good leader. He walks past Ragnar with a face of disgust, saying that he doesn't have a good heart. In order for someone to be a good emperor they need a heart that is willing to fight for the common people. For a moment Ragnar seems devastated at his father's words, but not long later he begins laughing and calling his father a liar. The real reason he isn't the heir to the throne isn't because of his heart but for another reason. Prince Haydn was the child of the Emperor, and his one true love, so he is his favorite son. While on the other hand, Ragnar was a child that the Emperor had with a concubine. He has always been an afterthought. That's the real reason why Ragnar isn't going to be Emperor in the future. Terry is gobsmacked at the words that just came out of his son's mouth. However Ragnar continues. Ever since he was a child he was always treated differently. Like he wasn't even a part of the family. All he ever wanted was for his father to look at him the same way he looked at Prince Haydn. Ragnar bets that if it was Prince Haydn here right now, asking for Herbert to be set free, then it would be done no questions asked. The Emperor raises his hand and slaps him across the face. He then walks away calling Ragnar a fool to even suggest something like that. Ragnar is left standing all alone with a red face, knowing deep down that what he said is the truth. When the Emperor exits the room he turns to one of the knights, asking him to keep a close eye on Ragnar over the next few days, making sure he doesn't leave or come into contact with anyone. The knight, whose name is Damful, nods his head to signal that he understands these orders. The Emperor has grounded Prince Ragnar, so that he can be punished for his words, and so that he doesn't try and rescue the old man Herbert. 
he spends a while trapped inside his room until someone knocks at his door asking if they can enter. It's Ian who says he is here for an urgent matter. The Emperor has tasked him with testing people to see if they are under the influence of black magic or not. And it is now time for Ragnar to be tested. Ragnar is insulted by his words. Today is the day of Herbert's execution yet he wants to waste time with this nonsense. Ian informs him that it is a compulsory test and has been taken by all Imperial officials and family members. Realizing he doesn't have much of a choice Ragnar sits down telling Ian to just get on with it and get out. Ian approaches, warning that it won't take long but it might leave him feeling nauseous and dizzy for a while. There is nothing to worry about though. Ian waves his staff and chants the words, Greater Cancellation. A blue circle appears while the spell is being cast. Not long after Ragnar shivers a little, expressing that he feels awful. This is normal. Luckily no traces of black magic was found in his body. He just needs to rest and he will feel better in no time. Once he has completed his duties Ian lowers his head and prepares to leave Ragnar in peace. Ragnar stops him though, calling out with something to ask. He wants to know why Ian serves his brother Prince Haydn. His brother is not suitable for the position of emperor, and many of the nobles have turned their backs on Ian for showing support towards him. Ian turns around saying very little words, just that he doesn't serve Prince Haydn and that he has to leave now. Ragnar stands up in shock, wanting to know what he meant by what he just said but Ian doesn't answer. He exits the room and closes the door behind him, looking at the ground as if in deep thought. He doesn't serve Haydn, he doesn't serve anyone. In his previous life he was loyal to Prince Ragnar and would have done anything for him. However after he was betrayed and poisoned, he knows that he cannot become friends with Ragnar in this new life. Ian storms off, he can't get sentimental to how things were before and needs to stay focused on his goal. To get revenge, Nightfall arrives at the Imperial Palace on the day of Herbert's execution. The Night Damphal enters Ragnar's room, informing him that it has happened. The room appears a mess, with furniture tipped over and papers scattered on the floor. Around this afternoon at the execution site in the town square, the old man Herbert was punished for his crimes, and his life came to an end. Ragnar has a look of deep sorrow on his face, as if he has been mourning the loss of someone he was close to. He tells Damphal that he can leave now. The knight approaches and places a piece of paper on a nearby table, saying that Ragnar shouldn't be upset. Without saying anything more he lowers his head and leaves the room. Curious as to what the paper could be, Ragnar picks it up and unfolds it. It's a letter and he reads it carefully. The words on this paper defeat his sadness, and it is replaced with a hopeful smile. It's unclear what the letter says but it seems to be good news. The next morning Ian is having a conversation with the Emperor. The survivors that were trapped inside Herbert's portal have all been rescued and are currently being treated. The large sum of wealth he was hoarding has been put back into the treasury, and almost everyone has been tested for dark magic and nothing else has been discovered. The Emperor is grateful for all the work Ian has done. He didn't expect Herbert to be so crazy. Terry also largely blames himself for not suspecting Herbert of his activities earlier. Ian assures him that even he didn't notice. It's hard to imagine that someone so famous for their integrity could stoop to such lows and hide it all behind a kind face. For now Ian is going to continue with the investigation of black magic in the ivory tower and Terry is happy to hear it. However, he does have one last question that he would like to ask our protagonist. With his arms crossed, he asks if Ian is in support of Prince Haydn or not. Ian is taken aback by this question but the Emperor remains quiet, patiently waiting for an answer. Ian isn't going to pledge his allegiance to Prince Haydn, but he is happy to cooperate to ensure that he can succeed to the throne safely and so that he can become a wise Emperor. While scratching his chin Terry thinks deeply about this answer. Ian isn't going to pledge his allegiance but he will support the prince. The emperor decides that this answer is satisfactory. He signals to his assistants to bring in a large box. Inside is Herbert's old staff that they recovered after detaining him. Whoever owns the staff becomes the tower master of Ivory Tower. The emperor wants to give it to Ian. The process of electing a new Ivory Tower master is not a simple one and there is still a lot of work to do. There will have to be a formal procedure to make it official. Though in a time like this Terry doesn't want to leave the tower master position empty. Therefore, he is entrusting Ian with this staff. The emperor gets serious for a moment. He knows his son Ragnar won't give up trying to get the throne, even though most of the people supporting him have collapsed. Terry knows Ragnar's ambition and temper better than anyone else. And if he takes over the throne there is sure to be a lot of sacrifices and blood. Looking at our protagonist, he asks that he do his best to ensure that this never happens. Ian grabs a hold of the staff from the box and falls to his knees, accepting the orders of his majesty and becoming the new tower master. On this day the sun sets on the ivory tower, 
and the sky is cast with a red tint. Ian enters his new office, that formerly belonged to Herbert but not anymore. The sunset creeps through the large windows and Ian begins to think about what Herbert said to him in the laboratory. How he used to want to be a hero, a hero that could defend the Empire and save people who are lamenting. Now that Ian has all of this new power and authority as Tower Master all he can think about is how Ragnar betrayed him in his previous life. He doesn't want to become a hero, all he wants is to get his revenge by killing Ragnar. It has to be a death that transcends merely dying, something truly terrible. Meanwhile, Ragnar can be seen still in his room. The sun has set and the moonlight beams through the glass panes of his window. Hunched over with his hands together, it looks like he is in deep thought about something. The next day Prince Haydn comes to visit Ian, happy that he is the new ivory tower master. Ian tells him to keep his voice down as it hasn't been publicly announced yet but Haydn doesn't care as it is just the two of them here. He can't believe that the kid who begged him to visit the site of the old ivory tower six years ago is now the respectable tower master. His heart is just full from seeing how much Ian has grown. Ian is very busy today doing black magic tests so he asks that the prince leave him in peace for a while. Haydn tells him not to be such a wet blanket. He came here to see Ian specifically because he's always too busy to meet up. Plus Haydn is still feeling dizzy and nauseous from his test the other day and is wondering if everything is alright with him. Admittedly Ian did have his suspicions. Since Haydn is heir to the throne it would have made sense for Herbert to infect him with black magic to make him act like a fool. But no, Haydn is free from black magic and this is just how he acts normally. The next person to take the black magic test is Princess Harry, which reminds the prince of something. Harry has been asking a lot about Ian lately and seems to be interested in him. She always asks Haydn about how he spends his time and what kind of foods he likes. However, even though Haydn is close to our protagonist he doesn't even know the answers to these questions himself. He exits the room, asking Ian to be kind to the princess when she arrives and answer her questions. Even though they are small details it will make her happy. Ian watches him leave, wondering why the princess could possibly be interested in him. He begins thinking about how much he has grown over these past years. Not just him but Prince Haydn has grown a lot too. His personality has gotten brighter and he has been working hard. If he receives proper guidance Ian thinks he might actually be able to become a really wise and respected emperor. This thought is interrupted when Princess Harry enters the room. She has a warm smile on her face and a pink dress. Ian asks her to take a seat so he can begin with the black magic test and she does as he says. Before the test begins she casts a silent spell and blue sparkles float around the room. Ian is impressed, this is a second class spell that soundproofs the surroundings. He's surprised that Harry was able to reach second class while practicing magic secretly. Harry timidly reveals that she is actually a third class magician now, at least that's what her teacher says. Ian congratulates her and wonders why she cast that silent spell and what she wants to talk about. The princess wants to know what she should do from now on. She is lost and needs guidance. Confused about what she means Ian starts to ask questions, asking why she has been hiding the fact that she is a magician. Harry reveals that it is because of her father, the Emperor. When she was 12 she was tested for a mana heart and mana brain by the magician Kevin. After finding out that she possessed the qualities of a magician, instead of informing the ivory tower he went straight to the Emperor. Being a magician means that one has to give up their position and status to become a part of the ivory tower even if they are a part of the imperial family. The emperor didn't want Harry to become a member of the ivory tower and wanted her to remain in the imperial family. So he ordered her and the magician Kevin to keep quiet about her powers. However, one day Harry realized that there is a desire for magic inside of her that she can't get rid of. So she started to practice it secretly with the magician Kevin. At first she just wanted to be of help to her brother Haydn, as at the time no one was in support of his claim to the throne. Though now things are different, Haydn has Ian for support, as well as the Captain of the Knights and newly appointed Sword Lord Oliver. Now that Haydn is on the right track Harry doesn't have any goals anymore. She is even worried that her hidden powers might somehow get in the way of her brother's future. Ian understands and lowers himself in front of the princess. He advises her to live her own life and not worry so much about others, that's all she needs to do. She shouldn't live for the Imperial family or Prince Haydn's sake, but instead should live for herself. Harry embarrassingly looks down to the floor. She has spent her whole life pleasing others and has no idea how to do that. Ian assures her that no one is born with all the answers to life. If you follow the values and goals of others, then your life will become someone else's and not your own. And if you live like that for a long enough time you will lose yourself, you'll wander aimlessly in remorse and emptiness. For a moment Ian thinks about his previous life where he did just that. 
aimlessly followed the orders of Ragnar and was left with nothing but remorse. He hopes that Princess Harry will make the right choice for herself and will make her own decisions moving forward. This will help her to live the life she wants. After such an amazing speech Harry looks at our protagonist with wide eyes. She asks him if he has found the life that he wants. This makes Ian stumble and stutter. Perhaps he was being too forward giving life advice when he isn't fully in control of his own. This is not what the princess meant. Actually Ian is the first person to ever give her advice like this. She's always been so pressured with her duties as a princess and couldn't even imagine having another life. Yet Ian has given her the courage to consider other options and to follow her heart, and for this she is grateful. Ian encourages her to continue studying magic. No matter what path she takes in the future it will be of great help and she has already improved so quickly by reaching third class. Harry plays with her dress and blushes. This is actually the main reason she has come here today. She wants to know if Ian can teach her any magic. This surprises Ian as he thought that the magician Kevin was already her teacher. But apparently there is nothing more that Kevin can teach the princess. Harry puts her hands together and starts to beg. She wants to continue to grow and wants to learn from our protagonist. Ian doesn't know what to do. He knows the princess has a knack for magic as the third class is not something one can reach without a natural talent. Very few people know that the princess has the qualities of a magician, and if she grows up to be a high-ranking magician it could be of great help later on. He decides that he will do it, however only under one condition. He is probably going to need her help in the future and asks that she gives it when the time comes. Without hesitating Harry accepts. Ian is doing her a great favor by teaching her and she is willing to do any favor he wants in return. She doesn't even know what he will be asking for but she doesn't care. With a smile on her face she says that she trusts Ian. This statement makes Ian speechless and he blushes a little bit. He changes the subject and moves on with the black magic inspection that he needs to do. It doesn't take long for it to be over. There is nothing to worry about and she isn't under the influence of black magic. Though she may feel dizzy for a while so Ian recommends she stands up slowly. The princess stumbles and falls into Ian's arms. He asks if she is okay. He can call for a servant if she is having trouble walking. Harry insists she is fine and awkwardly scurries away with a red face. Ian stops her before she leaves and begins telling her about himself. When he's not working in the ivory tower he usually reads books in his mansion or does research in his lab. Recently he has become interested in alchemy because of Douglas who lives with him. He's not too picky about food, though he can't handle spicy food well. Princess Harry is baffled, wondering why he has suddenly blurted out all of these things. Ian reveals that Haydn told him she was asking all these things about his life. This makes Harry gasp, embarrassed that her brother would say something like that. She lifts her dress so she doesn't trip and runs out of the room as fast as she can. Too shy to even look Ian in the eyes. When she slams the door shut Ian is left standing there with a confused expression. Wondering if he did something wrong. After all he just answered her questions. The news of the incident with the former tower master Herbert spread quickly within the empire and caused a great uproar among the citizens. In response to this the emperor personally took command of all black magic investigations and heightened the empire's alert level. Ian was placed as the new master of the ivory tower and completed a thorough investigation of all matters related to black magic, appeasing the anger of the citizens. Herbert was executed for his crimes and was recorded as the worst criminal in the history of the empire. Due to this many of the nobles turned their back on Prince Ragnar because of the close relationship they shared, and instead the nobles flocked around Ian, paying special attention to what his next actions will be as the new ivory tower master. One day Ian is sitting in his mansion enjoying a morning cup of tea, when he receives a bunch of invitations to banquets and parties that people are throwing to celebrate his success. He's not even going to bother to read them. The black magic incident still hasn't settled down yet people are acting so carefree. The alchemist Letio begins to pick up the letters, encouraging Ian to read some of them. One of them is a marriage proposal. Someone known as Count Jurer would like Ian to get engaged to his oldest daughter, who just turned 12 years old this year. Ian spits out his tea at the craziness he just heard. Things like this are to be expected though. Ian is now an adult and it's not weird for people to start talking about marriage matters. As the youngest high-ranking magician and the ivory tower master there is sure to be many more offers from eligible nobles. Ian holds his head. These nobles are really just using him to try and fight for political power. He can't believe someone would suggest he marry a 12-year-old. He must be out of his mind. Letio agrees, finding a marriage partner is something that should come naturally after all. Since Ian is probably busy with the black magic investigation Letio offers to handle all of the invitations for him. Ian is thankful, not only for all the help Letio has been doing around the mansion, 
but also for protecting his mother the night they were attacked. Letio shrugs off the thanks. It was actually the Mana Trap security system that did most of the work. Plus Letio already promised a long time ago to protect Ian's mother, so there is no need to say anything more on the matter. In that case Ian would like to ask him an important question. He wants to know who the magician was that injected Mana into Letio's body all the way back in part 1. The one that caused him to get Mana poisoning. If he can tell Ian anything about the person like a name or their appearance, Ian promises to track that person down and punish them accordingly. Letio awkwardly scratches his cheek, it turns out he doesn't remember who the magician was. It was something that happened in the dark of the night, and there were numerous magicians who hated him. When he was young he made a living as an alchemist in the capital where he came into contact with a lot of magicians, so it could have been anyone. Letio smiles, remembering that after getting mana poisoning he actually developed a deep hatred and resentment towards magicians. However, after being saved by Ian when his village was attacked by bandits it changed his views. Now that he is no longer dying from his condition he has forgotten all of his hate and resentment so it doesn't matter to him anymore. Ian rises from his seat and gets sentimental. He never saw his father's face as he left before he was even born. No one knew if he was even dead or alive. But after meeting and living with Letio, Ian now knows what it's like to have a father around. Letio almost breaks into tears from this comment. To think Ian really sees him as a father figure. With Letio around, Ian understands why Douglas is always so cheerful and positive, as well as why his mother was able to become healthier. In the future the amount of time Ian is going to have to spend apart from his mother will increase. Ian kindly asks that Letio keeps taking care of his mother while he is away. With a wide smile and rosy cheeks, Letio says that of course he will do that. Ian stands with his arms crossed as if waiting for something to happen. It should be about time. Suddenly Douglas bursts into the room startling his father. In his hands is an elixir that he has finally completed after working on it for so long. It's a mana poisoning cure made from Randir's flower. Letio is surprised to hear they actually have a cure for his condition. Ian explains that as he is now the tower master he was able to look through the restricted sections in the library. In the library he was able to find a method he could use to safely harvest the flower without it withering. It involved using a high rank magic that allows one to stop the flow of time for an object. Bursting into tears Letio hugs his son tightly, thanking both him and Ian for their help. Ian watches the wholesome family moment, knowing that he has cured Letio's condition like he promised he would many years ago. Douglas turns to our protagonist with tears streaming down his cheeks. After helping his father Douglas has decided to become an alchemist who specializes in treating incurable illnesses. That way no one can suffer in the way his father did. That night Prince Ragnar is in his room when he notices something shocking. In front of him is an exact replica of his body, a perfect clone. The letter he received from Damphil said that someone was going to be sent to his room, but he had no idea it would be this. Ragnar circles his other body, wondering what they are supposed to do now. Outside are a bunch of magicians guarding the door. There's no way he is going to get past them without disguising himself. His clone begins speaking, telling him not to worry. Someone named the cult leader is going to help them, and they are a far more powerful magician than even our protagonist. He will find out more details when he meets with the cult leader in person. His clone holds a red book in his hands and summons a portal from it. The clone tells Ragnar to enter inside. It's a portal that leads out of the city. When Ragnar peers inside he sees a familiar face. It's Damphil, his personal knight that is usually standing outside his door keeping watch. Ragnar trusts him and follows him inside. When they come out the other side they arrive in a dense forest. Ragnar is confused as to how Damphil was able to use magic like that. Damphil tells him not to be surprised about it. He played a great role in helping Tower Master Herbert rise into power. However, despite receiving tremendous power, Herbert only sought after the advancement of his own position. It was only a matter of time before someone like him was purged anyway. He urges the prince to follow him as they have a lot of work to do. The world is a wide place. The world can be thought of as a place that only belongs to a few chosen people. Damphil explains that Ragnar is one of these chosen people. Not even the emperor has been chosen. Ragnar has no idea what he means when he says chosen. Sweat drips down his cheek as he tries to make sense of the situation. The cult leader thinks that Ragnar is the perfect fit for the position of emperor, the perfect ruler who will exterminate the ignorant commoners and old truths of the world, and bring about and spread the new truths of the world. The cult leader has been waiting for this moment to come for a long time. Ragnar still doesn't know what this crazy nonsense is about. Damphil keeps bringing up someone known as the cult leader. It seems like there's another human who is even stronger than Herbert and Ian in this world. 
Ragnar has heard that there exists a cult which doesn't follow the Empire's religion. Whoever this cult leader is, it's clear that he wants to change how the Empire operates, and they intend on using Ragnar as a tool to make that happen since he is of royal blood. The prince thinks deeply about things while following Damphil. This could be an opportunity for him. In his current situation, Ragnar needs to grab onto any opportunity even if it's not a good one so that he can grow his forces. The two complete their trek through the forest and reach a tall gothic building, with sharp pointed rooftops and dark grey stone. They enter inside and its interior is covered in the same cold brick, lit up by candlelight in various chandeliers. This castle is where the Dragonians used to live, the true descendants of the dragons. 300 years ago this place was erased from the earth during a battle between the Dragonians and the Ivory Tower. It was sealed up and locked away using barrier magic. It hasn't been long since that magic has deteriorated, and in turn many humans have discovered this place. At this point Ragnar starts to get more nervous, demanding to know why he has been bought to this place. In front of him stand a bunch of people in red cloaks, they all lower their hands and show respect to Prince Ragnar. He recognizes many of their familiar faces, they are nobles from the Empire. Since this is an important moment where the new world begins, Damphil has only gathered the top-ranking members of the Empire that he can trust. He tells Ragnar not to worry and not to ask too many questions. He will find out all of his answers soon. He gestures towards a large grey door. The cult leader is waiting inside and is expecting Ragnar. It doesn't take long for the doors to swing open and Ragnar anxiously steps inside with his fists clenched, hoping to finally discover what this is about and who this infamous cult leader is. Inside the room stands a blonde man with dragon-like wings. He is in the center of a big circle surrounded by flames. Getting a closer look he has clear skin and long hair, with a black robe that shows his bare chest. All of the people in red cloaks fall to their knees and begin praising this guy, the last descendant of the dragons. Ragnar doesn't know what to make of things. All he knows is that he is clearly standing in front of someone of great power. He copies the others and falls to his knees. The man with wings introduces himself as Avantis, the last Dragonian left on this land. It's true that the Dragonian race was exterminated by humans in a war 300 years ago. All Dragonians were exterminated except for one, Evantis, the leader of the Ivory Tower at the time. Mitchell Greenriver casted a strong sealing spell on Evantis and trapped him inside this circle, making it impossible for him to step outside of it. Mitchell Greenriver was a member of the Imperial family, and so Prince Ragnar shares his blood. Using this blood Evantis plans on finally escaping from his prison where he has been trapped the past 300 years. Ragnar wonders why this guy hasn't just killed him and taken his blood then, why is he suggesting making a deal? Evantis chuckles, just killing Ragnar would be barbaric. He thinks it would be much more beneficial for the two of them if he made Ragnar into the Emperor. He's going to destroy the old truths in this world and propagate new truths instead, making a peaceful world where Dragonians can coexist with humans. Ragnar rises from the floor finally understanding everything. Avantis plans on using him as a tool to get what he wants, and if Ragnar refuses he is probably going to be killed right here on the spot, and replaced with the clone that is still in his room back at the Imperial Palace. Avantis assures him that no such thing is going to happen. If he refuses his offer then he will just erase Ragnar's memories and send him back safely. However he knows that Ragnar wouldn't refuse an opportunity as good as this. The prince grits his teeth and clenches his fist, asking the Dragonian to promise him. Promise that he will make him emperor and that he won't betray him. Evantis promises, if Ragnar uses his blood to free him from this prison, he will make him emperor in exchange. Damphil appears behind the prince carrying a small dagger in his hands. Too desperate to lead the empire, Ragnar doesn't even think about his actions. He slices his hand open and drips his blood onto the magic circle that is trapping Evantis. The red stains land on the yellow ring and it begins to react. The magic rises into the air and fades slowly and slowly until it disappears completely. Evantis lets out a villainous laugh showing his two fangs, completely overjoyed that he is about to be free after so much time. He steps out of the circle and magically changes his clothes into a dapper new suit, with a red jacket and black waistcoat. He approaches the prince, seeing that his eyes are filled with fear. Evantis tells him that there is no need to be scared. He isn't going to harm him. In fact, the two might even become good friends. With a smile on his face he approaches one of the nobles and takes a red cloak from his hands. Evantis puts it on his person and gets ready to take a much-needed walk outside. Ragnar just stands in the same spot he has been in this whole time, thinking deeply about what he has just done. 
Back in the Imperial Palace Princess Harry is upset as Ian hasn't contacted her yet. They were supposed to begin their magic training and Harry begins to worry that he might have forgotten about it. Her assistant thinks that's impossible. Ian is probably just busy with the black magic investigation he has been doing lately. As she says this a bunch of maids burst into the room calling out to the princess. They rush over barely able to get their words out. He's here at last. Ian Page is on his way. Harry nervously asks her maids for help. She is still in her robe and needs to change into something more formal. Once she has gotten ready she prepares herself to leave the room and greet our protagonist. She turns to look at her maids one last time, asking if her hair is okay and if anything she is wearing is out of place. Her maids assure her that she looks her prettiest today. They raise their hands encouraging her to be confident. Inside the room is Ian who is wearing some fancy new clothes and sitting at a round table. He stands up when the princess enters and greets her, stating that it has been a long time since they last spoke. He's sorry as he has been a little busy as of late. For a moment Harry thought he had forgotten. She thanks Ian for coming and comments on how great he looks in formal wear. Ian thinks they should move to a different location that's more appropriate for learning magic. There are too many people watching within the palace, and if someone finds out they are meeting Ian is worried that rumors might begin to spread. He holds out his hand and asks Harry to grab onto it for a moment. Harry becomes flustered, wanting to know why he wants to hold hands. Ian awkwardly explains that it is just a part of a teleportation spell he is going to use to take them somewhere else. The princess does as he says and Ian warns her that she may feel a little dizzy. Light begins to shine around them and their surroundings disappear. The regal palace is replaced with lush open grasslands with snowy mountains in the background. Princess Harry can't believe it. This place looks beautiful. These are hills that are just on the outskirts of the capital. It's a place that people don't visit often. Ian's teleportation magic doesn't have a long range so this is the best he could do. It's a wide open area so it will be perfect for learning magic. The princess looks out into the distance as if lost in a trance. She has never been outside the palace before. This is something that has only been possible in her dreams so far. Yet simply by holding on to Ian's hands, all her dreams became reality within an instant. She turns to look at Ian with a face filled with joy, saying that magic truly is an amazing thing. Ian looks back at her and for a moment remembers what she was like in his previous life. She was always stuck in the palace and lonely. When Prince Haydn eventually died she ended up taking her own life with no reason to keep going on. Now here she is in this life outside and having fun secretly practicing magic and living her own life. Ian stares while the sunlight glows in her eyes and the wind blows through her hair. He says that magic is amazing indeed. Ian remembers when he first saw Harry secretly practicing magic many years ago. He was exploring the palace and entered the Imperial family's sanctum. He then hid in a corner when she arrived and spied on her for a moment. Harry is surprised to hear he was there that day. After all there should have been guards stopping people from entering that place. Ian admits that he snuck past them. He was young and full of curiosity. The princess understands. When she was young she would explore the restricted areas in the palace with her brother Haydn too. She promises to keep his secret that he was inside the imperial family's sanctum. Since he is keeping her secret that she is practicing magic. Bringing up Prince Haydn reminds her that he is going to be hosting a banquet for his birthday. She asks if Ian will be attending. Ian admits he has received an invitation, but it isn't something he intends on going to. Prince Haydn's birthday banquet is an event only those of noble status will attend. While Ian is currently the ivory tower master he was still born a commoner so the nobles will definitely make a fuss if he attends. There are still some people in the ivory tower who remain loyal to Herbert and Ragnar. Ian believes it would be best if he focuses on his duties as the new tower master, at least until Prince Haydn wins over the favor of the remaining nobles. Harry understands, if Ian is fulfilling his role as tower master then she will be sure to fulfill her role as princess too. She vows to ensure that all the nobles that are still against Prince Haydn won't be able to make any moves. And she is also going to work hard on studying her magic. She turns to Ian asking him to take good care of her while she learns, and also asking if she can call him teacher while they are together. Ian is happy to see that Harry has her own goals and aims. He says she is free to call him whatever she wants. Back in the Imperial Palace the Dragon Ian and Ragnar are discussing their plan going forward. The two main people that could cause problems for them is our protagonist Ian, and the current heir to the throne Prince Haydn. Ragnar thinks it would be best to deal with Prince Haydn first. While Ian has exceptional magic abilities he's still just a young magician that only recently became an adult. Because he's lacking experience and was born a commoner he doesn't have much influence within the political realm. Plus there are already quite a lot of nobles who are unhappy with the fact he is the ivory tower master. 
If they handle Prince Haydn first, Ian should be easy to take out. Damphil suggests that they use a puppet to execute these plans so they don't get caught. He knows just the right person who is suitable for this role and asks for the prince's permission to handle it. Ragnar knows he is right and that they need a puppet. He entrusts the recruitment of this puppet to Damphil and allows him to leave the room. When all the nobles exit it is just Ragnar and Avantis. Ragnar has a question for him. With Avantis's power he could easily take over the empire on his own. Ragnar wants to know why he is using him instead. Avantis reveals that there is someone he needs to find first. The last ancestor that remained in this land. The dragon that controls time, known as the Gold Dragon. He's someone the Dragonian race have been looking for forever. Ragnar thinks that dragons are just imaginary creatures that exist within myths and legends. While that's what most humans in this age think, Evantis is confident that dragons existed and that they still do. It's hard to find them because they live in places that can't be reached. However, if a great chaos descends upon the land, then the gold dragon will definitely show himself. And by great chaos he means war. 300 years ago the Dragonian started the war against the humans in hopes of drawing the gold dragon out. Unfortunately when the dragon came he said that the Dragonians were not the true descendants of the dragons. And so the gold dragon fought alongside the humans instead. Ragnar is confused. All the records state that Mitchell Green River wiped out the Dragonians using magic he developed alone. And there is no mention of dragons whatsoever. Evantis explains that when the gold dragon leaves he erases all his involvement and disappears without a trace, it's as if he doesn't exist in the world. There's no way Mitchell was able to wipe out the Dragonian army without the help of something much greater. Evantis is a true Dragonian, with blood of the dragon. He can sense that the gold dragon still exists despite there being no records of him. The reason he wants Ragnar to be emperor is so that he can start a bunch of wars. This isn't a bad thing for Ragnar though, as in the end all the empires in the continent will be united and he will appear like a hero. There is just one more thing the prince wants to know. What does Avantis plan on doing with the gold dragon once he finds it? Avantis doesn't answer and gets ready to leave. He feels like they have been talking for too long. He tells Prince Ragnar to rest assured. He will follow along with their deal and in no time he will be emperor. The next day Paul, the vice captain of the second imperial knight order, is asked to go and meet with Damphil. He is surprised at this request but heads over there right away to see what this is all about. Damphil allows him to enter and begins asking Paul questions about Prince Haydn and his knights. He had received reports that their security has been tightened due to the recent incident involving black magic. He asks if everything has been alright so far. Paul informs him that there are no issues at the moment. The knights have increased their alert and security around Prince Haydn is tighter now more than ever. Damphil says that he is happy to hear that. Prince Haydn is the future emperor, and his safety is of utmost importance. Damphil begins to approach Vice Captain Paul. Based on rumors he has heard Paul's swordsmanship is the second strongest in the empire, next to Captain Oliver the Sword Lord. He compliments Paul, he must be truly talented to be recognized in such a way by the public. Paul blushes, he may be talented but there is still a lot of ways in which he is lacking. Damphil gets closer and more serious. He remembers when Captain Oliver first recommended Paul to be promoted to vice captain. He thought he was crazy as Paul was an orphan and a commoner. He had no idea why he would choose someone from such a background to be a part of the knight order that is supposed to protect the emperor. He couldn't believe that Oliver would let some random commoner into the noble and prestigious imperial knight order. It's something that he couldn't bear to see. Paul begins to sweat, wondering where Damphil could be going with this. So far he has just insulted him. Damphil takes a step back and Avantis appears behind him as if out of nowhere. Paul immediately reaches for his sword, demanding to know who Avantis is and how he got into the room. However, the Dragonian casts a spell that makes it so the vice captain can't move. He tries as hard as he can but it's no use. Damphil looks in his direction with a sinister stare. Paul may have been born a commoner but now he is going to become a part of an even greater empire. The scene cuts to Prince Haydn and the Sword Lord Oliver who are dueling together. Oliver is instructing the prince, giving him directions on maintaining his posture and balance. In the end the duel is finished when Oliver knocks the sword out of Haydn's hands. Haydn falls to the floor from exhaustion feeling disappointed in himself. Maybe he just isn't cut out for learning swords. Oliver doesn't think that that is true, stating that the prince is definitely better than most people, and that he is even improving faster than Ian. While no one can match up to Ian in magic, he had no talent for swords until Oliver taught him. Haydn bursts into laughter, unable to believe that there is something that the perfect Ian is bad at. This motivates him to keep training even harder from now on. Hopefully one day he may even be better with a sword than Ian. 
While he is talking with Oliver he looks out in front of him and sees the vice captain Paul standing beneath some trees. His expression is vacant and he appears motionless. Hayden asks Oliver if everything is okay. Paul has been talking much less lately and seems down. This is something that Oliver has noticed too. He has asked Paul about it but he just said that everything's alright. The two look over at the vice captain with eyes of concern. Clearly everything is not alright. They decide that they are going to keep an eye on him for a while. Bro has really just been standing under a tree all this time doing nothing. It's the day of Prince Haydn's birthday banquet and the sun shines on the Imperial Palace. Inside the butlers and maids are making sure everything is prepared and ready. The sword Lord Oliver goes over to fetch the prince, his banquet is about to start. Haydn says he will be right there, though he is a little nervous because our protagonist Ian isn't going to be there to help him with the nobles. Oliver reminds him he should be confident and proud. He is the main character of today's banquet. The nobles should be the ones who are nervous, not him. The prince cheers up. He might not have Ian by his side but at least he has the sword lord. At this moment Princess Harry enters the room. Wearing a long blue dress with white gloves, she put a lot of effort into her outfit since it is her elder brother's birthday. Haydn comments on how beautiful she looks. It's a pity that Ian couldn't attend, he would have been speechless at how pretty she looks. Harry blushes at the mention of our protagonist. She embarrassingly asks that Haydn stop saying stuff like that. She also can't believe the prince told Ian all about the questions she had asked about him. How could he do something like that? Does he know how embarrassed she was? Realizing she is scolding her brother on his birthday she calms down and takes a deep breath. Wishing him a happy birthday, she is so proud of her hard-working brother. Any nobles that dare to say anything bad about him she vows to crush so he shouldn't worry. Prince Haydn thanks her and offers his arm out. It's time they head into the banquet, everyone is probably waiting. The siblings step into the room, both dressed like a million bucks. I could probably pay off my student loans with a single button from their clothes. Everyone in the room lowers their heads in respect, and the band plays a slow song on their instruments. As soon as they enter it doesn't take long for them to start conversing with the nobles. Accepting birthday wishes and giving thanks, Oliver is standing off in the corner watching closely, happy that his good friend is handling himself well. This is when Haydn's father, Emperor Terry, enters the banquet, wearing a black and red uniform with a blue cloak. All the nobles turn around in shock, covering their mouths and gasping in unison. Haydn is also shocked. He wasn't aware that his father would be attending. Of course he would attend the prince's banquet. It's his duty as a father to celebrate his son's birthday and growth. He is proud of how far Haydn has come. Haydn is speechless at this statement. The emperor joins him at the front of the room and starts giving a speech to everyone present. So many people have gathered here to celebrate the prince's birthday despite recent events in the kingdom. Looking at this scene right now makes Terry's heart both extremely happy and satisfied. For a parent, the growth of their child is both a miracle and a series of surprises. To see a small and tender child grow up into a decent adult is such an amazing and commendable thing to see. The emperor recalls an old memory from when Haydn was six years old. He was taking a walk one day and noticed that the prince was following his every step. When he asked Haydn why he was following, he told him it was because he had made a path. The grass was tall so it was hard for a child to go out on his own. However by following his father's footsteps Haydn was able to make it through. It's been a long time since that day, yet the prince has still followed the emperor all this time. Due to this Terry knows that his son is going to do well in the future. He raises a glass into the air, toasting the future of the empire and the future emperor, Prince Haydn. The nobles in the room follow his lead, also raising their glasses and giving their blessings. It's a wholesome moment and Terry takes a sip from the glass while wishing his son a happy birthday. Haydn doesn't know what to say, he thanks his father for the kind words. Suddenly the emperor goes weak and his glass drops to the floor. He coughs up blood and stains the carpet with various fluids. This is serious but Haydn doesn't know what to do, standing there with his mouth open like a statue. The nobles have a similar reaction and so does his daughter Princess Harry. It's the sword Lord Oliver who takes action, rushing over to see if his majesty is okay and what is wrong. But Terry is in bad shape and is continuing to cough up blood while on his knees. Haydn's glass falls from his hand at the sight of his father's condition. The bright sunny day turns to a bleak cloudy evening. Prince Ragnar is sitting alone in his room staring into nothingness as if in deep thought. A knock can be heard at his door, it's Oliver who is requesting to speak with him. Ragnar stands up allowing him to enter. He wants to know how his father is doing. He was able to survive because of the immediate action, but he is still in a critical condition. All the imperial doctors and alchemists are working on his treatment. 
Ragnar raises his voice. What about the criminal that tried to kill his father? Who was it that poisoned his drink at the banquet? Oliver lowers his head shamefully. The person that poisoned the drink was arrested at the scene and has confessed to their sins. Ragnar grabs a hold of him shaking forcefully. Who is it? What is their name? Oliver seems reluctant to reveal this information to Prince Ragnar, almost as if he is embarrassed. This is because the person who tried to assassinate the Emperor is his good friend and the Vice Commander of the Second Imperial Knights. Paul, a very important meeting is taking place discussing the situation. Paul pledged loyalty to the Imperial family for years, vowing to guard the Emperor. How could they let someone like this into the Knights? There's no way he did this all by himself, there has to be someone else involved. A man points at a map on the table. Vice Captain Paul was an orphan from the northern frontier. This is really close to the Coldwood Empire. If you think about it, it's suspicious. An orphan showing up with very little reputation and background but excellent swordsmanship. It's possible Paul is a highly trained spy from the Coldwood Empire. The men in the room bicker amongst themselves, all with their own theories about the reasoning behind this attack. This is what happens when you allow people into the Knights without investigating their origins and identities. They all agree that they should disband the Second Imperial Knights and deprive them of their knighthood. And the Vice Captain Paul will receive extreme punishment for attempting to poison the Emperor. Our protagonist Ian is at this meeting though he is strangely quiet. He knows something weird is going on and that Paul would never do something like that. He leaves the meeting and begins walking away into a nearby forest, where he meets with a figure wearing a cloak. It's Oliver who is curious as to what is happening with Paul. Ian explains to him that everyone thinks he is a spy from the Coldwood Empire. This is nonsense. Oliver knows that there is no way Paul is a spy. Ian believes so as well. He knows what kind of person Paul is. If it were for the sake of the royal family he was willing to lay down his own life. He was a knight who knows honor and is someone who respects the monarchy. None of this makes sense. However, a date for Paul's execution has been confirmed and there is no justification for attempting to assassinate the Emperor. Despite vigorous interrogation Paul has remained silent, not explaining why he did what he did. That's something that the two of them are going to have to find out themselves. Ian asks how the Emperor is doing. Oliver admits that he isn't doing so good. He hasn't been eating nor drinking and is refusing to let people visit his chamber. He seems to be blaming himself for the incident. The rest of the Second Division Imperial Knights are all on guard and are due to be interrogated soon to find out more. As the head of the Knights Oliver knows he won't be able to move recklessly when it comes to this matter. There are going to be a lot of eyes watching him. Therefore he begs for Ian's help, asking him to get to the bottom of this for him and prove Paul's innocence. He may not be innocent though. Magic was used when Paul confessed to his sins and no lies were detected. Ian is going to infiltrate the prison where he is being kept tonight to go and see Paul in person. Hopefully he can find out some answers. Afterwards he'll go straight to Oliver's house to fill him in. Oliver understands the plan in the two part ways. They exit their discreet meeting place in the forest. The daylight darkens as the night sky prepares to blossom. The bleak clouds part and downpours rain on the Empire's prison. Of course the guard is sleeping on the floor, because why wouldn't he be? Ian walks right by him and approaches the prison cell where Vice Captain Paul is being kept. He looks terrible, shirtless and chained to the wall, covered in cuts and bruises likely from interrogation. Ian enters and asks if Paul recognizes him. He doesn't believe that Paul was the one who tried to assassinate the Emperor. He knows he isn't an enemy or spy of the Empire. He knows this better than anyone else due to his past life. Paul is loyal and would go as far as sacrificing his own life to protect the crown. Ian doesn't understand why he had to do this. He places his hand on Paul's head and begins using his magic. He is going to be entering his memories now and apologizes for invading his privacy. Inside Paul's head Ian sees everything that happened the day he got infected with black magic. How he went to visit Danfell and the dragon Ian Avantis appeared out of nowhere. Before he could do anything it was too late and the black magic had taken over his body. Ian can't believe it. He was being manipulated by black magic this whole time. At this point a projection of Paul appears, wearing his knight uniform and without his bruises. He admits he was too naive. He knew the Imperial family has a lot of enemies and black magic was around. He shouldn't have let his guard down like that. Paul is also happy that Ian is here. He knew he wouldn't give up on him. Ian gets ready to leave Paul's mind. If he can hold on a little longer Ian can catch the black magician that did this. That's when Paul grabs a hold of our protagonist's arm, stopping him. Ian tries to tell him that he can fix everything now. If he finds the person behind the black magic he will be able to prove Paul's innocence. Paul doesn't want Ian putting himself in danger just for him though. Even if he does find this black magician it won't prove anything. 
In the end it was still Paul who poisoned the emperor's wine. Ian tries to urge him not to give up. If he dies down here he will be forever remembered as an assassin. However Paul doesn't mind. He caused the emperor a great deal of pain. Being remembered so terribly is a fitting punishment. No matter who this black magician is, if they are aiming for the emperor then they will most likely also be aiming for Prince Haydn. Paul tells Ian that he must stop this from happening. A smile appears on his face and he asks that Ian do one last thing for him. Tell Prince Haydn and Captain Oliver that he is sorry, and thank you. Ian is confused. All of this can be fixed if he just holds on a little longer. He begins to walk up to the projection of Paul, but the vice captain pushes him away. He is now leaving the safety of Prince Haydn in his hands. Ian stumbles backwards, and his vision of Paul slowly fades as he exits his memories. He finds himself back in the prison cell, staring right at Paul but he is no longer moving. Waving his hands around Ian desperately tries to dispel the vice captain of any black magic that may still be present but nothing happens. Ian panics, yelling at Paul to hang on a little longer. He's not going to let him die so easily. Unfortunately it seems like it is too late though. There is no movement from the prisoner and certainly no sound. Ian looks at the ground trying to process what just happened. Meanwhile, Oliver is sitting at his place listening to the sounds of a crackling fire and the rain drops pounding against the roof. These sounds are disturbed by someone coming to the door and Oliver immediately reaches for his sword. There is no need for it though as it is just Ian. Oliver opens the door so he can come inside. Ian seems visibly distressed. His tears are camouflaged by the heavy rain and his stare is vacant. Sir Paul Lance, vice captain of the second Imperial Knights has passed away while in prison. The sword lord is heartbroken upon hearing this, barely able to form a coherent sentence let alone believe what he is hearing. He stumbles backwards in shock, until he reaches a table that he can lean on to process this information. He first met Paul at a nursery supported by the Reedwood family in the northern border. He was always so cheerful and smiley, caring more about others than himself. Oliver's father discovered his talent for swordsmanship and decided to sponsor him. Since then Oliver and Paul grew up like brothers, together with their swords. He was a righteous man and worked harder than everyone else. For him to die like this is unfair. Ian begins to explain what he saw inside the vice captain's memories. He went to visit Damphil, the commander of the Royal Knights a few days ago. There was someone with Damphil who brainwashed Paul using black magic. Ian has never seen him before. He's a man with a pale face and long silver hair. It's someone that he doesn't even recognize from his past life. So Damphil is definitely involved in this, along with an unidentified high-ranking magician. Oliver wonders how strong this guy is. When Paul realized he was being attacked by dark magic he tried to stop it immediately but it didn't work. That means this magician is of an even higher class than Ian. He has a feeling of who the person might be but he isn't sure. And the number of dark magicians who are cooperating with them is also unknown. A more thorough investigation is needed. Oliver doesn't like the sound of this. If this magician is stronger than Ian then it is dangerous. What if Ian gets caught under the influence of black magic? The empire will bathe in blood. Ian reaches into his pocket and pulls out the necklace that Oliver gave him many years ago. He gave it so Ian would train with him. It originally belonged to the former empress and the magic inside is said to keep one's head clear, but it isn't that simple. A very rare jewel made with dragon's tear is studded inside the pendant. Thanks to that, this necklace has an anti-magic spell that can absorb dark magic. Oliver is relieved to hear this. With the necklace he should be safe from getting caught under anyone's spell. The two continue their conversation inside of Oliver's house, although it is unclear what they are saying. It seems to be important though as Oliver has a look of fear and disbelief. Whatever words are coming out of their mouths are drowned out by the storm roaring outside. This storm pounds down onto the Imperial Palace. Meanwhile, Prince Ragnar is sitting inside his room and is greeted by Damphil, who informs him that Paul has passed away inside his cell. However, a rat had come into his cell. If it was Ian then he must have noticed that Paul was under the influence of black magic. Ragnar believes it was him, though he won't be able to do anything about it. Ian still hasn't noticed the existence of the dragon Ian Avantis, and he is probably too preoccupied with trying not to get caught in black magic. Herbert's 5th class magic was no match for Ian who was 6th class, but Avantis is a much higher class than that. If he was human he would probably be an 8th class master. His powers have not fully recovered because of the seal but he is still stronger than Ian Page. Ian must at least recognize that he isn't the strongest magician around so Ragnar isn't worried. Damphil assumes that our protagonist will just leave everything and run away. Ragnar laughs at this comment. He wouldn't do that. If he was that dumb he wouldn't be giving them such a hard time. Actually, he doesn't have a clue what Ian is thinking. 
Since he entered the palace six years ago he has become Prince Haydn's close companion. However Ragnar remembers not long ago when Ian told him he does not serve Prince Haydn. Ragnar has been hiding it, but sometimes it feels as though Ian is looking right through him. It's almost as if he has known him for a long time, and he knows more about Ragnar than even he knows of himself. Prince Ragnar scratches his chin. It would be best if they just observe Ian for now, that way they can see how he is going to react. It's a new day and the sky has cleared. Though the situation hasn't improved in the slightest and Ian is preparing for the worst. He has sent a letter to Lord Marcus of the Mavrian territory and has a second letter that needs to be sent to Lord Cullion of the Pyrrhic estate. It's time they honored their thousand-year pacts. Ian's butler informs him that he has sent a trusted deliverman to take the letter to Lord Marcus and he will send the letter to Lord Cullion as soon as possible. Ian hands him a piece of paper. It's a gate pass that has been issued under the name of the Merchant Guild. Using this the butler can pretend to be a merchant and leave the capital. Ian orders him to pack the rest of the luggage and leave when the sun begins to set. He should take all of the mansion's servants along with his mother and head for the Mogrian territory in the north. The butler understands his orders and will do just that. Someone bursts into the room calling out Ian's name. It's his mother who wants to know what's going on. Why are they leaving all of a sudden? Ian can't tell her the exact details but the capital is in danger. He's already sent a letter to Lord Marcus and he will help to keep her safe. However Vanessa doesn't want to leave her son behind. If he is going to stay here then she wants to stay here too. She shouldn't worry. Ian assures her he is all grown up now. Besides he is a magician that can easily protect himself. He might be 18 years old but he is still Vanessa's only little son. She hates that he is always involving himself in dangerous work. She can't stand watching him put himself in danger. Ian gets frustrated and yells out at her to get her to stop talking for a second. He's begging her to just listen to him this once. If he does something wrong it could put Vanessa in danger and he doesn't want that. He turns to the alchemist Ledio. He is leaving his mother in his hands. He trusts him to take her to a safe location and to never reveal that place to anyone. When the time comes he will send a letter through Lord Marcus. Ledio understands his orders and the role he must play. That's when his son Douglas speaks up. He would like to stay in the capital with Ian, perhaps he could be of help. Ian is grateful for the offer but it is much more dangerous than Douglas realizes. It would be better if he went with his father. Ian is going to use his magic to erase a few of his memories after everyone has left. This way even he won't know where they have all gone. This is the only way he can ensure their safety while black magic is about. Ian's family are pushed out of the mansion by the maids and servants. Vanessa gets one last look at her son before departing. They leave him there all alone as he prepares for whatever is going to come next. On his desk next to him is the necklace that can absorb dark magic. And in his pocket is a pink elixir in a glass bottle. These are both going to play a crucial role in his plan. The scene cuts to Prince Ragnar and an informant is telling him about the Emperor's condition. His body is weak but he is no longer in a critical condition due to healing medicine. Though he has regained consciousness it seems that even if he were to wake up, his insides are already in a poor state, and he will suffer from after effects. Ragnar is surprised to hear he has been hanging on this long. It will be troublesome if his father's condition improves. Damphil offers to call the palace's alchemist then just in case, it's best to prepare for the worst. Things are going well. Public opinion on Prince Haydn is apathetic. The second palace knights are all on probation as they are being inspected. And the parliament is currently discussing whether the head of the knights, the sword lord Oliver, should be stripped of his title. Avanta sits on a nearby chair, explaining that everything is going smoothly. All they need to do is wait patiently and Ragnar will be sitting on the throne in no time. Ragnar agrees but he finds it suspicious that Ian isn't doing anything. There is no way he would just watch this whole situation quietly. At this moment someone in a red cloak enters the room in a hurry, angering everyone inside who asked for privacy. The guy in the red cloak is sorry but he needed to inform them that Ian is currently approaching the palace. Due to this Ragnar thinks it would be best if they end this meeting here for today. He asks that Avantis hide himself, but that he remains in the room to listen in on the conversation. Avantis understands. As they are talking Ian approaches Prince Ragnar's door. They are long overdue a conversation. He enters the room and Ragnar explains how it has been a while. The last time they spoke was after Herbert's execution. There has been a lot of unfortunate things that have happened since then. Ragnar still can't believe such a thing happened to his father. He can't even meet him when he is in such a state. It's torture. So why, at a time like this, has Ian come to speak to him? He's here to find out what Ragnar is up to. He knows Paul was under the influence of black magic and that it has something to do with Damphil. He is also pretty certain that the Dragon Order is somehow involved in all of this. Ian confronts Prince Ragnar. 
claiming that everything that has happened is all part of his plan to become the new emperor. Ragnar acts like he hasn't got a clue what our protagonist is talking about. This is all just slander. After all, if Paul was under the influence of black magic when he tried to kill the emperor, then isn't that Ian's fault, since Ian was the one responsible for investigating the black magic in the first place. And as for the Dragon Order, Ragnar has never even heard of them. How can he conspire with a group whose existence he isn't even aware of? Besides, he has been trapped inside his room all this time being watched closely. He hasn't even been able to step foot out of the Imperial Palace. Ian watches the prince closely as he spouts his lies. Eventually he looks up revealing that he has been using interrogation magic to detect for lies. He knows that everything Ragnar just said wasn't the truth. He really is in contact with the Dragon Order and has entered a pact with some kind of black magic user. Ragnar crosses his arms. Is that really the conclusion Ian has reached? He's more stupid than Ragnar thought. There is nothing Ian can do. Ragnar isn't going to confess to anything and isn't intimidated in the slightest. There is no evidence against him. Vice Captain Paul died because he tried to poison the Emperor. There are no lies in that statement and even with magic Ian can't prove otherwise. But even so Ian still came all the way over here making accusations. Ragnar calls him a fool. This is when Avantis reveals himself. He finds Ian interesting. The fact that he was able to figure everything out like that. Ian turns around, recognizing Avantis from Paul's memories, but it is too late. The black magic has got a hold of him and strangles his body. Avantis approaches, he recognizes the robe that our protagonist is wearing. It belonged to the famous magician Mitchell Greenriver who he fought against 300 years ago. To think he would see it again. Ragnar speaks up, he wants Ian kept alive and would like to use him as his pawn. Avantis understands and snaps his fingers, causing the black magic to strangle Ian tighter, he struggles through the pain. Eventually the process stops and the pain subsides. Ian has a vacant expression and a motionless body. The prince looks over, wondering if it is finished. He doesn't look any different. Ivantis tells the prince not to doubt him. He looks at Ian directly, ordering him to self-delete. Our protagonist follows his orders like a puppet, summoning a sharp ice crystal out of nowhere and aiming straight for his neck. At the last second Ragnar yells out for him to stop. That's enough. He is sorry he doubted the Dragonian's power. He yelled stop at just the right time, any longer and Ian would have been pierced like a kebab. Avantis leaves the room. Ian is now the prince's to control and do with as he pleases. Now the dragon Ian is going to take a rest. He vanishes from the room in a cloud of black mist, leaving our protagonist and the prince alone together. Ragnar turns to Ian to test if the magic worked. He asks him which monarch does he truly serve. Falling to his knees, Ian reveals that he serves the fifth prince, Ragnar Greenriver, the person who will rise to the top of this empire. A sinister look appears on the prince's face. His plan actually worked and he now has a sixth-class magician as his very own servant. Sometime later, Haydn is sitting in his room in deep thought, still worried about his father and everything that has happened as of late. His butler enters, informing him that there is an assembly taking place this afternoon and that he should prepare for it. Haydn holds his head. He's heard that this assembly is one that Ian called for specifically as the Tower Master. He doesn't want Ian to see him in his current state. It has been a long time since they last spoke. He asks his butler to please help him get ready and dressed up today. He doesn't want Ian to see him in a mess. Everyone is gathering in the palace for this assembly and are talking amongst themselves. This is the first assembly that the Ivory Tower Master has ever called for, and for some reason he's asked that both Prince Haydn and Prince Ragnar attend. Everyone assumes he is going to be talking about the elephant in the room, which of the two of them will ascend the throne. Though Ian has been supporting Prince Haydn this whole time rumors have begun to circulate around. Apparently Ian met with Prince Ragnar secretly in his room. There's a chance he may have had a change of heart. Prince Haydn bursts through the door, looking a lot cleaner than he did earlier. He immediately approaches Ian. It's been a long time and he hopes he is doing well. Haydn extends his arm out. He's missed his friend. And if it's okay with Ian he would like to meet with him after the assembly. Ian abruptly slaps his hand away, shocking the prince. There are other things he has to attend to after the assembly so he won't be able to. Ian seems to be acting unusual. Haydn awkwardly scratches his neck. Perhaps they could meet up after he is done with whatever he has to do then. Ian just walks away to enter the main hall though, leaving Haydn standing all alone, wondering what on earth is going on. Ian begins his speech to the assembly that has gathered. He thanks all the respected members of the Elder Council and the nobles for coming, as they are aware the Empire has experienced a great tragedy. Due to the assassination attempt on the Emperor he has barely been able to regain consciousness even after 15 days. Even if he does recover there is no guarantee that he will be able to perform his duties like he used to. 
The time has come to make a choice and everyone in the room knows it. The pillar of the empire has fallen and it is in a critical state. The enemies at the borders are now looking down at them. When the empire's future is in such an unstable state, they need to be able to look calmly at the reality and make a choice. To choose who should be the rightful ruler of the empire. Just looking good on the outside won't be what will save the empire. What is needed is a leader who can bring them out of this crisis and bring back stability. Someone who is able to ease the political situation between the three empires and someone who is able to make the Green River Empire the greatest empire in history. That's the person who should be allowed to wear the crown. Which is why Ian Page, the Ivory Tower Master, has arranged this assembly to declare that he is supporting the Great Emperor's own blood, the Fifth Prince Ragnar. The assembly bursts into an uproar, everyone whispers amongst themselves and gasps. Yet Ragnar sits calmly with his arms crossed and a smile on his face. Prince Haydn rises from his seat yelling at Ian for betraying him. The nobles try to get him to calm down but he doesn't. He aggressively grabs a hold of Ian. How could he do this to him? He gets so angry that he strikes our protagonist with a well-deserved punch right to the cheek. Ian falls to the floor with a bruised face, his expression is emotionless and he seems unbothered. Whereas Haydn is shaking from anger, his fists are clenched tightly and he is being dragged out of the assembly by the nobles. He thought they were supposed to be friends. That night Prince Haydn is in his room alone, laying on his bed and staring at the ceiling, still unable to believe what happened earlier today. A shadowy figure appears at his window, it's the Sword Lord Oliver. Haydn is surprised to see him here, he is supposed to be at his home under investigation. Oliver pushes past the prince and enters his room, there's no time to explain. He orders the prince to dress warmly as they will be leaving right away. There is a path behind the palace that they can take without surveillance. It's a secret pathway used only for emergencies. Oliver approaches Haydn and wraps him in a blue robe. All the knights of the second palace are on standby outside. Haydn doesn't know what to say. Oliver gets on his knee and holds out his hand, expressing that it is important that they leave the palace tonight. Haydn takes a moment to think about it. He trusts Oliver with his life and is willing to do what he says. He takes the Sword Lord's hand and the two prepare to escape. Wearing cloaks they begin walking through the night, hidden by the dense greenery of the forests. They meet with the second Imperial Knights who have been waiting patiently, all wearing their own cloaks. They all rush over to the prince giving him a hug, they have missed him so much. Haydn asks for an explanation of what's happening. Why is everyone gathered here and how did they get away? The Imperial Palace and the capital is no longer safe, that's why from now on Oliver and the Second Division Imperial Knights are going to take care of Haydn. The plan is to take him to Lord Cullion in the Pyrrhic Estate. Oliver will tell him more details on the way but for now they must leave. Prince Haydn stops them, they can't go around disobeying orders like this. It could end up with their titles being deprived or even execution for treason. The knights are not disobeying orders though. Oliver informs the prince that when they became knights they were given only one order, to protect Prince Haydn no matter what. No matter how strong the enemy is their mission remains the same. They are going to fight, and they are going to protect him. Haydn can barely contain himself at this show of affection and loyalty. Despite being denied the throne his guards still stand by his side. He agrees to leave the capital with them, just as long as Oliver explains to him what is happening properly while they travel. That night he disappears and it doesn't take long for everyone else to realize. Damful rushes into Ragnar's room. Prince Haydn disappeared at dawn and so did the 2nd Division Imperial Knights. They were armed. According to witnesses they are heading east and a group has been sent to chase after them. Damful is planning to send even more troops later. Ragnar tells him to forget about it. There's no need to send more troops. If they are heading east then they are heading to the Pyrrhic Estate. The path to the Pyrrhic estate is rough and is infested with monsters so going after them won't be easy. They have Oliver and a bunch of elite knights with them so they should be fine. Chasing after them will only lead to the Empire losing valuable soldiers. Prince Haydn isn't the priority right now. What's important is locating the whereabouts of Ian's mother, Vanessa. Ragnar looks over to our protagonist who is in the room with them. That cunning magician. He hid his mother in case of black magic and he's not opening his mouth about where he hid her. It seems like he erased all his memories. Ian remains silent and looks at the floor. Damful respectfully asks why he is even bothering to search for Vanessa. Surely she isn't important. Ragnar explains that our protagonist's weakness is his mother. It's weird that Ian came to him willingly, likely knowing he would end up infected by black magic. Ragnar doesn't like the situation and thinks that Ian has something planned. If they can find Ian's mother it will give them an advantage in the future if something happens. Damphil understands and lowers his head with his hand on heart before leaving the room. Ragnar is left alone alongside Ian. 
Everything is going so smoothly that he is starting to feel anxious. He looks over to our protagonist who is now just an obedient puppet. Ragnar wonders what he could be planning. There's no way he would just let something like this happen without preparations. A few days later Prince Haydn and Oliver arrive at the Pyrrhic estate. They are greeted by Lord Kellyan, the redhead with a scar on his cheek. He's honored to have the prince in his territory. He was actually quite shocked when he got Ian's letter informing him of everything that has been happening. He wishes the Emperor Terry a speedy recovery. And as Ian requested the Pyrrhic family of the East will take care of Prince Haydn. He asks that Haydn makes himself comfortable here and then walks away with his commander by his side. Haydn is impressed by Kalyan. He seems like a good person with a manly side and an open-minded personality. The commander also seemed nice. The commander is actually Oliver's distant cousin. He taught him swordsmanship when he was younger. The prince smiles, seeing that our protagonist really calculated and planned all of this to happen. He starts to wonder if Ian is even infected by black magic at all. Though he is still upset that his throne was taken from him. Ragnar has always been better than Haydn at everything since they were younger, although it's frustrating it's the truth. There's a possibility that Ian is really on his side. Oliver assures Haydn that that is nonsense. Ian would never choose Ragnar over him willingly. In fact, Oliver remembers many years ago when he spoke to Ian on the balcony of an event. He said with his own words that he would never support Prince Ragnar. There is nothing to worry about and Haydn should just trust Ian. He definitely has a plan. We get a flashback to the night that Paul died, when Oliver and Ian were talking amongst each other. Ian informed Oliver that he was going to visit Ragnar's room, and that he would most likely be infected with black magic. Oliver tried to warn him that it would be too dangerous but Ian didn't care. He knew that Ragnar wouldn't kill him straight away, and would most likely use his status as the ivory tower master to get to the throne. Ian wasn't thrilled about being under the control of Ragnar. However, he knew that if he did then he would be able to get insider information about his plans. This is where he asked Oliver to take Haydn over to the Pyrrhic estate. Although dangerous, Oliver knew this was a good plan. But if Ian was going to get himself infected by black magic then they would need someone to free him. There is no one in the palace that they can trust anymore. Ian smiled, there is one person who can free him. A person who not even Ragnar would expect, a strong comrade that they can rely on. The scene cuts to Princess Harry back in the present. She is sitting beside her father who is unconscious laying in bed. Despite this she still tells him everything that has been going on while he has been away from the throne. Ian made a statement that he supports Prince Ragnar and Haydn has fled from the palace. Soon Ragnar will have the crown for himself and she doesn't know what to do. Harry begins crying at her father's side. She feels like there is no one who she can trust anymore. She can't believe Ian would betray her and her brother like that. All the gentle sides of himself that he showed her were all lies. Even still, a part of her heart wants to trust him and it aches so much. She begs for her father to please wake up. She doesn't know what to do. A knock can be heard at the door. It's the magician Kevin. Princess Harry dries her eyes. He can enter now. Kevin seems nervous and checks his surroundings carefully. Harry wonders what is going on. The magician pulls a box out of his robe, asking the princess to take it. A few days ago the tower master ordered him to safeguard it. He told Kevin to hand it over to the princess. Harry grabs a hold of the box. Did Ian really want to give this to her? Kevin urges her to stay quiet. No one must know that he has given it to her. Kevin leaves the room and Princess Harry stands with the box in hand. She looks down at it. What could it be? And why would Ian give it to her so secretively? Harry sits down at a nearby table and takes a look inside. Inside is the necklace, pink elixir, and a paper letter. First she takes out the letter and begins to read it. It states, Your Highness, I know you must have been very surprised. If you are reading this then I will have already become a different person through black magic. The reason I'm writing this letter is to ask Her Highness for help. The Emperor's poisoning case was not done voluntarily by the Vice Captain Paul. It was sorcery done through black magic. The culprits of this incident are a secret organization called the Order of the Dragon. Within the organization is a very powerful high-ranking black magician. Prince Ragnar has been cooperating with them to try and take over the throne. I wish to find the real culprit who tried to assassinate the emperor and uncover the truth. I will become the puppet of Prince Ragnar. The necklace inside this box is an item left by the deceased empress. It contains an anti-magic even greater than 8th class, something that can even dispel black magic. If you are reading this letter please put this necklace on me. The anti-magic inside this necklace should dispel the black magic. The liquid packed with it is a potion made out of a special herb called Randir's flower. It has an effect of neutralizing mana inside the body and is also a critical poison that can cause a magician's death. 
if by chance the black magic can't be dispelled by the necklace. Please kill me. Harry looks at the potion and necklace, finally realizing what is going on. She immediately goes to find Ian who is by Ragnar's side. They are on their way to visit the Emperor. After all he is Ragnar's father too. It's only right that he does his duty as a son. Harry agrees, asking Ragnar if it's okay if she speaks with Ian while he is visiting the Emperor. It's okay, as long as Ian comes right back to him after they have finished talking. Ragnar walks away and leaves the two of them. Harry takes our protagonist into a nearby room and closes the door to give them some privacy. She slowly approaches Ian being extremely vague. She has the item that he gifted to her and she would like to return it. If he can just lower his head for a moment. Ian does as the princess says and she places the necklace over his neck, hoping that it will work. For a moment there is a pause, until the necklace activates and glows blue. Ian falls onto his knees and the black magic is forced out of his body. It's a painful process though, causing him to even cough up some blood. Eventually the pain begins to calm down and Ian regains his breath. The princess leans in while shaking, wondering if he is okay. Our protagonist looks up while clutching his chest. It seems like the necklace worked and he is back to his old self again. Tears stream down Harry's face and she pounces forward, hugging him tightly. How could he do something so dangerous and foolish? Ian is just happy that the princess trusted him and came to save him. If he's being honest he was only half sure whether the magic in the necklace would work or not. Harry yells at him. The magic wasn't even properly confirmed yet he still risked his life like that. Our protagonist just smiles subtly, taking risks like that are often the types of things that lead to miracles. Stabbing himself with the time dagger in his previous life was a huge risk, yet it paid off and now he has this wonderful second chance. He dries Princess Harry's eyes, thanking her for believing in him. She is just happy that he is back. There is so much she wants to ask, like what did he find out while by Ragnar's side? It turns out the Dragon's Order is a bigger force than Ian had first imagined. The previous Ivory Tower Master, Herbert, was an executive for the Order, and a bunch of high nobles were high-ranking members. Damphil, who has served the Emperor for decades is also part of the conspiracy. The religious leader of the Dragon Order is said to be a Dragonian, which were believed to have gone extinct 300 years ago. He can change into human form and can use 8th class magic. He was sealed in a prison until Ragnar released him and the two of them have been working together. This information shocks Harry, who can't believe her brother would do such a dangerous and reckless thing. Ian assumes that it must be something he has been planning for a long time. The Dragon Order's ultimate goal isn't just taking the throne. They wish to start a war with the Empire's armed forces to conquer the lands. Ragnar has already taken over the royal palace. It's not safe here anymore and Ian advises the princess to be careful. She shouldn't trust anyone and should stay by the Emperor's side. As for Ian he is going to continue the act of being infected by black magic so that he can stay by Ragnar's side. 300 years ago Mitchell Greenriver managed to get rid of the Dragonians, and Ian plans on finding out what method he used to do this. The princess thinks for a moment, there is something she has that might help, she asks that Ian follow her. They go to the princess's room where she goes up to her desk and finds something. It's a red book with a golden seal a treasure of the royal family that her father gifted her. It's a relic that was left behind by the first magician of the royal family, Mitchell Greenriver. It's assumed to be his journal though no one is sure as they haven't been able to open its seal. According to records, Mitchell was a fifth-class magician. However the seal seems to be made with a magic of a higher class. Ian takes the book thinking that perhaps he will be able to get it open. He injects it with mana to try and read its techniques. That's when he sees that for some reason the book is sealed with a dragon tongue spell. Ian mutters the spell that appears and the book opens. Our protagonist seems worried, but Harry is curious to see what's inside. It really is Mitchell's journal. The first entry was written right after the war with the dragon Ian's ended. It's about the memorial for the deceased magicians and knights of the empire, and plans to leave the destroyed lands to build a new ivory tower. Ian spots something particularly unusual. His father's name, Fran, is written inside the book. Curious, Ian reads the next few lines word for word. It states, That night, Fran came to find me. I knew from a feeling that I would not be able to see him anymore. I swore to keep the promise I made with him until my death. I leave in this journal his last words in dragon tongue. Upon saying the dragon tongue words written in the journal Ian's surroundings begin to change. All the color has been zapped from the world, leaving it a monotone black and white. Everything is statuesque, including the princess who is no longer moving. The look of worry that has been on Ian's face this whole time grows stronger. It seems like time has completely stopped. On the other side of the room is a door with a golden glow shining from it. With few other options our protagonist decides to walk through it. 
On the other side of the door is an open field with a singular rock. Upon the rock is sitting a cloaked man. Ian calls out to him and he slowly turns around. His features are hidden but there are hints of blonde hair and facial stubble. Our protagonist asks this mysterious person, where is this place and who are you? This place is the record of time, a place beyond dimensions. It's hard to explain it in human terms but the man tries to put it simply. This place preserves all the time from the dimension Ian is from. As for his identity the man goes by different names. The humans either call him the first magician or the golden dragon. Ian is shocked at this information the golden dragon that exists only in legends, and the first magician recorded in history is the one who developed magic. They are both the same person. Since Ian has found this place the man knows that Mitchell must have made a grave mistake. He didn't think that he would let that dragon Ian Avantis live. The man didn't understand why Mitchell kept him sealed in Ian's dimension. Perhaps it was sympathy or vengeance. Human emotions are incredibly complicated yet detailed. This man and Mitchell Greenriver were very close. In fact, he was the one who gave Mitchell the power to exterminate the dragons. All of this is a lot for Ian to take in. If it is true then why isn't the man in any of the war records? The first magician and golden dragon begins explaining. A long time ago humans suffered from black magic. The power of the dragon was a power that could be used to conquer all things. However, an unholy power was created by adapting it, and thus black magic was born. The black magic created by the Dragonians was as greedy as its origins. It corrupted the human soul and destroyed the balance of the world. As a result disaster was repeated constantly, and the Golden Dragon witnessed countless humans suffering. Yet he was unable to interfere. Dragons don't intervene in the human world. This is a rule that has existed from the time this world was created. The Golden Dragon didn't want to stay put though. After all black magic originated from the power of the dragon. So he broke the rules and meddled with human history. When a big disaster comes, humans fall, and they need a hero to lift them back up. So to fight against black magic the golden dragon shared his powers with Mitchell Greenriver. He was a wise and compassionate kid, even with him being royalty. He was a child who always put the people first over authority. Mitchell spent his whole life trying to get rid of black magic. However leaving Avantis alive was a single mistake that has made all his efforts go to vain. As for the golden dragon, he lost his memories as a price of intervening with the human world. And so the dragon sealed all the time he had left in the body of a human. With no memories of anything, he went around the world to wherever his feet took him to. That was when he met a girl too. She was an honest and lovely person. And the time they spent together was the most beautiful the dragon had experienced in a long time. Her name was Vanessa. The golden dragon removes his hood and shows his face. Looking at Ian he says he has missed him. He has missed his son. Ian grits his teeth and shakes, demanding that this guy not speak nonsense. His father died a long time ago. The man agrees. His father, Fran Page, is in fact dead. He is just the soul that left his body and has been waiting in this place, waiting to meet Ian. Our protagonist snaps. If he is really the soul of Fran then why did he leave him as a child? Does he know how much heartbreak he caused? The golden dragon is ashamed. The more time he spent in his human body the more his memories started to return. He realized that he needed to get rid of the black magic that was plaguing the world. It was the only way to protect his wife Vanessa and son Ian. The time he had as a human was too short, so it was inevitable for him to leave his family. The golden dragon is sad to hear that his son is having a hard time in this life and hopes that he can find happiness. Ian doesn't know what to say. He didn't come here for a father-son reunion. The golden dragon knows this already. The reason he is here is to find a power that can help him get rid of the dragon Ian Avantis. The power Ian is looking for is already inside of him. The golden dragon left that power behind when he abandoned the family. That's why Ian is able to read and understand the dragon language. It's not because he is a high-ranking magician, but because of the power of his father, the golden dragon. The golden dragon approaches Ian with his arms stretched out. He will awaken the power inside of him. However first he wants to take a look at Ian's soul, the life that Ian really wants, which even Ian himself isn't aware of. Suddenly Ian wakes up leaning against a tree wearing formal clothing. He stands up confused and takes the blanket off of him. He was with Fran just a moment ago, where could he be now? In front of him is a blonde woman and a young child playing in the grass. It's a sunny day and the flowers are in bloom. The woman is Princess Harry and she is happy that Ian is finally awake. Seriously, they barely made time to go and have fun together as a family and he is taking a nap. Harry scolds Ian for being too busy recently. She's going to speak to her brother to get him to stop overworking him. Ian has no idea what's going on. He addresses Harry as your highness, confused about this whole situation. Harry bursts out into laughter, assuming that Ian must still be half asleep. 
He hasn't called her that in a long time. She calls out to the little girl in the field playing. Daddy is awake and she should come over and hug him. The girl turns around with big blue eyes and a bright smile. Her name is Johanna. Ian stands perfectly still like a statue while Johanna runs up to him and wraps her arms around his legs tightly. Harry looks at our protagonist, asking why he is just standing there. She encourages him to hug his daughter. Ian looks down at the girl who is looking back at him. He picks her up and takes a moment to try and process things. At first he is just thinking about how weird this is, until the little girl gently utters the words, Papa. This causes Ian's eyes to water and he squeezes his daughter a little tighter. It's a beautiful life. He has a daughter and a loving wife. The spring sun shines down on them and the air is rife with peace. All of a sudden the child vanishes from his arms and he finds himself back in the place where he was originally. Fran asks Ian what he saw in his vision. There was a small girl with the same hair color and eye color as his. Her name was Johanna. That small girl's weight, temperature, voice, and smell when Ian hugged her. It made him feel warm inside. Just what was that? His father explains that this is love. An incredibly simple word, and yet a strong power that motivates humans. They dedicate themselves for the ones they love and fight to protect them. This gives them the courage to live on. It seems like what Ian wishes for the most is just a normal life. Ian thinks about what he saw. It was too peaceful and beautiful for someone to dream of. Is what he saw the future. Fran tells him that it may or may not be. It all depends on the choices Ian makes. It seems like it is time for our protagonist to go back to the real world. Fran approaches his son and places his hand on his head. He's going to awaken the dragon's authority that resides inside of Ian. With this power he asks that Ian put an end to what he couldn't finish himself. After this power has been awakened all of Fran's memories appear inside of Ian's head. He looks at his son as he says goodbye. He has always been with him and will love him forever. Ian sees a specific memory of Franz. When Vanessa was pregnant with Ian and the two were deeply in love. This is the last thing he sees until he is teleported back to the present in the real world. Standing next to Princess Harry reading from the journal. He clutches his chest and tears build up in his eyes. His heart is aching. It's a feeling he has never felt before. When the princess asks him what's wrong Ian pulls himself together. He is fine and has just got something in his eye. He looks back down at the journal and notices that all the dragon language that was written on there previously has disappeared. He turns to Harry, asking her if she remembers what was written there. But she doesn't know what he's talking about. That page has always been blank. Ian stares in deep thought for a moment until the silence is broken by the princess, asking if he found a method to defeat the dragon Ian. When Ian says that he did the princess grabs a hold of his hand in excitement. That's great news. Ian awkwardly blushes and struggles to maintain eye contact. It's time that he finally ends his battle with Ragnar. He asks that the princess stay by the emperor's side. Harry looks at him, is there nothing she can help with? Ian assures her he is going to be fine. He's going to put an end to everything and return. She still hasn't let go of his hand even though Ian is trying to leave. She wants him to promise that he will return. He will, no matter what. The scene cuts to a lengthy flashback of Ian's previous life. He has been fighting wars alongside the Emperor Ragnar for too long and he has decided to leave. A high-class magician named Ronan tries to convince him to stay. Even if the three empires unite after the war the fighting won't ever stop. The Green River Empire needs its 8th class magician. Ronan isn't just going to let Ian throw everything away. And there is no way Emperor Ragnar will let him just leave. Ian turns around. Even if Ragnar doesn't approve of it he is still going to leave. He has finished all of his preparations and Ronan is more than capable of taking over as the new Ivory Tower master. Ian no longer sees himself as a respected 8th class magician, but instead he is just a monster. He walks away, heading towards the throne room to see Ragnar, leaving Ronan alone. After reading the letter Ian sent Ragnar isn't happy. Why is he leaving so suddenly? After they have fought so many wars together and been by each other's side for years, Ragnar understands if he needs some rest. He can allow Ian to go away for a few months or even years. However, he asks that our protagonist return to the Empire at some point in the future. Ian falls to his knees. He won't be returning no matter what and is leaving for good. His existence is no longer of any help to the continent's future. He wants to return to his hometown and separate himself from magic. This way he can repent for all the wrongdoings he has done. Ragnar angrily rises, he won't allow such a thing. Repenting is something that only a loser does. Ian has contributed more than anyone to this empire, and should be proud of his actions. He tells him to just forget about such trivial things. Ian can't forget though, all the lives he took and all the blood that was shed by his own hands. He can't bear to even look at himself anymore, 
He has become a monster. Ian begs on his knees, asking Ragnar is not only his emperor, but is a long-time friend. Please allow me to go and live the rest of my days in peace. Ragnar can't believe that after all this time he is just going to leave because he feels guilty. He walks away leaving Ian alone. He had no idea their friendship would end like this. Ian just cries. He is sorry but this is the way it has to be. When the nobles heard of Ian's departure they were not happy. The Coldwood Empire is still acting up and if word gets out Ian has left they will appear weak. There is also a possibility that Ian will join hands with the rebel forces. If that happens the Green River Empire will surely fall. The nobles put a lot of pressure on Emperor Ragnar to kill his friend Ian. He's too dangerous and if he doesn't want to fight for the Empire anymore then he should be taken out. This pressure caused Ragnar a lot of stress to the point where he could no longer sleep. Not only was he the Emperor currently at war, but the nobles were all planting seeds of doubt in his mind of Ian's loyalty. He called his personal alchemist to his bed chambers, Douglas. He still can't sleep and it's getting worse. He needs stronger medicine. Douglas informs him that the medicine he is taking has addictive side effects. If he takes any more it could harm his health. If the Emperor really wants to sleep again then he should deal with the source of his problem. Ragnar laughs at the ridiculousness of that. This isn't something he can just solve. He's scared that his friend will leave him and that he will betray the Empire. He can trust Ian when he's by his side. But now that he is leaving he just seems like a dangerous monster. This is when Douglas suggests that Ragnar kill Ian. If he is truly a monster then he should be put down. Ragnar looks at his alchemist with serious eyes. Is he really suggesting he kills his longtime friend? Douglas knows how this sounds, but if Ian is causing his highness to feel so uneasy, can he even be called a friend? Ragnar holds his pounding head. Ian is an 8th class magician, there isn't any way to kill him. Even if all the magicians at the ivory tower worked together they would fail. Douglas speaks up, he knows how to make a potion that can poison Ian. All the emperor needs to do is say the word. Many nights later Emperor Ragnar decided to pay Ian a visit at his cabin. The fire is crackling and Ian is peacefully reading a book when someone knocks at his door. He is surprised to see Ragnar all the way out here at an hour like this. It's been a while since they last met, even if Ian has stepped down and left. It's normal for Ragnar to want to visit a friend. He looks at Ian with a smile on his face while holding a bottle of wine in his hands. May he come in so they can catch up. Ian gestures inside, his good friend is always welcome here. He is surprised that Ragnar bought wine. He's not usually the type of person to drink. Ragnar admits that's true, although it's not bad to have a drink occasionally. He suddenly got curious about his friend and wanted to see how he was doing. He holds out a glass of wine for Ian to take. Ian accepts and the two sit opposite each other. The Emperor comments on how much happier Ian seems since he has left the capital. Ian has been traveling a lot, going wherever his feet takes him. During this time he saw the lives of many people and it was a really meaningful time. He's learned many things since returning to his hometown. Unfortunately there isn't much he is good at other than magic. He's thinking of gardening once winter has passed and the snow melts. The current life of the former tower master seems to be a simple one. As long as Ian is happy Ragnar is satisfied. A lot of things have happened since his departure. Ragnar explains that they have suppressed the rebellion in the Coldwood Empire and they are now a step closer to peace. One of the princes will also marry the daughter of Count Bernard, a member of the royal family of the Principality of Roe. With all of this the three empires will be one step closer to becoming whole. Ian clutches his chest. Something strange is happening to his body after drinking the wine. He collapses to the floor in pain but Ragnar doesn't stop speaking. The ivory tower has been doing worse since Ian left. However the palace is helping out to keep it going. Areas that have been damaged from the war are being repaired quickly and soon peace will be achieved. Ragnar looks down at our protagonist who is dying on the floor. All that is left is for Ian to disappear. Ian coughs up blood, keeled over in pain. It's a poison that neutralizes the mana inside a magician's blood vessels. Just to be sure it would work Ragnar mixed it with some other potions. Ian only has one question, why? Why would his friend betray him like this? Ragnar admits that it is because of Ian's power. If it was wartime it would be different, but right now his power only brings unease to everyone in the empire. If he had stayed by Ragnar's side then none of this would have happened, but he just had to leave. Not only is the empire fearful of Ian's powers, Ragnar reluctantly reveals that he is too. He's afraid of his own friend, a powerful 8th class magician who could steal the entire empire from Ragnar at any time. There's no way that he could let such a monster live, it would be too risky. Ian tears up at this betrayal. This is really how his life is going to end. Before exiting the cabin Ragnar looks at his old friend and tells him one last thing. Please don't forgive me. 
He leaves, telling his knights to light the cabin on fire on his way out. It doesn't take long for it to become engulfed in roaring flames with Ian still inside. The peaceful snowy cabin becomes a burning graveyard for the duo's friendship. The knights urge Ragnar to head back to the carriage. They will take care of everything else here. However, Ragnar takes a moment to look back at the scene. He tries to maintain his composure in front of the knights but tears stream down his face. Although he felt like this was something necessary to do, it still hurt. He walks away from the fire assuming his friend is dead. Little did he know Ian reincarnated himself with a magical dagger, allowing him to travel back into the past and get his revenge. He's going to come to regret those words. Please don't forgive me. The scene cuts back to Ian's new life in the present, where he is a sixth-class magician. He returns to Ragnar's side, still pretending to be under the influence of black magic. Ragnar is glad that he is finally here, wanting to know what Princess Harry was talking to him about. Ian still acts like a puppet, saying Harry was just asking why he betrayed Prince Haydn. He didn't answer her question and just left. Ragnar finds this amusing and laughs. His sister is such a poor thing, she actually has a crush on Ian. Ragnar remembers how his father rejected all the nobles that wanted to propose to her. He always found this unusual. For royals, marriage is basically a transaction for the sake of more political power. For the emperor to just hide the princess away is ridiculous. When the time is right Ragnar intends to marry her to the right family, and he is going to find a suitable wife for Ian too. It shouldn't be long. He'll ascend to the throne in no time and become stronger than his father. He vows to become the first person to unite the three empires, and lead the Green River Empire to its maximum potential. He places his hands on Ian's shoulders, happy that Ian is going to be by his side to witness all of this. Looking Ragnar in his eyes Ian tells him he has already seen all of this. In his past life he witnessed the empire becoming unified, and stood by the side of the great emperor. He gave up everything he had and dedicated his whole life to Ragnar and the empire. However in this new life, he has discovered the type of life that he truly wants to live. A peaceful one with a family, Ragnar stumbles backwards, surprised that Ian has managed to break free from the black magic. That's the only explanation for him spouting such craziness. With a look of blissful sorrow Ian confirms it, and what he is about to say next will cause him great despair. But he asks that Ragnar, his friend and lord who trusted him the most and showed him the greatest honor, and also the greatest despair. He falls to his knees and asks that Ragnar come and find him. He will be waiting at the old ivory tower and they can continue this discussion. He vanishes from the room in a flash of light, leaving Ragnar all alone. He was right. Ian has been planning something all this time and it could ruin his chances of becoming emperor. He barges out of his room startling his servants outside who want to know what's wrong. He demands that the captain of the first imperial knights be summoned immediately. They need to gather the knight order and prepare the fastest horses they have and someone needs to find out where Avantis is right now. Ian is at the old ivory tower site, sitting amongst the ruins while a gentle snow falls down. When he found this place in his previous life he thought it was by coincidence, but it must have been his father who has been watching him all this time. He must have bought him here to give him a second chance. The dragon tongue spell book he found here, that allowed him to be reincarnated. It's all because of his father. Ian understands now, he also understands what he must do with his newly awakened dragon authority. Out of the distance emerges Ragnar along with a bunch of imperial knights on horseback. Ian rises and welcomes them, it's time for this to be settled. Ragnar turns to Evantis, asking that he kills Ian this time round. Evantis sighs, he should have just killed him to begin with and they wouldn't be in this mess. He's just a brat who's only sixth class, Evantis is going to end this in an instant. However there seems to be another problem other than Ian. Evantis can sense the gold dragon, or at least the gold dragon's authority. They must be nearby. The scene of the battle is set. Ian's cape blows in the wind while Ragnar and Evantis look towards him. A somber tension fills the air for a brief moment, until Ian begins to approach, once again welcoming them and waiting for a reply. Ragnar snaps, Ian is wrong to think Prince Haydn would be a better emperor. What the empire needs is a rational leader with strong power. Haydn is unqualified and is only in the position he is in due to their father's love. Ragnar refuses to acknowledge him. He himself is the one who is qualified. He is the one who needs to become emperor. Remaining calm Ian explains that black magic corrupts the souls of humans, and Ragnar is no exception. It's clear he has lost the cool judgment he once had and is now showing his true colors. Ian can spout all the nonsense that he wants but today will be the last day that mouth of his will speak. Ragnar signals to the dragon Ian to get down to business. With his hands behind his back Avantis launches an attack towards our protagonist. A thick black mass hurdles forward. It rips up the entire ground creating a line of destruction to where Ian was standing. 
dust and debris clouds the air. Ivantis had heard Ian was an intelligent human but he guesses that must have not been true. To think he would die so easily. The air clears though and Ian stands tall. The small area around him has been completely unaffected by the attack, almost like he has created a force field. A look of befuddlement appears on Ivantis's face. How did he do that? He follows it up quick with a flame strike, lighting the area up like napalm. Yet the flames don't pierce through Ian's force field. This should be impossible. Ivantis tries again by shooting ice crystals from the sky. Ian is definitely a lower class magician than him. No matter how exceptional of a human he is, he shouldn't be able to compete against a dragon Ian who has lived for more than five centuries. The look of befuddlement turns to worry, why are none of Avantis's attacks working? That's not all. The energy that Avantis has felt from the moment he arrived here. The gold dragon's authority. It's clear that that energy is coming from Ian. The villain asks who exactly Ian is. Ian feels a little sorry for him. The pitiful last dragon Ian. His entire race is no more and he has been left all alone. Mitchell Greenover gave him the most painful punishment possible by sealing him away in the middle of nowhere. Hatred, anger, sadness, and the overall powerlessness of not being able to do anything. Ian is impressed that the villain was able to survive all of that humiliation. This gets under Avantis's skin and he yells out for Ian to shut up. He's going to end his life right now for saying such things. The villain charges forward in a blur of darkness. However, a bright light appears around Ian. He tells Avantis that he is going to send him to be with the rest of his comrades in the afterlife. Avantis is stopped in his tracks. He spent so long searching for the gold dragon and its power, little did he know it would be his downfall. Ian slowly raises his hand as the energy around him grows stronger. He orders Avantis, the last descendant of the Dragonians, to self-delete. With no self-control Avantis pierces his chest with something sharp, right through the heart. His last breaths leave his body and he asks one final question to Ian. How does he have that power? Our protagonist just watches his final moments, looking down at the villain who falls to his knees. Ian remembers the first ever time he met Ragnar in his previous life. He was heading to his room alongside the tower master at the time, Herbert. Herbert was telling Ian how honored he should be, and instructing him to be careful of his words and behavior. He was about to meet the future emperor after all. The two of them entered and approached Ragnar who welcomed them. He heard a lot about Ian's talents as a magician, he had also heard that Ian's mother passed away not long ago from an illness. Ragnar's mother had also passed away so he understood how Ian was feeling. This whole time Ian remained with his head lowered to show respect. That's when Ragnar told him to raise his head. He didn't want Ian to treat him as a prince, but as a fellow human being. This was the start of their friendship. Now, many years later in a completely new life, it's just Ragnar and Ian standing amongst the old ivory tower ruins. Ragnar falls to his knees. He's not going to beg for his life and tells Ian to just kill him. He'd rather die here than be publicly executed at the capital. Ian is silent and looks at his former friend who is so willingly giving up. Ragnar wonders why he is looking at him like that. He doesn't want Ian's pity. He yells out that he should have killed someone like Ian from the start. He is nothing but a monster. Our protagonist seems upset by those words. Even in this life Ragnar wants to kill him out of fear. There is something Ian wants to show the prince in his last moments. He approaches Ragnar and touches him on the head, showing him various memories from Ian's past life. When the two first met that day, to Ian being loyal to him for years, together they plotted against Prince Haydn so that Ragnar could have the throne. And when he did eventually become emperor Ian used his powers to win many wars and take many lives. This helped Ragnar create peace between the three empires. The two of them were like brothers conquering the world together. Up until the day that Ian wanted to leave, feeling like a monster for what he had done. This ultimately led to Ragnar poisoning him in the cabin. In Ragnar's final words to his longtime friend, Please don't forgive me. After seeing these memories in the present Ragnar is baffled. He has lived this whole life that he had no idea about. He looks at the ground for a moment, replaying all those memories again and again, until he looks up at Ian like an old friend. He understands everything now. Ian Page, you are. Before he can finish his sentence Ian puts an end to his life by slashing at his neck with an ice crystal. Ragnar's lifeless body falls to the floor and the old ivory tower ruins are stained with his blood. This is the end of their relationship, and the end of Ian's quest for revenge in this new life. The snow continues to fall to the ground and a whistling wind passes by. Ian thinks about what he is going to do with his new life now. Some time passes. After Avantis and Prince Ragnar died, a large-scale purge was executed on the dragon's order and all those related to it. The execution started with the Night Damphil and continued with all the nobles that helped Prince Ragnar use black magic. 
Thanks to Princess Harry's devoted care to the Emperor he was able to recover quickly. When he heard about Ragnar's death he was deeply saddened by it. The Vice Captain Paul who tried to assassinate the Emperor was found to be under the influence of black magic and innocent. His grave was treated with respect and he was laid to rest with the rest of the Imperial Knights. The Rebellion of Prince Ragnar and his use of forbidden black magic was recorded as an uncommon but dire crime in the Empire's history. As for Avantis, all records of him were sealed away under Imperial orders. His existence is a complete secret to the rest of the world. As time passed the death of Ragnar was slowly and quietly forgotten by the world. And with that Ian's revenge, and the journey of rebellion that felt like an eternity, has ended. A while later Princess Harry is sitting on a chair in the Imperial Palace wearing black clothing. Ian approaches also wearing black clothing, asking if she is nervous. The princess admits that she is nervous but she doesn't regret her decision. She no longer wants to hide her magical powers and instead wants to use them to help people. Lowering himself, Ian tells the princess not to worry. All will turn out well. They head inside a courtroom filled with very highly ranked people. They are here to decide what they should do with Harry. She is on trial for illegally practicing and using magic without informing the ivory tower. Ian is sitting amongst the judges on this trial but there is something he would like to say before it starts. He reveals that he cannot in good conscience be a judge on this trial, as he is connected to the charges Princess Harry is being faced with. The courtroom gasps, what is he talking about? Ian explains that he was one of the teachers that has been teaching her magic secretly. He found out about her powers six years ago when he was spying on her. He overlooked it because it made sense for her to want to hide it. Years later Ian found himself preoccupied while investigating the Dragon Order, the organization that was deeply involved in black magic. Novantis's existence became an exceptionally huge threat. Since he was a high-ranking sorcerer he had the power to turn the Empire into a sea of blood if he wanted to, so Ian needed to move carefully. There was a limit to how much he could have done alone though and there were very few people in the palace he could trust. And so Ian turned to Harry for help. In exchange he offered to teach her magic in private. The only reason he was able to be freed from the black magic he was infected with is because of the princess. If not for her who knows what state the empire would be in right now. The judges speak to Harry directly, asking her if what Ian is saying is the truth, giving her the chance to speak and say anything that is on her mind. Harry nervously looks to the ground and says it is the truth. She turns to look at her original teacher, the magician Kevin on the other side of the room. And then she looks to Ian, who has a smile on his face, encouraging the princess to be confident. She speaks up. She is a criminal that broke the laws of the Empire and is prepared to receive any punishment that is coming her way. She doesn't want any special treatment for being a member of the Imperial family. She insists that Kevin and the maids who all knew of her abilities are innocent. They were simply following her orders with no choice because she is their princess. She asks the judges to place the punishment solely on her. She is the one that is guilty and should be blamed. Suddenly a voice calls out from the back of the room, saying that the prince is not guilty. Everyone turns to look in shock. It's the emperor who is back to full health and wearing his uniform. No one was expecting him to be here today. He jokes, it seems like it is not time for him to die just yet. The emperor Terry begins addressing the judges, his daughter is not guilty. She was simply following his orders. When he first learned of her magical abilities he ordered her and the magician Kevin to keep it a secret. He wanted his daughter to live as royalty and not a magician. Therefore this is all his fault. Terry tells the judges to put all the crimes on him and let Harry go free and have a chance at becoming a real magician. The judges stare at each other, coming up with a decision. Usually they would discuss their decision with the Ivory Tower Master. But seen as Ian is involved in the case, Ronan volunteers to announce the princess's punishment. He acknowledges that Harry has a lot of good reasons for wanting to hide her powers. First of all the former tower master Herbert turned out to be corrupt and the right hand man of Ragnar. Second of all, she hasn't gained much benefit by practicing magic secretly, so it's clear she had no ill intentions. Lastly, for Harry to have reached fourth class all while learning in a restricted environment is impressive. It's obvious that she has a talent for magic that is hard to find. Due to all of this Ronan announces that the princess's punishment will be postponed for five years. Over the next five years she will become a part of the ivory tower and train properly. She will be dispatched on many missions that occur within the empire and will receive private lessons. Her performance within the ivory tower over the next five years will decide how severely she will be punished. As of this moment Ronan declares that Harry will no longer be the Empire's princess, but instead will be a magician of the Ivory Tower. Some time after the trial Ian is standing staring at a brown box on a table. He is met by Harry, who is now a magician in the Ivory Tower. 
he asks how she is enjoying her new life. Everyone was a little distant at first due to her royalty status but people have started to warm up to her now. Harry thanks Ian for always being there for her and sticking up for her in court. Thanks to him she is able to live her dream life as a magician. She recently heard that Ian is planning on stepping down as the Ivory Tower Master. She wants to know if it is because of her. Our protagonist assures her it's not. He just has things that he needs to attend to. But he can't do them if he stays at the Ivory Tower. He opens the brown box by his side. He actually wanted to gift the contents inside to Harry before leaving. It's Mitchell Green River's robe that Ian received from the Emperor a while ago. The robe was supposed to be passed down to the next magician in the Imperial family. Ian was just borrowing it. It's time that it is returned to its rightful owner. Ian also wants to give Harry the staff he used to use. The Staff of the Great Plains. It's made from a very rare material that can't be found within the Empire. It also improves proficiency using mana and is surprisingly light. Ian asks if she likes these gifts. Of course she does, they're amazing. There is one more favor Ian would like to ask of her before leaving. He doesn't know how long he will be gone for, it may even be a few years. While he is gone he asks that Harry help to look after his family to make sure they are safe here. Harry doesn't like the fact that he is leaving. Where is he going? Ian can't tell her that right now, because he doesn't even know the answer himself. There are still a lot of dangers lurking in the world and he wants to find and resolve them. Harry's life has been going great. With the power she has she is going to help people who are having a hard time. She is also going to support her brother Hayden when he ascends the throne. With all of this Harry had hoped that Ian would stay by her side. She begs him not to leave the capital. Ian apologizes though, it is just something that he has to do. Later, when Prince Hayden finds out Ian is leaving he isn't happy either. Not only is he stepping down as the tower master, but he is also just taking off. It hasn't even been that long since the empire was in complete shambles. On top of this his sister Harry has been crying non-stop this whole time. He asks if Ian dumped her or something. It's embarrassing for him to say this, but Harry is really cool and amazing. She has a good personality like her mother, and it turns out she is also a high-ranking magician that is very capable. There's no way Ian will ever meet anyone as good as her. Ian admits this is true, she is a very cool and lovely individual, which is why he hopes she will meet someone who's better than him and live a happy life. There is actually something Ian wanted to say to the prince and the sword lord before he left. When Ian was inside of the vice captain's Paul's head, his last words was to tell Prince Hayden and Captain Oliver that he's sorry and he thanks them. Ian lowers his head, these were the last words of Paul. Hayden expresses his gratitude towards Ian. He has helped him come so far. If it wasn't for Ian he would still just be a useless prince with an inferiority complex. He vows to always work hard so that he can become a great emperor in the future. That way he won't embarrass those who have believed in him all this time, including Paul. When Ian is done with his travels, Hayden asks that he returns to the Empire to help out if he can. There is something that Hayden wants to do before he leaves. He takes a sword out of Oliver's hand and pulls it from its sheath. He's practiced really hard for this day and would like to offer Ian an eternal guest pact. This is his gift to Ian, his friend, his teacher, and his benefactor. The Imperial family will always welcome the visit of high-ranking magician Ian Page. If he ever needs the help of the Imperial family or Empire, we promise that we will stand by his side. This will continue through the descendants of both families. I swear upon the stream of the Emerald River that's in the center. Hayden saw a lord doing this when he was younger and thought it was pretty cool. He's always wanted to try it. Ian can leave and do what he needs to do. Hayden will wait patiently for his return. He thanks Ian for everything and the two hug. The sun sets on our protagonist's mansion, as he prepares his affairs and gets ready to go. His mother enters the room and he is surprised to see her. She is not feeling well from traveling and so should be resting in her room. She doesn't look good, her hands are all cold and her face is pale. Vanessa insists she is fine and falls into her son's arms. This worries Ian, who tells her to wait a while. He will get the alchemist Ledio and a doctor to come here. Once again Vanessa insists that she isn't sick. She just came to say goodbye to her son before he leaves. But now that she is here she isn't able to say those words. When she returned to the capital she heard all about what had happened between Ian and the black magic. She could barely breathe, wondering why her child had to go through something so tough. Her heart broke and she felt as if it was all her fault somehow. And when she was staying with Lord Marcus in the Magrian territory all she could do is worry. She was scared that she would never see her son again. She doesn't want to lose any more family like she lost her husband. Ian grabs a hold of his mother's hand to calm her down. She might not believe him but he actually met his father. It's hard for him to explain the details. But when he met Fran he told him that even if Ian can't see him, he 
he's always there beside him. Ian used to hate his father for abandoning him. However, now he realizes that everything he has in this life is all due to the power his father left behind for him. Ian wants to try walking the path that his father did and honor his last wishes. Looking at his mother, Ian asks that she let him go and do this so he can grow and understand more. Vanessa begins to cry. She always saw her son as a child but he really is all grown up now. Ian is going to be fine. He tells his mother not to worry as she isn't alone here. She now has a new family that loves her. Ledio is a really nice person, someone that has been a father figure for Ian. And Douglas is someone who always brightens up the atmosphere. He's a smart, kind, and considerate child. Ian knows she will be happy, and he will definitely come back to her. Just outside the room Ledio and Douglas are both eavesdropping on the conversation. They are also crying at the fact that Ian is going. Our protagonist heads outside with all his things and prepares to mount his horse. Ledio comes outside to say goodbye. He can't believe that Ian is only taking one horse with him. It reminds him of the first time they met when Ian had to ride a horse all the way back to the Mogrian territory in a hurry to go and meet Prince Haydn for the first time. He was so bad at riding horses back then. Ian doesn't need to worry about anything. Ledio swears upon his life that he will protect Vanessa no matter what. That's when Douglas shows up with a gift. It's a mana elixir and a healing potion that he made. It's way better than any that can be bought on the market. If he needs any more he can write a letter and Douglas can make as many potions as he needs. At the last minute Vanessa rushes out in a pink dress carrying something large in her hands. It's a package filled with food that he should eat on his travels. There's a lot in there so he should make sure to eat and stay healthy. He should also make sure to write back often as well. Ian is grateful for everyone's gifts and begins walking away with his horse after saying goodbye. Before turning the corner he turns around to get one last look at everyone. This is a place that he can come back to anytime, his home. And the people who are waiting for him here, they are his family. He smiles as he leaves, knowing that no matter what he will always have home to come back to. The story jumps ahead eight years. It has been a long time since Ian has left and Douglas is writing him a letter about everything that has happened. It states, Boss, are you doing well? It's already been eight years since you left and a lot of things have happened since. I graduated as the top student in the Imperial Alchemy Academy, and I've created the cure for the incurable disease, which was what I've always wanted to do since I was young. I was recognized for that achievement and I am now an Imperial Alchemist. My father, who researched together with me also received an offer to become an Imperial Alchemist, but he turned it down. He didn't want to be separated from mother. Both of them were awkward around each other at first but they're now a happily married couple. The emperor wasn't able to recover completely from the poison assassination incident eight years ago. So Prince Haydn is now his proxy. Prince Haydn is now so competent that you don't see a single shadow of his old self. He even signed a peace negotiation between the three empires within the continent. Since then trade has been flourishing and the empire's economy and technology has improved greatly. Harry's five years are now over, and instead of being punished she has been officially recognized as a high-ranking magician of the Ivory Tower. She has created a foundation that looks after the underprivileged and is really popular with the civilians. She's the most likely candidate to become the next Ivory Tower master. We're all doing our best as we live our lives, and we miss you too. Boss, please come back quickly, we are waiting for you. T.S. Can I call you brother when we meet next time? Douglas finishes writing his letter and takes a big stretch, wondering where Ian could be right now. He is called by his father as today is a very important day, so Douglas rushes downstairs. He is shocked to see how beautiful his mother looks, and she is flattered by his compliment. They are all dressed fancy and the emperor has sent a personal carriage and horse for them. They are even going to be sitting in the VIP area. It turns out today is the day of Prince Haydn's coronation. Oliver is at Paul's grave laying some flowers. It would have been great if you were alive to see this day too. Oliver tells him to rest in peace as he heads to the ceremony. Harry is also getting ready to go, wearing Mitchell's blue robe and carrying the staff of the Great Plains. Tons of people are gathered outside the palace on this important day, celebrating and having a good time. Inside the palace the Emperor Terry is addressing everyone. This is a special day where he is going to be passing a great honor down to his son, Prince Haydn Green River. Originally this should only happen after Terry has died, but after a lot of contemplation he has decided that it would be best if it happened now. The empire will continue to advance and everyone's lives will flourish even more with a new emperor. The doors to the throne room swing open as Terry asks the people of the Green River Empire to lay their eyes on their new emperor. Haydn walks through the door in regal clothing, a white and black suit with a long red cape. 
He walks down the long red carpet and kneels in front of his father. Terry utters the words that every son wants to hear from their father. I'm proud of you. With his hand on heart Haydn vows to try his best to not disappoint anyone, and hopefully to continue making his father proud. A servant appears next to Terry with the crown on a blue cushion. He grabs a hold of it and places it on his son's head. It's gold with a red top. It's also encrusted with various different jewels and gemstones. As of this moment forward, Prince Haydn Green River shall now be known as Emperor Haydn Green River, the new emperor of the Green River Empire. The entire crowd bursts into applause. Long live his majesty. Amongst the crowd is a figure in a brown cloak. His face is covered by his hood. This person uses magic to summon flower petals to rain from the sky, congratulating Haydn on ascending the throne. Haydn looks up at this guy confuses of who it could be. That's when his baffled face turns to a happy one. The person is our protagonist Ian, and Haydn is happy that he was here to see this moment. The coronation continues and when it is finished everyone heads inside the banquet hall. Here Emperor Haydn gives Ian a big fat hug. He has missed him so so much since he has been gone. Ian can see that Haydn is still the same after all these years. He congratulates him on his coronation. It doesn't take long for everyone else to come over. Vanessa, Letio, and Douglas squeeze our protagonist tightly. They missed him and can't believe he didn't contact them all these years. Ian missed them all too. His mother, Douglas, and his new father, Letio. What he left to do has been completed and all sorted out. He's here to stay. Haydn lets out a cough to get Ian's attention, and then gestures over to his right. At first Ian is confused, until he looks over and sees who it is. It's Harry, it has been a long time since the two of them last spoke. He hopes she is doing well. She is, and is also curious if Ian has been well himself. Ian explains how he has lived a very vagrant life, traveling everywhere. Everywhere he went people mentioned Harry's name from the capital to the far remote borders. They talked about how she was a righteous person that was looking after commoners and orphans at the ivory tower. Harry shrugs off these compliments and awkwardly plays with her hands, it's really nothing all that great. The two of them quickly realize they have run out of small talk and there is a brief moment of silence. It's too awkward for Harry to bear, so she leaves Ian, hoping that he will enjoy his time at the banquet. Ian just watches her walk away from him, not knowing what to say. That's when Haydn appears behind him, informing Ian that his sister isn't married yet. Various marriage proposals were made but she rejected all of them saying that she was waiting for someone. It's no mystery who this person she has been waiting for is. She isn't the only person that has been waiting for Ian. There are tons of things that need to be done starting from now. Haydn asks Ian to help him with some of them. Our protagonist is happy to do this. He awaits any orders that his new emperor has for him. After the banquet Harry is at the ivory tower, looking at some flowers in the garden. She regrets not talking to Ian for a little bit longer earlier. She shouldn't have just left like that. Or perhaps she was right to leave, and Ian isn't interested in her. She pulls herself together. It hasn't been that long since he got back so he is probably just busy. That's when Ian appears behind her calling out her name. This causes her to jump in shock. Ian apologizes, it wasn't his intention to scare her. He just came to the ivory tower to say hello to the magicians, and they all told him that he could find Harry out here around this time. He comments on how beautiful the ivory tower garden has gotten since he left. There used to only be tons of weeds here. That's because when Harry became a magician here she started to grow plants, thinking that it could become a place where magicians can rest peacefully. Ian thinks that is a great idea. He asks if she would show him around and Harry jumps at the opportunity. The two walk through the garden and look at all of the flowers while talking. Ian talks about all the things he saw while on his travels. He was surprised that Randier's flower which is rare in Green River is actually quite common in the Coldwood Empire and is treated as a weed. There is also a lake in the Principality of Roe that is said to have a golden shine. However, when Ian visited it just looked like a normal lake. Until the moment that the sun started to set, then the golden shine revealed itself. It was a beautiful scene that Ian will remember for life. Harry is happy that he had a great journey. All of those places sound great and she would like to see them one day too. Ian stops and holds out his hand. If she wants to see those places he will take her there. Or anywhere she wants to go, if she'll hold on to his hand. He's been to everywhere in the world. The Golden Lake, Spirit Forest, Hot Desert, and Vast Sea. The first thing he would think of in all of those places was Harry. He'd wonder what she would say if she was there with him. Eventually those thoughts turned into a certain desperation and Ian realized what he was feeling. He did everything he had to do in the world, and the whole time all he could think about was Harry. Ian gets down on one knee with his hand still reaching out. He asks Harry to please become his lifelong partner. 
He wants to be by her side for the rest of their lives. Harry breaks down into tears. She has missed Ian and has waited for a really long time. Yes, she will gladly spend the rest of her life with him as long as he promises not to leave like that again. The two hold hands and Ian prepares to live out the rest of his days in peace, helping Emperor Hayden with his imperial duties and raising a family with his new wife Harry. Perhaps they will even have a daughter together named Johanna. The Empire is at peace and Ian has corrected all the things that went wrong in his previous life. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this story please make sure to support the original authors. Also consider supporting this channel as this video took a long time to make. Hit that like button and the subscribe button if you haven't already and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you and take care.